Hello and welcome to Spa Francorchamps. We're high in the Belgian Ardennes on a beautiful May day. The 1st of May is also the first race day of the new season for the FIA World Endurance Championship. Season 9 commences here in Spa and finishes in Bahrain at the end of the autumn. And in between times, we go to Le Mans, Portimao, and a bunch of other historic European racetracks. Well, let's get down to hear from Louise Beckett to set the scene in the pit lane. Hello, you join me in the pit lane because we are continuing to follow COVID protocol. There will not be an official grid here for this race here in Spa. However, it is the dawn of a new era for the World Endurance Championship. The hypercar will be making its debut race here in Spa with the number seven Toyota leading the pack. We've had the prologue earlier in the week and free practice sessions and it's shown us that competition continues to be fierce amongst all of our competitors. And one thing's for certain, it's looking to be a great season ahead. Thank you, Louise. We'll also have Duncan Vincent down in the pit lane. Down in the pit lane at the moment as well is Alan McNish, who will join us in the commentary booth. Meanwhile, me, Martin Haven and Graham Goodwin and we're absolutely right about the dawn of a brand new era with Hypercar, this new uh, category for the Blue Ribbons, the top tier of sports car racing. It begins here in Spa-Francorchamps. For the middle of June, what would normally be the Le Mans weekend, we will go to the delayed eight hours of Portimao. Standard points here for the six hour racing in Spa, in Monza and in Fuji. For Portimao and for Bahrain, eight hour races earn us points and a half. And the 24 hours of Le Mans, the winners will earn double points. So it's a short season in terms of only half a dozen races but three of them are extra point-paying races. And we talked to a number of the drivers over the week so far, and all of them very much in the opinion, Graham, that you cannot afford to drop the ball from here, day one. You have to get points on the board. You have to score strongly, particularly if, like the two Toyota teams, you expect to be battling your own teammates for a championship. 100% uh, right. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good, good night, whatever you are in the world. It's great to be back, isn't it? Fabulous day here at Spa Francorchamps. But uh, you're absolutely right. One thing I would add, and you make it very clear there about the point situation, Martin, uh, around this fabulous seven kilometer circuit, is if you are going to have a problem, this is the one to do it at, because this <laughs> is the one you're going to lose fewer points, but there's not yeah. a lot of wriggle room, is there? Well, and you know, Spa, as everybody knows, a legendary racetrack does not take prisoners. It doesn't look like Monaco, but the penalty for a mistake is very similar. We've seen a number of cars in the prologue, the pre-season test, two days on Monday and Tuesday, four cars were written off and new cars had to be brought in. We already lost one of the potential contenders from Team Project One. Yesterday in qualifying, two more cars had heavy shunts on the outlaps. And one of those, the second Team Project One car, is also not going to start the race. So that's an entire two-car team, day one. They don't even get to go to the grid. Right. What about reigning champions? Well, United Autosports in LMP2, they won everything last year. In fact, they, they more than won everything. They just dominated in LMP2 in World Endurance at Le Mans, in the European Le Mans series, in Michelin Le Mans Cup, in LMP2 and LMP3. They are a sports car team, Graham, who are on a roll, and that showed with the dominance they produce in qualifying. Now, it's a very short run to the grid. GR racing there, the GTE and Porsche looping around on the exit of Piff Paff and into the barriers firmly, and that's Mike Wainwright, their bronze driver. Team owner and car owner, can Mike drive away from there? That was quite a clout, wasn't it? And there's, there's heavy damage oh, there. Oh, dear. Oh, no. And there's the team. That is appalling luck. Well, that's not a good start to the last race for one of their team coordinators, uh, yep. is it? Sarah Smith, who will be stepping away for a while from the FI World Endurance Championship with GR Racing, uh, off for a very happy reason. <laughs> uh, this is the start of her seventh season uh, with the team. Been there from the very start, but Sarah, we wish you well. 
Well, and the boys in the team as well. Hopefully, Mike will get the car back. Looks like broken rear suspension, possibly just a puncture. If it's just a puncture, then uh, that's a good thing, but it didn't look like just a puncture. Well, here's another car that crashed very heavily in the hands of team boss Christian Reed on an outlap before qualifying. In the AM class, the AM had to do the qualifying, and Christian lost it in a rouge and a heavy impact cresting the brow the car flew into the barriers at Redion. the good news is that he is a-ok -okay. and the great news for the team is that despite what was a very fast very big accident they have managed to rebuild the car and graham goodwin it's not always a given that just because bits fly off there's no further damage under the skin i'll be absolutely blunt i came in this morning i went down to see project one team and dempsey proton racing and i expected the opposite news because that to me looked the more violent accident uh, but an astonishing job by the number 77 team and what that does of course apart from putting the 77 car back on the grid is it, uh, it retains christian reed's ever-present status in the championship absolutely he's right. missed none of the previous 66 races it's one of our new additions this year tf sport of course back but with a very different looking car and a very different looking driver squad the 33 car and this is our pole sitter in the gte am class as well courtesy of ben keating uh, we had two red flags in a 10-minute qualifying session for the GT car. So he went out, set an outlap, was on a hot lap, red flag. Second time, also on his outlap. Luckily, he hadn't started a hot lap. Uh, it was red flag, but he put in a really strong run. Aston Martin, a 1-2 in the AM class. Porsche and Ferrari on as even. Porsche claimed pole, courtesy of Kevin Escher. Not one, but two lap record setting runs consecutively in the 92 Porsche. And that was after actually having two, at least one hot lap uh, aborted by the first red flag. So the second time they hadn't left the pit lane when the red flag came out, they had always intended to wait. In LMP2, Paul went to Philippe Albuquerque in the number 22 United Autosports car, and again, not once, but twice, beating Nick de Vries. And in fact, they outpaced the third of our hypercar entries. They did indeed. Bit of a problem. We'll talk about that when we get a, ch a chance to look at the Alpine as to what went wrong yesterday in qualifying for the team. An unfortunate failure for them. But uh, two dominant pole positions in the classes is on board now with the number 31 Team WRT Orica. Uh, two astonishing laps. Kevin S. lap in the 92 Porsche. Amazing. If you've got more than one screen, take a look on Twitter <laughs> yeah. at the FIWC yeah. tweets for the onboard there. And look in particular at what might be called a kind of co ground moment at Puan. Yeah. Um, so it was an amazing lap from him. And the same with Felipe Albuquerque. He's been absolutely stellar all week and continued that form. And the significance there of that last onboard team WRT making their World Endurance Championship full season debut. WRT supremely experienced in GT racing. They've run Audis in DTM as well. They've been very much a, a founding member of Audi customer sport racing for a decade plus with, with loads of success here at Spa, particularly in the 24 hours. But now they are embarking on an a LMP2 program. They raced in Barcelona in the European Le Mans series with that car and absolutely decimated the opposition, so they're looking for a good race here. But at the front of the field, the outright pole sitters, Toyota. Let's hear from Jose Maria Lopez. Hey, Maria Lopez, this is the start of a new era, the hypercar for Toyota, and you're starting out on pole. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, a very important day for us, I think, for motor racing, for endurance racing. And uh, yeah, in this circuit, which is a special spa with a good weather, good sun. Um, it looks like it's not going to be snowing today like, <laughs> like that at the time. But uh, yeah, very excited. Um, a lot of unknowns on the race, but uh, yeah, looking forward for the challenge. What do you think today is going to bring? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be very hard. I think uh, tire degradation is the main concern for us because it's a heavier car. Um, less aero so yeah even if michelin did uh, a great work it's still we will have to manage and there's a new track for us with this car and uh well pachito and mike conway joining kamu kobayashi in the number seven car the man who set the first ever hypercar pole that's a 20 second outright pole in world endurance championship racing 
And now I beg your pardon, it's more than that because their, their last poll here at Spa in 2019 was their 21st poll. So they have also claimed the first ever hypercar poll. Number seven ahead of number eight. And Graham, there is a third hypercar and that is the Alpine, uh, Alpine Elf Matmut car run by Philippe Signo, the senior tech team. Stepping up from LMP2 with a car they don't know in a category that nobody knows. Yep. So big, big challenge for them and big challenge here for Ollie Gavin as well. Obi-Wan having his final ever race this weekend after a 50 year career, not quite 50 year career. <laughs> <laughs> Something like quarter of a century uh, 30 uh, years. Of, of success. Amazing stuff from Ollie. 1990, uh, he was the Formula First Winter Series champion. Was he? So, yeah, we're, we're going back to uh, the dawn of time. I think he probably tells people about that down the pub even now. Ollie Gavin. Yeah, we'll see Ollie, by the way, in the middle of this race, not the start of the finish at the moment. But uh, great to see him here. Absolutely great to see the Corvette C8 are here. Yes, exactly. And the fact that Ollie is here is because Corvette have to be here. They've brought one car here because the car has to be ratified before they come to Le Mans. They had planned to come to Portimao, but of course that race has now been pushed back. And so that race will take place in mid-June with the 24 hours of Le Mans in August. So cars heading out and they've had a final warm-up session. They'll be fueled and fresh driving talent, if required, will be put in before they head to a very short grid. Of course, we're racing behind closed doors again here at Spa, as we did in the autumn. And Graham, that means there's no grid walk, there's no pit walk, there's no autograph session. It's a much more downbeat build up to the race perhaps for the drivers yeah but if you are joining us from home and we hope you are we'd love to have you here at a sunny uh, spa nine degrees by the way uh, temperature 29 degrees on track you 11 can 11 degrees nine degrees official it oh says. okay um, <laughs> what i would say is you can download free the uh, race event program from the wc website that's uh, 86 car does not look well no that's coming back on a truck but at least it is coming back you know well that's always, it's always an issue on cold uh, tires, on a cold track, getting the pressures and the temperatures right so the car's got the grip because cold slicks are essentially made of mahogany rather than nice, soft, sticky rubber. And the, the, the grip just disappears. Alan McNish joining us in the booth. And once your tire is out of its operating window, we understand that we see more often that it's getting too hot and it starts to give away grip. But going going the other way, being too cold is, is equally dangerous. Yes, too cold is definitely uh, the, the worst part of it because when you lose the, the tire at that point and you don't feel it, you, you just spin instantly. The other thing is pressures. And, you know, at the end of the Kemmel straight, it's a big long straight. Uh, the pressures would not be up to operating full temperature, uh, sorry, pressure. And uh, clearly he's lost that the thing now for him is to get the car back to the pits, but they have to be able to repair the car and for it to drive out the end of the pit lane within one hour of the start of the race, or they cannot continue. So therefore, effectively, they've just got over an hour to get this thing, whatever damage it's got, to be repaired. So I'm sure that uh, Louise and Duncan down in the pit lane will be following the progress of that, but there's going to be a, a lot of work by the mechanics very, very quickly. Well, we'll talk during the race, particularly, Graham, about new cars and new teams, new drivers that have entered, but there's even the teams we know have got a lot of new liveries. So there's going to be, again, good reason to download and print the spotter guide from the website to give yourself a fighting chance. This is Team WRT. Great lineup in that car. Robin Freens, uh, Formula E driver, young Ferdy Habsburg, uh, young single seater and GT racer from Austria, and then Frenchman Charles Milesi. There is the uh, Pratt Miller Corvette racing crew. Always good to have them back, but with the new mid engine Corvette, a very different look and sound to the car. You could easily pass that for a Ferrari. So the Belgian anthem rings out over Spa-Francorchamps. It's the 1st of May 2021. It is day one for Hypercar, the new top tier of endurance racing globally. It's a catch-all that will cover 
Singapore currently covers Le Mans hypercar with or without hybrid, with road relevance or without, and will also encompass LMDH, the IMSA sports car championship version of hybrid. Well, let's get down to the grid. We'll catch up with United Autosports, our P2 pole sitters and Phil Hansen. Phil Hansen, you're going to be starting in the 22 United Autosport. Uh, what are you thinking about the start of this race ahead? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's a six hour race, so you can't, you can't win the race in the first corner, but you can definitely lose it. Um, luckily, because of Philippe's great lap yesterday, we're starting on pole, which is theory the safest place you can be um, but yeah we're looking to, to hold a nice lead and hopefully pull away and create a nice gap for the others and if he is lightning away from the start there is always the potential of getting in amongst or even maybe ahead of the Toyota Gazoo Racing zero tens the other thing that he needs to do is try and avoid any problems with the car that starts alongside him, which is the third of the hypercar entries from Alpine, and stay ahead of his P2 rival. But Graham Goodwin, nominally, we've got four classes, two of prototypes, so you've got hybrid and LMP2, two in GT, you've got GTE Pro and the Pro-Am class GTE Am. Effectively, we've got all the prototypes together and all the Porsches in the same mixing pot. So neither of the top categories is going to have an easy time. Let's hear what Porsche's Kevin Estra thinks. Kevin, you put in such a great performance yesterday. There was such a gap between you and the rest of the GT field. Can you continue that throughout the race today? I think it was a great lap. The, the car was fantastic, and I, and I just managed to, uh, to get everything perfect. Um, and it's, it's tough to get that around Spa. And, uh, I'm really proud to have achieved this lap, but, uh, but for sure the competition will be closer in the race. We, we've had a lot of time to practice with the prologue two days, then uh, FP1, FP2, FP3, where we've seen where the others are in, in, uh, in terms of pace, and, and the red cars are quite fast as well in the long runs. Um, and it's the same for our sister car and Corvette, somehow you always have to count on them. So. Uh, I don't think we'll see such a difference in terms of pace. Uh, would be nice, but I don't think so. <laughs> well, well, to answer your question, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, but, very, uh, but the, the answer it's is... It's started yeah. already, everybody. What, what's going to be interesting here is just the way the ebb and flow comes, particularly with the the lower-ranked drivers in the Pro-Am classes. When are they going to be deployed by the teams in LMP2 and in GTM? Is that going to leave some of the real young guns, the real fast guys in the LMP2s and the GTE AMs to get uh, in amongst and give trouble to the hypercars up the front of the race? And Alan, you've got a, a well-formed view of exactly what the, the one task that should be performed by an LMP2 should they have any chance of success with that. But in particular, in GTE, where we've seen regularly through the week, it's been a lot of track action this week with the prologue test and the race meeting, We've seen the quicker of the GTEs up ahead of some of, uh, in fact, most of the GTE pros at some point, Alan. Yeah, I think when you come to the LMP2s getting into the hypercars uh, for the overall victory and overall podium, they've got to keep in mind the long game. The long game is at the end of the season. And so, you know, in that respect, their battle predominantly is with the other LMP2 cars. However, if you can get that opportunity, you're going to take it to really make it work at the beginning because strategically they're more than likely going to have to do more pit stops because they can go a lesser distance on their fuel tank. To make it, they're going to have to lead going into Le Com for a P2 car to break the gap. And that, unfortunately for them, though, is the area where the hypercars are significantly quicker. This drop down through Ohuge, the long pull up to the top of the hill here at Hedion and then up towards Le Com. That's where the hypercars are very quick, that middle sector, that's where the LMP2s are very quick. And then it's kind of nearly balanced, but a bit more to the hypercars in the third sector. What we've already seen through the week, and I think what we're going to certainly see here at Spa, maybe less so as these hypercars kind of bed in, is the fact that if they are going to win this race, they've got to be fault-free. There is not the margin that there was previously with the LMP1 cars. That's better for the racing, surely. Yeah, look, at the end, I, uh, I'm uh, 
I've got two hats, I suppose. I've got uh, the sort of team principal hats, which is my kind of day job. And there you obviously want to make sure you protect your team as much as possible. But predominantly, I've got my fan hat on. Yeah. And my fan hat tells me this is going to be an absolute cracking race. Uh, I think you've got these different battles, as you said. The hypercars have not got any margin for error in their strategy game at all. In GTE Pro, we've known there's been no margin for error at all for the last goodness knows what four or five years and it's great to have the corvettes here as well coming across that stunning looking car and in gt am and in lmp2 then it's exactly the same it's a hard battle all the way through one guy though very pleased to see that he's doing his final race and i don't mean that in any derogatory way is olivier gavin because yeah. oliver i remember in his formula first days i've seen him come through all of his career absolutely sterling career but it's nice to be able to hang up your hat your helmet in the way you want to do it and there's no better circuit than spa well, here is our GTE AM pole sitter. Stunning livery, it's going to be very easy to spot that car, not least because he starts at the front of GTE AM. Let's hear from Ben Keating. Ben Keating, that was a superb qualifying from you yesterday and starting the race today. Uh, what are your thoughts going into it? Well, it was a very strange qualifying yesterday with the two red flags. Only six minutes of, uh, of hot qualifying means only two hot laps uh, and with the track limits being an issue at this particular track uh, it was pretty difficult to make sure you had at least one good clean lap and uh, I had a really really good lap and uh, very grateful to uh, be up at the front uh, it turns out we have an all Aston front row uh, and uh, it should be good I'm excited to start the race I'm most excited that the weather is beautiful so I was a little concerned about starting a race at this place, at this incredible track in the rain, uh, because it can be tricky uh, in the wet. But uh, Mother Nature is uh, smiling on us today, so uh, I'm very excited. Uh, I think it should be a good race. Well, let's hope the weather stays that way. <laughs> yes. All right, thanks very much. Hey, thank you. Well, Ben Keating is, I'm sure, very delighted, as he said, Graham, that it is dry. The outlap from the pit lane in the rain last year saw not one but two cars spinning down the hill into Eau Rouge. We nearly lost two cars within 300 metres of the pit lane exit before the race had even started. So this place is not easy on the driver or the car in good conditions. It gets considerably more not easy. I know that's not English, in bad conditions. One minute board is going to be due in just a couple of mo a minutes time. Just a quick update, by the way, from the pits and paddock. Uh, GR Racing have got their hands back on the 86 car. They're going to attempt to fix on that. We'll keep you posted about what happens with that particular Porsche. But yes, I mean, I'm sure Alan's got um, plenty of depth of experience of uh, the teams he's been involved in and around him about just how tricky it is, how easy it is here to make uh, those kind of mistakes that can leave the team on the back foot over a race week. Yeah, the thing about this circuit is it's fast but very unforgiving. So, you know, accident damage, basically energy is the square of the speed. So, you know, if you're going off at 100 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour, then there's a massive difference in that energy. And uh, we've seen the, the incident so far. The thing about racing teams, though, is they are fantastically able in crisis situations to adapt and pivot. And they do it so, so well. We've seen it so many times in the past. It's not what's behind you, it's what's ahead of you. Get it fixed, get it back out there and get going again. Well, I think that so much of that is, is absolutely correct. And if you just look at which sports were fastest to come back in the, the, the current pandemic, motorsport was the one that was able to react, to juggle, to move things, because that's what motorsport does faster than ever. So, you know, it, that's one of the reasons that we are able to go racing and an awful lot of sports are still waiting for the green light. Yes, we don't have fans and, and they can't come back soon enough because the passion for endurance racing is part of what everybody shares. Um, but it, it's just, you know, the fantastic the chance for, for everybody in motor racing to, to go and, and just bring a little bit of, yeah. of lightheartedness. And, into, and at the moment, the world needs it. Now, the bad news, unfortunately, from Gulf, from GR, is that the uh, 
86 car is done. It will not be fixable. So that's really tough on the team, really tough on Mike Wainwright. But Graham, you know, we walked down the pit lane before lunch this morning and Project One, who came here with two cars and high hopes, their garage is empty and they were packing everything into the truck before anybody else had even thought about pushing cars out onto the apron. That's, so that is a third brand new, brand new Porsche mm -hmm. gone before the race. That is uh, gutting. I've got to say this, which is we are missing the fans. Trust us, we are genuinely missing seeing you here, the track, hearing your enthusiasm. But you've got some representatives here on the grid. We heard from Ben Keating. Ben, a gentleman driver, a businessman who's been successful and is, is investing some of his success in his passion. They're the fans here for you. So rather than actually thinking about how they're not quite as quick as the professional drivers, think instead they're your representatives right here. Well, th there's three in this booth who are dyed-in-the-wool motorsport fans, endurance racing fans, and Alan. And there's a every single every single person in this place is not here because it's a job. They're here because it's a passion. And they're here because, fortunately, it's become the life. It's become what we do. So we're, we are living the dream, no question at all. And we share that passion with you. And the sooner we can physically share it, the happier we'll be. The field rolls away here at Spa, the final formation lap before the start of the 2021 FIA World Endurance Championship. Season nine is about to get underway here at Spa Francorchamps, the beginning of the new hypercar era. Let's hear from the most local, local team there is in the business, WRT. Try to maximize heating the brakes and the tires because the pressures uh, will be dropped down a bit to make sure we are ready for turn one. Copy. It's message to Robin Frins, who's starting that car, his first WEC race, fantastically experienced in pretty much every other category in the world, but not in this one. And uh, just a reminder that the slow speed behind the safety car is not necessarily going to just drop the tyre temperatures, but the pressures. And that is key for that first run down through Eau Rouge and uh, the compression that it puts onto the, the tyre, especially that left rear. And so Robin is going to be starting that car there, 10th overall. Not exactly as we expected, because they won the ELMS race in Barcelona, the first round out, and they were very quick in uh, all the running up till now, but in qualifying, didn't quite run out for them. Yeah, it's a new era for WRT. have been absolutely stellar in GT3 racing and continue to be stellar in GT3 racing, but making a big run into LMP with the dawn of this new era. It's good, and it's going to get better and better and better. Big, big names coming, and a lot of these drivers know they're coming and want to be part of that storyline, gentlemen. Into the pit lane has come Miro Konopka in the ARC Bratislava LMP2 car. Not quite sure why, we will find out for you. That car was at the tail of the P2 field, but he's shown now as being on the pit lane. And Louise Beckett will head down there. Uh, so, one of the stories we're going to talk about as you watch the grid roll past, you'll have noticed some of the names that we've got in LMP2. Like Segedo van der Gaard, we've seen before. Stoffel van Dorn, Juan Pablo Montoya, Robin Freens, who, of course, is earning his living in Formula E as well. Stars in reasonably priced cars, which is what LMP2 is. There are an awful lot of teams, drivers, positioning themselves this year to be on a shopping list for a manufacturer who's coming into hypercar, maybe in 22, probably in 23. There's a lot of people trying to get themselves noticed. And uh, we need a bit more on the rear. If you want to do two clicks rear one before the start and then come back. Yeah, that's to Stoffel van Dorn, who many fans will know from Formula E, but also from Formula One. That's two turns of the brake balance, two clicks, half a turn of the brake balance, sorry, to the rear for the brake distribution for that first braking into Los Rios. Then once the tyres are up to temper and pressure, he can go forward again, but probably at the end of the first lap. Little gentle reminder, engineer to driver. Engineer is actually the driver coach at some points. And we talked to Neil Jarney, who, instead of being in a Porsche 919 leading the field, is in a Porsche GT car leading in GT. And he was saying he has to be reminded to look in the mirrors. Okay, we will need to be side by side, turn 15. Side by side, turn 15. Right. 
This is turn 15, the beginning of the bus stop. That was a reminder to Sebastian Buemi in the number eight Toyota. Two by two, like Noah's Ark, they come across the line. They should get the green this time round. The red lights are on. We are ready to start the season. Mike Conway leads the number eight Toyota, is looking to drop in behind, but Phil Hansen, the blue, dark blue 22 United Auto Sports car, was there. Little bit of contact. One of the Jota cars in the middle, and a big lockup from the better of the two Ferraris. That's AF Corsa's Miguel Molina. Ferrari going second and third, and Phil Hansen can't slow down. He's just got to get speed into the car, and if that means going by the hypercar Toyota, so be it. Yeah, and it was Gonzalez that we saw getting a little bit out of shape coming into the first corner, but Hansen's now dropped down to third. That straight line speed of the Toyota has just gone straight back, but this is a section where the LMP2 car should be significantly quicker. Down the hill here, if they can make something here, look at the yellow car, Guido van der Garde, he's up to second, he'll be the one in the charge. And Roman Rusinov starting the first of two G-Drive cars. They're not season-long entries, the orange and black cars. Gator van der Gaard trying to go the long way around the outside. Phil Hansen behind a slow Toyota, and he is trying to find some speed. Rusinov battling in fifth place. He's just got ahead of the Elf. Uh, the Elf started by Andre Negrau has dropped back a fraction. It's still in the familiar bright blue colours that we saw in the LMP2 Senior Tech car last year, but that is a hypercar entry. Certainly is. Conway's got a little bit of breathing space, but Sebastian Buemi's having to watch his mirrors because Hansen's all over the back of him and Guido van der Garde just a watching brief as they come down to the lowest point of the circuit. From here, it's a long, gradual... It's flat out, but it's a long, gradual climb all the way through this Stavlo corner and then down toward or up towards Blanchemont and back towards bus stop. There you see straight-line difference of the Toyota just pulling away from the LMP2 car, but it is so minimal in comparison to what we're used to in a previous era. And that is purely because they're deploying the hybrid system there, gives them that extra boost of power. The internal combustion engine is very similar to a P2 car's power. And Andre Negrau dive bombs Roman Rusinov, so he moves back up to fifth position for Alpine. And we hear from the pit lane from Louise Beckett that ARC Bratislava have a fuel cell leak. That is really tough for one of our debut teams in the championship. The first time a team from Slovakia has raced in World Endurance Championship. In GCE Pro, the uh, Porsche is in front 92, ahead of Miguel Molina and Alessandro Pierguidi in those two Ferraris. We watch behind with tail gunner Richard Leitz, and Antonio Garcia is behind him. Here comes the Alpine up the hill. It is not a hybrid car, so it doesn't have that extra boost. There he goes, up uh, the inside of Guido van der Garde in the GT classes, by the way. Ben Keating had a stellar start, was by the Corvette in the early uh, corners and was nibbling to get uh, uh, into uh, fourth position past the number 91 Porsche. Didn't quite make it, has dropped back, but leads the class ahead of Francois Perodo in the uh, championship defending 83 AF Corsa. Worth pointing out that Ben Keating, uh, the Texan car dealer, runs 14 car dealerships. That's what he does for a living. He's not a pro race driver. Third season in World Endurance Championship, first season in a Ford GT, second season in a Porsche, third season he's in an Aston Martin. I'm assuming next year he'll race a Ferrari because he can. Obviously not Brad and loyal when he's selling cars, that's for sure. As we see now, a battle coming down into Pouin, the double left-hander, and that's a little bit of track limits slip wide. When you're on the outside, you're always going to get squeezed and compromised there, but uh, that's dropped back, and now the Porsche's got a bit of a breathing space over the two Ferraris, which were on the back of them. However, it, when it comes back to the lead battle here, the two Toyotas are not dropping Phil Hansen in United Autosport car at the moment. And what we've got there, by the way, is the GTE Pro leading cars with the gentleman drivers at the moment, trying to get the heat into the tyres at the back of that LMB2 battle. That battle, by the way, PR1 Motorsports, uh, collaborating here with Panis Racing, on board here with the number seven Toyota, and with Real Team Racing. So it was Patrick Kelly and Esteban Garcia. It was Garcia that lost out running wide there. One of our two Garcias, Esteban dropping back there in the Real Team Racing car. Of course, we've got Antonio Garcia in the Corvette as well in the uh, GTE Pro class. In fact, the first time that Antonio Garcia and Oli Gavin have actually been in the same car together. They've spent many years as good friends racing for Corvette Racing, never had the chance to share a car. So, Toyota Gazoo Racing, the 010. 
1-2, and they're easing, creeping away from Phil Hansen. But as you said, Alan, fastest car in Sector 2 is an LMP2 car. That's where the downforce works most or is needed most. In the AM class there, you can see the 83 Ferrari. That is Francois Perodo. He's second ahead of Paul Dallalana, a different livery on the 98 Aston as well. It's now that yellow and blue, Paul, with a couple of Brazilian teammates. And so uh, that is a different livery from the factory yellow and green that we've been used to seeing. And there's the leader, Ben Keating, the bright blue four horsemen car in front. But Francois Perodo has actually got himself up into second because Dallalana started second on the grid and was tracking Keating for the first lap. However, now Perodo in the Ferrari has got himself up into that position. Be interesting to see how he can catch up during it because what we have seen historically is that the Ferraris are much better in the race than they are in qualifying. Whether that's strategy or whether it's just naturally the way the car is, but it seems to be consistent in Pro and also in AM. See here with Ben Keating coming over the rise there. Look back further in the field though if you're watching us on oh. live time. Big leap over the crest there from Paul Dallalana. The number 77 car, remember, started from the back of the grid. Matt Campbell, uh, pro driver, the uh, Porsche factory driver, making rapid progress up through the order. Great start to the race, by the way, too, from Tomonobu Fuji in the number 777 D Station Racing Aston Martin. The second car handled by yeah. TF, and another car that had big problems earlier in the week. In fact, the 77 and the Triple Seven were the last cars on the grid, and they are now running in fifth and sixth place in GTE AM. So Fuji and Campbell both going well. That D Station Racing team, it's a, a dark green and black Aston Martin. But ahead of them, Chetilar Racing. Now, Chetilar have spent the last couple of years in World Endurance in LMP2, struggling to make a Dallara work. They've decided to go with another Italian brand, which is a little bit more turnkey, Ferrari. So they're in GTE AM. Same driver lineup that we're used to seeing, and it's Roberto Lacorte who started that car. It's a bright blue Ferrari with the Chicolore stripes down the middle. It's a, a glorious looking livery. And also, by the way, adding associate sponsorship to the GTE Pro Ferraris. You'll see that on the front quarters of the two uh, Pro cars, the 51. And remember, not 71 this year, but 52 is the other car this year, and they run in the opposite order. 52 at the moment, ahead of 51. Miguel Molina and of Alessandro Pierguidi. And Kevin Escher, the leader in GT Pro, has put about a three-second margin and growing on the two Ferraris and his teammate Richard Leeds in the Porsche. So Escher has seemingly found as much pace in the race as he did in qualifying. Change of position here. Alessandro Pierre Guidi drifts up the inside from third. Three green lights on the side of his car up to second at the next split that will change. And six, two green lights on the side of Miguel Molina will become three. You can see the Corvettes not being dropped by much. I think the warmer race day temperatures are going to help that. The team was saying they've struggled with cold track temperatures. It's the same car, the same drivers, and exactly the same tyre that they use in North America. But whereas the track temperature here is in single digits, a cold day in America is very, very much warmer than that. Yeah, as we see, the B2 just getting a little bit loose as it came into Lake Holm. The track temperature, actually, with the sun now that it's came out, it's gone up to 27, 28 degrees okay. Celsius. So bad. Air temperature still a little bit chilly. It's got an edge to it. But the track, which is what the tyre sees, that's the only thing that it really cares about, is the abrasiveness and the speed of the corner, plus also the temperature of it. And uh, that's now starting to get into a window where it maybe is helping the Corvette, uh, as you said. On the other side of it, for whatever reason, it isn't helping Miguel Molina because he seems to be sort of holding back his teammate. Now his teammate's ahead of him, and uh, he'll be in a position where he's looking in the mirrors more than looking at the windscreen. Yeah, so one Ferrari free to chase the lead Porsche. The other one will have to fight off the second Porsche. Looking back here at the battle between the G-Drive car, that's number 25, with Dragon Speeds, one Pablo Montoya chasing John Falt in the G-Drive car, and we ride on board behind both of them with Robin Freens. Man, you've spent plenty of time racing against Alan, but he's got, uh, he's got a good rep on his on his CV already, Robin, hasn't he? He's, yeah. a, he's an impressive young peddler. No, I know him very well. Not racing against him as a driver because he's much younger than me. Uh, you, but uh, certainly from team. a team perspective, yes, he's uh, he's got a great CV. He's been part of uh, 
different programmes that have been involved in for quite a long time now, and uh, I'm sure he'll get sorted out with this. At the moment, they are seventh. They've moved up from tenth on the grid to seventh. Uh, and uh, it's sort of sitting there, uh, I would say, in a learning position. But right now, there is only one car that's really streaking ahead, as it was all of last year's at United Autosports and LMP2. That is a big lead, 6.7 seconds at the moment. Phil Hansen ahead of Gedo van der Gaard, who's no slouch in the second car in LMP2, car number 29 in fifth place overall. You see Hansen here with the paler blue Elp, uh, Alpine Elf catching him very slowly, but it is creeping up behind, and then you get in the twisty stuff, and it gets dropped again by the P2 car. Indeed, fighting back from uh, their uh, qualifying performance, hampered, by the way, by uh, a fault in the centre unit to one of the new torque sensors that helps with the balance of performance. Closing in there through the bus stop, though, Andre Negrao has been rapid in LMP2 for several years now, getting to grips, as are the team, with pressure, precious little testing before the season, just four days uh, with his number 36 LP. Now that he's stuck right up the back of the gearbox of uh, the United Autosports car, he actually equaled the Toyotas on the last lap. And so the speed of uh, the Alpine is there relative to Toyota, uh, but he needs to get ahead of uh, United Autosports to be able to show it and to well, maybe take the fight to those two Japanese cars. And remember, the other big changing dynamic here is going to come pretty soon because these are not as quick as the old LMP1 hybrids were. That means traffic is going to be more of a challenge for everybody. So it's not going to be as easy for any of these cars, and in, well, not in particular, but the lead is included when traffic becomes a factor. Well, uh, we were having a, a meeting with the Porsche GT team boss this morning, and he echoed what the drivers have told us earlier in the week, that in a GT car, it's very hard in a, a, for a, a P2 car or, and also the hypercars to get by a quickly pedaled GT car. And that doesn't just mean the Pro class, that means the AM class when all the other drivers are in it. I was about to ask, when was the last time when Pablo Montoya raced at Spa? John Falp, who he's just passed, raced here last year, raced here in ELMS, he's raced here a number of times. When was the last time Montoya raced at Spa? It would have been in Formula One, but that's 15 years ago. I mean, I, the track's I'll no real him. difference, but it's, a, it's been a long while since he was driving into uh, Fonkashar, I bet you. Anyway, he moves up, he's got ahead of John Falp, and in fact, Robin Freens for WRT has also moved up, so Montoya for Dragon Speed, fifth place. Robin Freens in sixth, John Falp down to seventh. There's Antonio Garcia. He's actually closing in now on Miguel Molina and Richard Leeds. But Molina seems to be the sort of cork in the bottle. I wouldn't say, though, uh, that Pierre Guidi, when he overtook two or three laps ago, is able to streak ahead. But Molina seems to be a li little touch slower. On the last lap, it was only three tenths of a second. But those three tenths of a second, you know, do add up very, very quickly. Yeah, the last lap, actually, Garcia was as quick as the Ferrari and not far off the pace of the Porsches. The two Porsches are doing, uh, well, the lead Porsche, Kevin Estrell, doing a 2.14.0, lead Ferrari, 2.14.7. Now, of course, they only have four and a half sets of tyres for the entire race, so old tyres will become a factor when you use them, how you use them, so the balance of power in GT Pro will change. Jota Sport here, ahead of G-Drive, so Stoffel van Dorn has also just got by John Falk, because that is the 20, uh, 25 G-Drive car. Roman Rusinov in 2016, which is visually identical, is still in third in LMP2. And he's actually three seconds behind Gerda van der Gaard and three ahead of Alex Brundle. What I've been quite surprised at is this particular battle for third place overall. And uh, this is between United Autosports as we've got a replay here of uh, coming down into the bus stop, and that's, yeah, never going to happen around the outside there, I have to say. That was the real team prototype coming up behind GTE Pro leader Kevin Est, so uh, I think uh, Esteban Garcia ran out of road quicker than he was hoping. Meanwhile, it's, it's here first comes... season, by the way, in LMP2, so there's lessons to learn. There's a tough one there. Matt Campbell dives by Paul Dallalana. That puts Campbell in the 77 car, crashed, did not qualify, 
up to third and down the inside comes the D station machine as well. So this is Tomono Fuji in his World Endurance Championship debut. He moves up for D station run by TF Sport and that car now up into fourth position in the AM class and again like 77 from the last row of the grid. Uh, the Anzabal away from Juan Pablo Montoya I believe is the 2005. Oh, backwards. That's the real team car again, just pushing a little too hard. That's out of the Brussels hairpin. Looks like he's looped it around, long right-hander, slightly adverse camber. Maybe get a replay of that. He and help. he, gets a, he oh. gets a bit of a touch. He wasn't quickly enough on the throttle for the Ferrari, who clearly ha felt he had a bit better traction and right. a bit of a nudge. Now is where we're going to talk about you cannot afford to make mistakes all season long and traffic was always going to be where the mistakes were going to come here at Spa. If that's not a penalty for Miguel Molina, I will be surprised, which means they are suddenly right on the back foot against their own teammates, never mind the Porsche drivers in the pro field. Well, you've got uh, this particular race, but you've also got five cars in the category, so you can't afford to have any slip-ups, not just now, but through the whole season. And the other thing is, it's not just pro drivers that take overall GT points, AM drivers do as well. So if you're 10th of all the GT cars, that's all you get. Perfect. And now engine map four. Engine map four. OK for you? That's OK. Me message Copy. to Negrao. Engine we map have four. More power. Step by step. Uh, so they, clearly there it is, that was just going to say, engine map four could be one of two ways. It could be a lean map to try to save fuel if you can't overtake, then you use it to try to extend your uh, stint length, or alternatively, uh, you have got a little bit more power to try and overtake. But I was going to say earlier on, the one thing I've not seen is that Alpine actually be able to attack the LMP2 card on the straight, uh, but now he may be able to do it. Well, one of the reasons why, A, he's going to be desperate to get by, B, there might be that possibility he's looking to fuel safe, Alan, is something of a, 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 something of a, a enigma, really, which is chatting to Filipsino before this race, they cannot carry as much fuel in that car as the BOP says they can. Uh, or would allow them to, so they're going to be short uh, fuel, uh, short stopping, if you like, against the Totas. Little, maybe a lap, maybe two laps longer than P2s. That's a side-by-side -side there oh. between number 77 and number 777, all the sevens. The most experienced F uh, FIA WEC driver versus one of the least experienced, a man in his, what race are we now, 67th, 68th? Yeah, I think it's fair to say the flashing of lights from Tomo Bufuji there was not congratulating him on the move. <laughs> Get out of the way! So that way, in fact, that's not Christian Reed, that is Matt Campbell. So the young Porsche star got by the D station uh, car for third place now in GTE Am. Juan Pablo Montoya leading Robin Freens down the hill, two different generations of driver. And that's one of the delights of endurance racing. You get super experienced drivers and hot young hot shoes. And that here again, you know, you've got Phil Hansen and Andre Negrau. They've both got super experienced teammates, but you've got two young guns going at it. And Alan, as you say, we may be on the second sheet of A4 in the setup notes now for Alpine on this new car and turning up the boost little by little. Yeah, little by little, but exactly that point that Graham just mentioned. Basically, you've got a fuel tank, and to try to change the volume of it, they put in effectively like plastic balls, which yeah. then reduce the amount of uh, fuel that you can put in or increase it if you take the balls out. And so I'm a bit surprised they haven't been able to get to the maximum. It sounds like there is a, a tank issue as much as it's, anything it's, else. It's as much as the tank will take. The, the BOP allows them to take fuel that they physically can't fit in the car, okay. which is pretty remarkable. It is pretty <laughs> remarkable, but that will mean that they have to then compromise and try and think. Now, it may not mean they do one lap less than uh, the competition. It just maybe means that uh, they can't quite run it as full power as they would have hoped. Side by side again here, and a little bit of contact, wow. and maybe again, this is the 83 and the 777. These two cars from the back of the grid are just slicing their way through the GTE Am field. Ben Keating still leads, 77 Matt Campbell now up to second, Tomo Fuji now up to third ahead of Francois Perodo in the AF Corsa car. That's back down to fourth, and again, Phil Hansen in third overall ahead of Andre Negrau, and this time Hansen just steps aside, sees 
Sanjay yeah. Negrao is coming. To your, very likely, Gary Robertshaw was on the radio going, just coast, let him go. Get them go because they've got seven seconds advantage behind. And at this moment, it's quite clear the Alpine could have a little bit more overall pace for the lap. But uh, they're united are seven seconds ahead of Guido van der Garde, that's second in that category. And the other thing that having the Alpine in front up the Kemmel Straight and, uh, and uh, down towards uh, Eau Rouge will do is give you a little bit of toe. Well, let's hear from the number eight Toyota team. Sebastian Buemi lies second. OK, so prepare to swap position. Prepare to swap position. Mike Conway, the car behind you, is going to be taking the lead very soon. Prepare to swap position to Buemi. Buemi's second at this moment in time. And now, so I would... Uh... Buemi hasn't shown any sign whatsoever of trying to make an overtaking manoeuvre. Clearly, he's been on the radio going, he's up in the up. Uh, you don't know. This no. could be exactly the point you made earlier on about conserving fuel. Yeah. And if you switch the cars, and then they can maybe drag it forward. We don't know the reason behind it. However, what we do know is that there's a radio call to Seb Buemi to say that they're prepared to swap positions, and that clearly the only car they can be swapping positions with is the sister yeah. car that's up ahead. Well, to do that, Mike Conway's going to either have to have a big lift up before the bus stop or miss a couple of gears, right. because Buemi is not that close. He was a second behind. But, uh, you know, if they're looking to, if they're looking to finish the race 1-2, which clearly they are on the debut in hypercar, having one co car tow for half the stint and the other car tow for the other half of the stint, they both are on an equal footing. I don't think the team are playing favourites on... In, in the first 20 minutes. We're, we're not quite halfway into their fuel stints, but no. is that a reaction to the fact the Alpine is now in third? No, I think that's... Uh, Only six yeah. seconds behind. Yeah. It's possible. He hasn't swapped yet. They've just put a lead on the 28th place car. That was the second Dempsey Proton car, the Porsche of Andrew Harianto, the Indonesian driver. And, yeah, Sebastian Buemi, prepare to... Prepare to Prepare to swap positions, i.e. hurry up. Yeah, he's now just looking to the inside. As say, Hello, remember me? <laughs> Bonjour. And uh, that's uh, a little note. There's no flashing of lights. There's no radio calls coming back yet. But uh, a bit of a nod. If, if very frankly, the more I think about it, of a bit of a nod sort of call at this point, unless it is purely just to swap from a strategic perspective. Yeah to guide them into a different operating area. Uh, other question, by the way, uh, which of those two pit stalls is it pit out? Yeah, but I would be always wanting to be the car ahead, whatever. You get the strategy advantage. Uh, I've led so far, then I wouldn't want to give it up just purely for that. Seven, seven is a pit out. Right, so in which case it's... it's well, let's... Not a reason why you would do it. It's a reason why Let's hear it. from Louise Beckett and and say, uh, Louise, oh, I'm pressing the button. Are you on? You should be on. Yeah, they've just switched now. Buemi's ahead. Yeah, it's uh, now coming down. So Mike Conway moved to the left hand side, uh, coming down in towards Pujol, and that allowed uh, Sebastian Buemi to just to sweep round the outside. I think Louise Beckett down in the pit lane, you had a little bit of information from the team about this particular switch. Yeah, what the team told the Seb was the faster car from the start. So the Seb is the faster car at the moment, meaning that's the reason for the switch. That's the only information I can get about it at the moment. Thank you very much. Got to say, they, they, they've got more data than we have. We're looking at timing screens. They're looking at a significant amount more data. But uh, yeah, it was... Uh, after 10 laps, then switch between one and two, feeling that Seb Buemi was quicker than uh, Mike Conway at this moment in time in the race, but with five hours, 30 minutes to go, there's a lot of playing around still to come. Yeah, if Seb was that quick, you would think he might have been closer than 1.1 seconds behind, but we'll wait and see how much Mike Conway closes up now to prove that he's the quicker of the two cars. Riding on board with the Corvette of Antonio Garcia, the car is still in fifth place in the GT category and GT Pro. Miguel Molina, Richard Leitz in front of him. Again, losing no ground, really, to that battle. Once more, the G-Drive. Car number 25 is in the thick of the action, and that's against the Chota car. 
That's John Fowl. Yeah, there. Roberto Gonzalez. So the Mexican and the American battling side by side. Roberto's been, it's now his fourth season in the World Endurance Championship. John Fowl, very experienced in these cars in ELMS. And, and right. right behind, car number one, the Richard Mill Racing Team. And that is significant because Kavissa is looking to put in a move here on John Falp as well. Yeah, she's been uh, running just in behind the, this group for quite a little while now. And got a run, but not quite a, a big enough run up the long straight there, as uh, Falp had to take a little bit of a lift as he came down to the bottom of Eau Rouge. Uh, but now she's right on the back of that car. I think perhaps the, the Richard Mill team had just been bedding themselves in quietly. You know, the, the first thing you've got to do here to get a good result is not hit anything in the first 20 minutes, so... But they did this blindingly well at Le Mans, yeah. where they just were very quiet, managed to do all of their strategy correctly without making any mistakes whatsoever, and that's what put them into a good position. Back to the Ferrari battle here in Pro. Miguel Molina's got Richard Leitz right behind them. Leitz is really pushing hard now. reason Leitz is pushing hard is Alessandro Pierre Guidi, once he overtook Molina's, pulled three seconds seconds up ahead, but eight seconds up ahead of um, of Puyer Gidi is actually the leader of the category, Kevin Estra. He's on a different level this week, isn't he? A completely different level. It's very busy oh. there, that's double contact. Oh. That was double contact, the uh, the G-Drive car on the Earl Links car, punted that into the Jota car, and a little bit of debris there too. Yeah. In fact, both Iron Lynx cars were there. The yellow car is the male crewed car. The one with the pink highlights is the female crewed car. So that's the Iron Dames machine. So... That was and, actually... And, and the Richard Mill car was in there as well. You know, that was potentially a fairly major incident. Real team into the pits there. And uh, Lloyd Duval just wandering away. He's not getting in at this moment. But that, I think, was a replay. We saw the switch between those two cars yeah. about uh, maybe a couple of minutes before, and this is a replay of how it started off. Change for the lead in GTEM about to come up here. This is Ben Keating in the bright blue TF Sport Aston and Matt Campbell in the 77 Dempsey Proton car. They started at diametric opposite ends of the GTEM field. Ben on pole, but the gentleman driver with a Porsche factory professional coming from the back row behind him. But what is interesting here is Tomo Fuji in that D station racing Aston Martin. The green highlights on the black car is right in the mix as well. This is the top three. Yellow flags are out at turns one, one, and one. So that's the exit of La Source. Uh, yellow removed yellow there. back in, so that somebody was, went off it, there. It was but... debris, it was debris. Yeah. Uh, we had a quick uh, re uh, message that just before that incident involving the Iron Lynx that there was debris uh, between one and two. Uh, Leitz was very quick in the first sector on the last lap. He needs to get a really clean run out of here, but it looks like Molina can get off this corner well, and he's also able to go through the next one flat out. The Ferrari seems to be have, a, have a touch more straight-line speed than the Porsche at the moment. The Porsche looks to be very stable in the middle sector, but the Ferrari looks just happy enough to keep himself ahead. But the battle for the lead in LMP2, that's came down a little bit. Guido van der Gaard has pulled within three seconds now of Phil Hansen. Hansen went off into the distance like a scalded cat behind the Toyotas initially. Now he's got fourth overall. Guido van der Gaard has made a match in. Well, remember how hard the Porsche team were saying the LMP2s are having to work to get by GT cars. LMP2, less powerful, heavier, low drag aerodynamics this year. It's not as easy. The closing speeds are smaller. It's going to add more drama in traffic throughout this season. There's no doubt about that. We said at the top of the show, and we've seen that exactly that when Alan was talking about that gap coming down, a hard-earned gap. You've got to work hard in traffic, and it's going to benefit the bold and we just saw Juan Pablo Montoya closing in on Roman Rusinov. Colombian versus Russian. In between them, the Chetila Ferrari. That's Roberto Lacorte, who's in sixth in the GTE AM class. Where well, he may not have been to spa for the better part of two decades, but Juan Pablo Montoya certainly knows how to pedal the car around here quickly. Again, plenty of success here for G-Drive and Roman Rusinov, particularly in European Le Mans series racing, but they've raced here with World Endurance for the last three or four years at least. 
So with a new team, got... remember, this year. This yeah. is uh, stepping up. It's the team they've run with in the Asia Le Mans series and won championships the last two years uh, in the Asia Le Mans series. Now with Algar Pro Racing, David Leach has carried over uh, with the team as the new technical director. Looking at the tyres there. So again, look at the start of the race. This is where Phil Hansen... Oh, is that contact there for the real team car? Is that where it all started? There was yeah. a bit of a squeeze with three into one, yeah. and then there was, was a the, nudge from the back. It was a 24 car. Through. It was the 24 PR1 car. Oh, is that right? Yeah. OK. Well, then he had contact, didn't he, at uh, Piff Path at Fania with the uh, briefly, real team car? He Ooh, look, briefly three took the lead, wide. didn't he? Yeah. yeah. He took the lead. I'd, I'd missed that the first time around, but uh, got be, I thought he got between them. He briefly took the lead, and then... Uh, Tried to defend. You know, we saw we saw that. Where did we see that from Bruno Senna last year in uh, in Everywhere. the rebellion, getting between <laughs> the Toyotas? Yeah. And this is the start in GTE Pro. Yeah. You know that big lock up down the inside. The problem there is just when you're at maximum retardation, Alan, the track drops away on the inside by that pit wall, and suddenly everything's freewheeling. Yeah, it is. And if you're behind the car ahead of you, you lose a little bit of the aerodynamic and especially the braking efficiency. I don't mean uh, brake pad to disc. I mean the actual dyna aerodynamics on the front of the car to load the car and stop the wheel locking. Sebastian Buemi leading and pulling away, not at all, from Mike Conway, whose car appears to be equally quick. In fact, Mike Conway half a second quicker on the last lap. Yeah, on the lap, well, traffic related, I think, there. So we've got to see yeah. how it evolves over the, the course of maybe 20 laps or something like that. But uh, certainly Conway uh, has been able to hang on to the back of Boemi. I think the radio call would obviously G you up a little bit. I know from personal experiences, a driver never likes those radio calls, but uh, you have to accept them because they're a little bit like penalties in football. They will come and go with you through the course of a season. And the worst thing that Toyota can do is have their two cars fighting against each other at this stage of a race, this stage of a campaign, yeah. when uh, they've got a five-second gap and only a five-second gap back to the third-place car. And again, you see Mike Conway there in the second, those two white and red Toyotas going by the Ferrari of Alessandro Pierre Guidi, and it wasn't the rate of closing that, that anybody is used to. Still, this battle for the lead in GTE Am, Ben Keating, he put in some really big performances last year in the uh, Project One Porsche that he was driving. He's doing the same again in this TF Sport Aston. Matt Campbell is as factory a driver as they come with Porsche. You know, if they had more cars in the pro class, he'd be in it, but he is doing everything he can to try and get by. Paul Dallalana in the 98 Aston being warned about track limits, so clearly their car is not handling as well as either of the two F TF Sport cars. Yeah, um, he's dropped down to fifth place. He was yeah. second on the grid, Dallalana, yeah. but he kind of got shuffled down to fifth place and just got a track limits warning black and white flag. But. I've got to be honest with you, I'm super impressed with not only TF Sport, because they've delivered consistently, but with Ben Keating. You know, multi-cars, he's yep. delivered in multi-cars all the way through and teams and everything else, but he just gets on and does it. He's kind of always up there. Yeah, Ben Keating, I think, risks being the first real gentleman driver to get a gold ranking for the FIA at this stage. <laughs> yeah. But um, not only that, uh, but in a, the last couple of Rolex 3 for hours races at Daytona, he's double dutied with a prototype and a GT car in the same race. He is an exceptional gentleman driver. And to hold off Matt Campbell, a mu very much a young gun, uh, in the Porsche factory roster is no mean feat. It is a great performance from Ben Keating after what was not an easy start to the week. No, not an easy start. And, and one of the other gentleman drivers last year, particularly who really, really shone, was a GDO Pathetti, so it's a real shame not to have his uh, Project One Porsche in the GT Anfield as well. But the, the big surprise there in that top three is not Ben still there from pole or Matt Campbell coming up there in the Porsche. It's Tomo Fuji. Now, we didn't have a barometer to measure him against. We do now. Oh, yeah. A good drive from him will no longer be a surprise, we will now be starting to expect that. Well, Super Taikyu a champion in Japan, Super GT racer with his team in Japan, race winner in GT3, Aston Martin, in the Asia Le Mans series with this same team, and now coming to the WEC, and what he's showing is he's got proper talent. Previous races at Spa, I'm sure you can count on no fingers. Top of Fuji, I'd, I'd be <laughs> astonished if I looked and found anything, I'll if be honest with you. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that he's ever raced in Europe, never mind Spa. Again, John Falp versus 
versus Bites Kavissa. Uh, in hyper motion there, that was the battle for, where are they now? They yeah, tenth are 10th and 11th in uh, LMP2. Yeah, and here's the battle. Oh, and the, the Ferrari's just gone a little bit wide. Didn't lose very much. You can actually miss the apex at La Source and not lose or gain anything. But as long as you don't go more than maybe two meters from the apex. But again, it's got the speed down through this section of circuit to be able to keep away. However, look at the car that's in the middle of them. That's the lead in LMP2. And the gap back to Guido van der Garde is now only three and a half seconds. Yeah, Phil Hansen's been trying to get by those two cars for several laps. Meanwhile, Matt Campbell trying to go out Side. Got alongside Ben Keating. Ben's going, that's my racing line there, you see. And Campbell holds on. And right behind is Tomonobu Fuji. So those two Aston Martins, both run by TF Sport, whereas the AMR, the factory-run oh. Aston Martin 98, does not appear to have the speed that they do. So this is where Campbell makes his move, and he just toughs it out on the outside, Al. Yeah, I've got to say, Ben Keating was very kind and gentle there because he could have run him out and over the sort of rumble strip area, but decided and declined to do that. He was very gentleman driver, but gentlemanly in the way that his conduct was. Uh, I'm sure if it was the last lap of the race, it might be slightly uh, different, very, but very we're different. not quite yeah. there yet. <laughs> and uh, now third place, uh, Fuji is trying to also get past, and he's been pretty quick, I've got to say. He's looked good, and I think he's now got a run on it as Keating runs yeah. slightly wide in the hairpin and allowed uh, the Aston Martin switch for second place. Yeah, ben just ran a little deep there down into uh, Rivage, didn't he? And so a change for the top three. It's still the same cars, but it is now Matt Campbell that leads from Tomonobu Fuji and Ben Keating in third place. A Kiwi ahead of a Japanese and a Texican. So that is your Porsche Aston Aston battle. Out front, Sebastian Buemi leads by 1.4 seconds now over Mike Conway. And Louise Beckett, we're some way yet from we're some way yet from where we we're expecting pit stops, but the driver's getting ready now. Yeah, there's definitely some activity starting from the LM. Uh, teams, but what I have seen is Brim Jimmy Bruni in the 91 getting ready. The 92, there's no movement whatsoever, so they're obviously splitting their tactics there. Yeah. Well, the two teams, or the two car teams, seem to run, I mean, they can flab, but they run independently, so they will be running a different strategy. And this happened with Ferrari last year with Alessandro Pierre Guidi and James Collado. Basically, Alessandro stayed in the car until he needed an espresso, and then James got 20 minutes. Whereas the other car, they swapped their drivers at each stint. Now, possibly what we'll see from the 91 car, because it's behind, is they might now go for a new tire and a new driver, and the 92, because it's in front, may well double stint their tire, keep Kevin in, and then hand over when they are due a tyre change rather than a fuel stop. Very possibly, but going on the last couple of years, even when they were not changing the tyre, Porsche would very often change the driver, and they would do that single, single, single strategy all the way through the races. Loic Duval, one of my old teammates there, just a little bit of... Uh, Pep Talk, TDS are the team running that car, and one that have, well, a team that's won many, many LMP races through the course of it, and Loic uh, is racing in America in the IMSA Championship. Extremely, extremely fast guy. Yeah. Good to see him back in this championship, actually. It really is, and, and there's there's been a real influ influx of uh, very talented sports car drivers, young and not quite so young, heading in here. Well, let's get down into the depths of the LMP2 field and talk about newcomers team WRT. What have they got to say with Robin Friens? Currently, all of the cars in front are on the same strategy, so close the gap as much as you can before the pit stop. That's to Robin Friens. Close the gap as much as you can. You're six overall. The issue that he has is average lap time for this race so far has been a 2.08.8. I take that to Guido van der Garde, that's a 207.8, and to Hansen, 207.6, so it's over a second off the pace of the lead two cars who look to be absolutely on their own in terms of performance. Yeah, WRT have been struggling for straight line speed, they've been telling us all week here, and uh, I think uh, just trying to find that gap. Uh, just catching up with that Tomonobu Fuji uh, point, has raced in Europe. We'll tell you Ooh, a bit, okay. little bit about that 
uh, in just a short while. We're going to go to Team Radio from United Autosport with Phil Hansen. Okay, three seconds is the gap. We'll be boxing this lap for fuel only. Box this lap for fuel only. All right, that's the voice of his engineer, Gary Robert Shaw. So he runs the 22 car overseas there. Okay, World, in now open. World Endurance and ELMS programs. Oh, oh and a spin oh. from the Chetelar Ferrari. The pit lane is open. He's in the pit entry. He's actually spun on the exit of the bus stop. And was not planning to go into the pits. Oh, he partly went into the pits, but only the rear car. And this oh. is why, round the outside, and a little bit of a tap. Mm. Yeah, trying to get round Paul Dallalana for fifth in the class. I'm so not sure where I stand on that, very honestly. Yeah, the car behind was Dallalana, but as we see, the 91 oh, that's that's it. lost his brakes or something. Yeah. Oh, there no, was, he hasn't. Oh. There was a lock-up. No, he's just aborted and then went. He's been very quick to realise the quickest way to recover is actually to let off the brakes and go around the escape road. Yeah which is an official escape road now. It used to be just a sort of bumpy runoff area. So. But, sorry, I was coming back to that investigation now between the two cars. I kind of sit more on racing incident. If you round the outside like that, especially in that corner, it is a little bit tricky and there's always a risk you're going to get a hit, but there's a oh. second hit. Is that a result of damage from the first one, I ask? Yeah, cause or effect. Possibly picked up a, a slow puncture. Possibly he's had another go. No, he can't have done, can he? He wouldn't have been close enough. No, he's I'm just. Sure. So United Autosports and Racing Team Netherlands both in the pit road. There you are, live pictures. So driver doors not open on either. You imagine Gerda van der Gaard will stay in. Think we're going to see? No, not going to see a driver change. Now there's different rules with driver changes. Now it doesn't have to be the outgoing driver who straps in the incoming driver. It can be another team member or a third driver if you have three drivers in the cars. 21 is in as well. That's the Dragon Speed car, and that is high class car number 20. Very different looking oh. colours on there as well. And a quicker stop oh. by Racing Team Netherlands there as yeah. they're able to get out oh. and not quite enough to jump into the lead. Yeah. Like they were three and a half seconds behind coming into the pits and now right on the back of it. So the TDS refueling is significantly quicker for whatever reason than United. That's interesting. That is interesting. Was it a shorter fuel stop for track position? The TDS are hugely practiced in the pits. I mean, United are no slouches. That was close. And what was once a seven point something second lead is now not even seven feet between them. Well, for the moment, into Europe all competition go to the lead. Damage, Damage. on the 25 G drive. We saw car. that, didn't we? That was side by side yeah, uh, with the Iron Lynx car. Sorry, uh -huh. Graham, but there's steam coming out of that hole oh, in the side yeah. pod. And just so you know, that side pod isn't meant to have a hole in it. No. And it's and it's the uh, yeah the cooling area there for the 25 car that might well be going back in the garage. As you see now, the, this is effectively the lead of LMP2, not because of pit stops. Alex Brundle in Euro in, Europol competition is actually leading, but when the pit stops play out, it'll be back to this, and Guido van der Gaard has uh, been able to get that three and a half seconds gap, but on circuit, it definitely looks like on full tanks, the United Autosport is better. Let's see how it plays out in this stint, if it's the same, where the TDS Racing Team Netherlands car comes back as the fuel comes off uh, their car and they become more competitive. But right now, is there's a flood of <laughs> LMP2 cars, a train. Yeah. Is that what you call a, you know, a lot of LMP2 is a flood or a train or what? Well, it's all a, in. a busy time for Louise. Le Louise, call all these pit stops in one go. <laughs> well, actually, they're all stopping fairly closely together. You see the yellow and green there, that's into Europol, that's Alex Brundle, G-Drive's 26, Roman Rusinov, WRT there, car number 31, that's Robin Freens. And also following in both Jota Sport cars, Stoffel van Dorn in 28, and Roberto Gonzalez in mighty 38. And that means as they cross the line, back into the lead, go 22 United Autosports and second Racing Team Netherlands. Now, not stopped yet, the Richard Mill Racing Team in they come. So here's Bites Gavissa, and following her in in a couple of seconds, in fact, 12 seconds, should be Patrick Kelly for PR1. And away goes Roman Rusinov in the 26 G-Drive car. 
bit of housekeeping uh, for this one. It's 1.4 seconds is the gap now for the LMP2 lead. Uh, so some dramas out of race control. It's a black and white flag for the leading car for Seb Buemi, and also Ooh. car 98, uh, Paul Delalana, reported to the Stewarts for ignoring a black and white flag. Yeah, for, for repeatedly running off track after being warned about it. Uh, and the, the race control can tell the driver in the car which corner in particular he is causing multiple offences at. Um, so they do try and do everything they can to avoid penalising you. They don't just slap your wrist hard to start with. Well, the Alpine is in the pits as well. So the first hypercar class pit stop is happening for Alpine. But Toyota still won two. Sebastian Buemi and Mike Conway half a second apart. This is what we uh, said a little earlier in the broadcast. We expected that the uh, Alpine at the moment on its current balance of performance, that might change, of course, from race to race. Uh, but uh, the current balance of performance cannot go as long as the territory is on fuel. It's a negative. It just depends how big a negative it is, because if it incurs an extra pit stop, then it's uh, it's a one minute negative. If it doesn't incur a pit stop, then it's just effectively the extra sort of time, delayed time that you're spending there with uh, maybe reduced power or something. Just just to complete the point uh, before I forget it, um, the about Tomono Bufuji has raced multiple times on the Nürburgring in the VLN and the Nürburgring 24 hours, has won at Le Mans. Uh, actually uh, took part in the Aston Martin Festival some years ago, 2012, and won at least the class, if not the race of GT3 Aston. <laughs> right, OK. As we watch one of the G-Drive cars, we uh, just heard from Louise in the pit lane, that actually the sister G-Drive car with John Falb, we saw that the, at the pit stop, the left-hand side radiator uh, side pod was damaged, and the team didn't realise the extent of the damage, so they sent him back out, but they may have to bring him back yeah. in for repairs. So it's bigger damage than they thought uh, when he was actually in the pits. That is a little bit of a mistake in the pit stop because there should be someone, especially in an incident situation, and, he's, and also from the pit side wall who could look directly in at it to be able to flag it up. An extra pit stop will take them right out of the game. An extra time in the pits could maybe save them 30 seconds. Lead yeah. change. Oh, sorry, just no, United just and Gerda van der Garde, first and second, Phil Hansen, Gerda van der Garde. This is the battle for third, Roman Rusinov still ahead of Juan Pablo Montoya, half a second in it. So again, TDS turning around the G-Drive car very quickly, they lost nothing to Dragon Speed in the pits. The ride on board in 28 Jota with Stoffel van Dorn. So one of our local Belgian drivers in the G in the uh, Jota Sport car, and he's oh. not far behind, is he? 1.2 seconds was the gap at the last sector, and that's going to close right up because they're now up behind Ben Keating's Aston. That will hold up Rusinov and Montoya. It's going to be a three-car battle. Oh, it's going to be a three-car battle. We've got an overtake. We're going to go three abreast down the hill. Oh, here comes. A bit of a touch. Here comes JPM. Oh, oh, oh. oh, and Ben Keating on the grass. Can he hold it? Is he going to hit anything? That's possibly one of the few places in Spa you can get nudged off. That's down is the double left hander at Pua. Well, that's going to be investigated. Sorry to jump in there. That oh, definitely dude. will be investigated. Keating was 100% the innocent party there as uh, Montoya moved a little bit over on Rusinov there in the squeeze. And three definitely doesn't go into two, doesn't go into one. Here we see it again. Yeah, Rusinov in the centre moves over to deny Montoya room. There's contact. Montoya's going, oh, I don't think so, Sunbeam. I'm having some of the racing line. So does he give Rusinov room to survive? Well, Rusinov couldn't give Keating room to survive. In that one, the driver in the white car triggers the incident, I'm afraid. Uh, yes and no. Yes. Yeah, well, it's certainly the final incident. He got a better run. Uh, he realised that uh, Rusinov was bottled up behind the GT car, went for the move by him. It was certainly a move to block by Rusinov, and I think a bit of afters from Juan Pablo Montoya. Yeah. I think the actual incident with Ben Keating is the one they'll look at, not the build-up to it, because the build-up didn't affect Keating. No, I have to say, I agree with you on that particular one, that um, Juan Pablo Montoya is maybe going to have a little visit to the pit lane at some point on that particular issue, but I do feel for Keating because he was completely the innocent party there. Lucky he didn't do anything, hit anything, 
but uh, he will have uh, a, he'll not have good vibrations but he will have vibrations he will and the team are expecting him to come in and that's going to be some way shy of where we expect a gt car pit window maybe two or three laps I wonder if it's that bad or if he can just keep going to the end of the fuel. Watch this again. It's a bottle up behind the GT car. Watch where Montoya sees he's got the opportunity. There's a move and a second move to the left from, uh, from, from Rusinov. And Rusinov. then yeah. but it gets yeah. to be the afters. And at that point, yeah. The, the problem is that I think when Pablo Montoya could only see an orange car at that point and he yeah. couldn't see the blue car on the other side. So actually the blue car had effectively for him disappeared however in reality blue cars can't disappear like that <laughs> yeah, i don't think frankly either of the p2 drivers came out there with very much credit not particularly no and, and poor ben keating was over on the curbs trying to stay out of the way catching rusinov now is stoffel van dorn stoffel we're using the real uh, little too much be careful on power okay let's try to pass rusinov but be careful he's aggressive yeah, I think we can safely say that. <laughs> but he's got a run on him now, yeah. so Rusinov bottled up. Normally they used to be able to overtake into this right hand, and now they can't. And Van Dorn has got uh, now a little bit of a run, but maybe not enough. He's got to be careful, because the front of that car doesn't look like it's actually gripping too well, but he's also got to keep, be careful of the rears. It's not going to happen into Blanchemont. Maybe a bit of a lunge in towards Vastop. And Tom Ferrier is going, not again, stay away from my Aston. Luckily, they did stay away from his Aston because he also runs that dark green one as well as the bright blue one. Right behind, by the way, Alex Brundle and Robin Freens. So Brundle in the uh, yellow and green car and Robin Freens in the white and grey car, white, red and grey, and that's the battle for six. So we've got Rusinov fourth, Van Dorn in fifth, Brundle in sixth, Freens in seventh. That's a nice, tight LMP2 squabble. Fabulous stuff there, but the lead two cars now 30 seconds ahead of this battle. Yeah. That is some pace from the lead two cars. When you look at their average lap times, they are 207 mids, where everybody else is 208 highs. Yeah. They're over a second a lap faster on average, consistently as the leader is into the pits. Mike Conway, first of the Toyotas. In fact, he's coming in. Came, uh, stayed out. Yeah, he's coming Swansea. in from second place, isn't he? So he was our pole sitter. He started at the front and then after 10 laps or so, was told to drop back into second place. So Buemi stays out and it looks like a slightly staggered. Uh, they shouldn't be any questions over fuel. You will push on your tire more and more. If you feel no deg, it's okay for me, you can push on your tire more and more. Take care in the beginning, but after, it will be good. Well, out goes Mike Conway, Sebastian Buemi still leading, the Alpine coming up behind, not too far away. But it, it's exactly what we heard with the engine map there, Alan, from, from the senior tech team that are running this Alpine Elf. They're not trying to go 100% from the beginning. OK, where are we? How does it feel? OK, now you can do a bit more. We'll give you a bit more power. You can turn, you know, some of the, the, the controls down and just try and get more and more out of the car. They can, and uh, this is after a pit stop for both of these cars, and you can see the Alpine's still in the game. So now they're saying, look, for the rest of this stint, and you've probably got 20 laps, you can actually lean on it, just put a bit more energy into it. Driver can feel that, he can sense it. The data's in there for the team as there's an overtake. Robin Frins dives down the inside of Alex Brundle. Bit of a late one. Alex tried to turn in, but then had to pull out of it. And so Robin Frins is now up a place, up to sixth place from seventh. The next car up ahead of him, Stoffel van Dorn in the green uh, Jota Sport car, right behind fifth place, Roman Rusinov. And in the back of the shot, shooting into the pit lane, the race leader, number eight Toyota of Sebastian Buemi, is in the pits. But good move there from Stoffel van Dorn. That was fully lit. Robin Frins. I uh, beg your pardon, Robin Frins, fully lit. Down the inside of Brundle, who had to open up the steering in a bit of a hurry. Watch them break to roll to a halt. So there, a quick point about Andre de Grau in that Alpine and the instruction he's getting from his engineer. Remember, this is de Grau's first uh, race in a prototype other than an LMP2. And those yeah. tyres are fundamentally different yeah. from the ones that have had an LMP2 last year on the older Cinetech Alpine the LMP2 car. Now, we also heard from Louise while we were hearing the uh, radio message there that Ben Keating is happy to stay out for the remaining three laps of his stint. So he will come in. Oh, 
And drama for the number eight car, it's left with something attached or without something attached? Nothing's attached, it's left, and no. so therefore I think uh, there was obviously a radio message stop because they needed to check something before they release uh, Buemi, so that will mean Conway, Ooh. I would expect. He's behind, he's, he's still ahead. Behind. Yeah. Crikey. Well, Buemi, very annoyed there, squirted the car out of the pit lane, actually slid out of the pit lane. But he is still in front. Drive through for 98, Paul Dallalana. He cannot keep that AMR Aston Martin, the Northwest AMR car, on the grey stuff. I, now, I, I wonder if... You no, know, it's, it's the 35 seconds. It's the 35 seconds. Is, is he not... OK, I explain this now, Graham, because there may be a penalty for that. We were looking at the fuel man. He was looking at whatever gauge he's got. Let's have a listen to this first. Gonna hear from Tota. Yes or no? Yes or no? Go, 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 go. Right, panic, basically. I think what we're looking at there is the regulations say for a full stint stop, you must have the fuel attached for 35 seconds on both the hypercars and the GT Pros. I suspect that's what's happened there. There's a gauge, if you look, at the business end of the, of the, uh, the fuel hose, and I suspect that's what went wrong there. If he didn't have that hose attached for 35 seconds, there is going to be a penalty. Did you see the way it came off and went, try, he tried to put it back on, he was but the car was at going. The gauge. He was yeah. looking at the gauge. Yep. And that, and that is a potential problem. And the other thing is, he was quicker in that fuel stop than the other car. There is no reason why he should have been quicker in that fuel stop than the other car. It was two seconds quicker, even with the stop, even with that pull-up. Well, the stop, when stopping the car would give him the delta to bring him back in line, but you're, you're correct there in terms of he's going to be significantly quicker. Six, the seven, lane, seven laps. Information to the pit lane, drive through penalty car 98 for causing a collision with car 47. Drive through penalty car 98 for causing a collision with car 47. OK, I was going to catch up with that bit of housekeeping. So Paul Dallalana almost earning himself a, a drive through for track limits, gets a drive through for causing that collision. There was a driver change in the 91 Porsche. Jimmy Bruni is now in the car with left sides only. So they are splitting strategy. Look at the way the plaque burns um, in the compression there in Eau Rouge as we catch the real team racing car. And we are waiting. Ben Keating, by the way, after that spin, still in second place in the GTE AM class. Matt Campbell leads in the Dempsey Proton 77 Porsche. Ben Keating second in the field. And he is just how long? 2.3 seconds ahead of Francois Perodo, the 83 car, of course, that won the title last year in the AM class. Uh, they are in third spot. And uh, confirmed, by the way, Tota, they did take the fuel hose off early. Uh, not planned, Seb hesitated because the lollipop went up and then down again. So it was something of a miscue, reason unknown at the moment, but a um, little bit of chaos there for Toyota. Very interesting because uh, you came back from a discussion with them where they were very clear on that particular regulation very clear. as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's one of those odd ones when you're very clear of the regulation, how negative it can be, how often you actually trip up on that particular point. You know, yeah. it's almost like they misread 25 as 35, and genuinely it was that long a period almost. Yeah. Look, yeah. Watch this now. He's Yours nodding. already yeah. coming back. Yeah. I think it was that he tries to get it back out. Oh dear, oh dear. And it'll have a readout on there. You see, like, there's a big thing on the top of it, yeah. a data display, and that's got the fuel information. Pascal Vassal on the technical director there getting a bit of a debrief of what's going on, patting the back of the, the fueler. And uh, let, let's go and discuss this and see what we need to do or how we need to improve it, as well, opposed to pointing the yeah, finger. How do we make it not happen the next time? That's the only thing they're interested in, Graham. I would ask a, a second question, which was, they clearly had a miscue in terms of the timing. In your view, Alan, was that an unsafe release? The crew member was still hanging over where the rear wing is when that car was released. <laughs> crew member was out of the way um, I, I, with the fuel hose by the way yes but he's always he's got to have the fuel hose yeah head. yeah it's the question is was he behind the line and that's where we could not see the line there's a line on the ground 
as we see the two Toyotas chasing each other there with uh, Conway chasing the held in the pits Boemi. But uh, there's a line on the ground where they have to have got past when the uh, driver leaves the pits. Here's the 91 Porsche now with Jimmy Bruni aboard. Let's hear from his teammate Richard Leeds. Unfortunately, the, the advantage they have is out of the corner and basically on the on the top speed side. So to race them, it's very difficult if you are behind. Um, when you are in front, I think we could actually pull away a bit. But when you are behind to overtake after a long straight, it's impossible because they make the gap on the straight. So it's uh, a bit uh, a bit sad if frustrating because you you destroy the front tire because you follow them close, you lost the downforce uh, and and then. You cannot overtake because they are so fast on the straight, but uh, it's a six hour race. Uh, we, we changed the strategy for this a bit and uh, we are still in the game. I saw also that you only changed left side only on the tyres. Yeah, it's our strategy. <laughs> I will tell you after the race if it's better or not. OK, we will see how that works out for you. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thank you. Well, this is all part of the game when you don't have fresh tyres every stop. You've got to find a way of getting the best out of them. And, and if you're behind and you can't pass on pace, you can't do the same thing that they're doing. You've got to do something different. So, in fact, the 91 Porsche got out from behind the Ferrari by stopping early. Both Ferraris are now in and out of the pits. Uh, Pierre Guidi stays in the air of Corsa car. Of course he does. Miguel Molina actually stays in the 52, which is interesting. But that means the Corvette's up to second place behind Kevin Escher, who still leads the race in GTE Pro. Meanwhile... Midline, stewards decision number 31 gives car 21 a 10 second stop and go penalty for causing a collision 10 second stop and go penalty on car 21 for causing a collision all of the rest of it would just have been a racing incident yep. had they not whacked ben keating's aston martin a into collision. a different postcode absolutely right oh um, and here he comes up behind keating again go, having just been told that he's got oh, a penalty don't. do not touch that car here's our gte pro leader montoya will be in the pits i imagine this time round to serve that penalty uh, yeah, I was just about to say about the other uh, Porsche pit stop. Lovely little bit of theatre there as, uh, as uh, I think Lou slightly caught Richard Leeds unawares that she'd spotted what their strategic ruse was. <laughs> and uh, that was the professional Porsche driver and the professional pit lane reporter, uh, the clash of intellects. And I think Lou won that one. Well, it was it was Richard trying not to give away yes, anything. Of course but it, it was. it's what they so it's often the do is left sides only. Absolutely. Porsche do that a lot. Aston Martin made a big deal of it last year here and really successfully a number of times left sides only because the car seemed to be a bit a little bit light on its toes left sides only on 92 as well what you can do we can do and still stay in front but that left hand side graham gets a massive amount of load if you think going through or rouge and then you've got also all the section around the brussels hairpin and then round stavlo and coming back again it gets an absolute pounding not that the right hand side gets an easy time of it but the left hand definitely gets a harder time of it they only have four and a half sets or 16 tires total uh, sorry 18 tires total for the whole qualifying in race we're just over an hour into a brand new era for the fr world endurance <laughs> championship with the changes we know that have happened in the off season what a fundamentally different race it's been than what we've seen before in so many very wonderful ways so well we flagged this up at the beginning didn't we although we have two prototype classes classes with hypercar and lmp2 there's very little separation between them in terms of pace between the brand new hypercars and the lmp2 cars and in gt yes the all pro lineups are fractionally quicker but not that much quicker so the hypercars are struggling to get by all the slower cars on the circuit yeah, and in that uh, pit stop cycle by the way the corvettes leapfrogged uh, ahead of the number 91 porsche well i wonder if it took team tires at all uh, you That's it, tell sorry. you in a little second there if we look at it now look down from the helicopter you can see the two toyotas eight ahead of seven those are the red and white cars and they're up behind a pro class ferrari and the porsche oh there is uh, there's the porsche going by the corvette slightly muscular pass there by uh, jimmy bruni on still antonio garcia yep. the porsche drivers were saying that 
Neil Jani said yesterday in the press conference, he said, in the, in the middle sector, the hypercars are in the way of the GTs because they can't, and the Toyotas are in the way, they can't carry the corner speed that a GT car can, which is, all right, it's very early days yet, but the hypercar, the whole point of Toyota's car is that it is a road-relevant car. car. It's, it's like a hyper road car. So the real differences between something as hugely developed as a 911 and the hypercar, not that much at the moment. Montoya has served his drive through. You just saw him coming back out. And Robin Freens now ahead of Roman Rusinov for fourth place in G, uh, LMP2. Yeah, third place. And Stoffel van Dorn as well. He overtook Stoffel van Dorn and he's made his way up through. So WRT starting to make their way forward. However, United Autosports are 30 odd seconds up the road. In fact, 45 seconds up the road of this battle. Wow. But they're leading with Hansen. However, Guido van der Garde is only 1.7 seconds behind. So in the battle chase, so they've got a bit of work to do, but uh, certainly Robin Frins has started to make his way forward. What a great start to his career as a gold-ranked WC driver. This has been from Phil Hansen. Yep. Not in any way overawed by the massive quality that sits around him in this grid. Well, and it, you know, this you see the, the pass of Frings here on Roman Rusnov. A Rusnov you know, worked his way up from being a very raw driver, a gentleman driver, to being a gold standard driver as well, and, and so has Phil Hansen. But look at the speed that was carried there by the WRT car. That was really... Yeah, that was only because uh, they both got held up by the Aston Martin through, and so therefore, um, you know, both Rusinov and also Van Dorn, they were sitting ducks in this respect and uh, allowed Fringe just to sweep past both of them. And so it was all done in the one pretty cool manoeuvre, I have to say, yeah. but uh, it's certainly assisted by a... It was a bit like the banking in Daytona. Go left, go high, go down, go up, go down, you're through. Let's hear from Robin Freens and Team WRT. They now run third. Four men, you saw that? Yep, I saw that. You were nice. Nice job, mate. Keep cool. <laughs> Watch this! <laughs> hey, guys, guess what I've just done? Yeah, no, we saw that. Yeah, well Hold done. my Belgian beer. But, you know, we talked about the fact that this is their first race of the World Endurance Championship, their first encounter with an LMP2 car in a number of years. They've only done one LMP race before, LMP2 race before that. And the fact that they didn't really fight at the front in qualifying and they didn't really set the track on fire in the opening few minutes. OK, I think they've now found their feet and are quite happy with the car, the way it's working. They may have just changed a couple of little things in the pit stop we didn't see, maybe an adjustment here or there, but Robin Freens has dialed himself in as a World Endurance driver. But at the same time, Van Dorn has followed through past Rusinov, and so he's up into fourth place, and I suspect they will start to march ahead. One person that hasn't marched... ...back to 0.7 of a second, so Conway's just basically following in the wheel tracks of Bohemi right now, Toyota 1-2. Just sitting... ...and not worrying too much about it. You know, again, in the briefing this morning with the Porsche GT team, they were saying, OK, survive the first five hours, then see what you're left with. And that's got to be the deal for, for both of these two cars here. Toyota want them to finish 1-2. That must be among their prime concerns. But each of the driver lineups wants to win the title at the end of the year. And so, actually, if you have to sit behind for five hours, it might be frustrating. It might not look as, gr as good as being allowed to sit in front for five hours. But there's only one lap you need to lead. Dempsey Proton at the front of the field in GTE Am. So we've now got all the sevens at the front, 77 and 777. That is the back row of the entire grid that is now 1-2 in GTE Am. Third place is Alessio Rivera. He makes his first start here as he takes over the 83A of Corsa car. Ben Keating in fourth, six and a half seconds behind him. So a bit of a longer stop for 
the uh, TF Sport Four Horsemen car. Then Andrew Harianto, fifth for Dempsey Proton. Roberto Lacorte for Chetilar in sixth position ahead of the 98 Aston. Marcos Gomez, the Brazilian, has taken over from Paul Dallalana in that 98 car that Dallalana had the drive through penalty for. Well, somebody has been watching video of Alan McNish and his daughter dancing on the patio. I tell you what, <laughs> that's Ferdy Habsburg uh, limbering himself up, but he's he's got some dad dancing moves going on there, hasn't he? Eh? I tell you what, they look like pretty good moves to me. Look like aggressive, get in there and get on with it moves. As uh, he's about to take over, I suspect, from Robin Frins. There spoke to him just before. The actual race and uh, he was yeah he's enjoying this he was saying it's a very different car to get used to from what they were in testing but uh, managing to sort of now click in with the car and understand it a little bit better look at the very different look at this car from any Toyota that we've seen before now it is very very different if it was yeah, Graham you said it yesterday to Pascal Vassal if you painted it blue or or puce or, or orange or anything other than the colors of last year, everybody would be going, wow, what a different car that is. It was, however, six seconds short on fueling. It's gonna get a penalty. The first hour of season nine of the FIA World Endurance Championship is complete. The season starts here at Spa Francorchamps, and with the new race season starts a new category of racing. The top tier is now Hypercar, two Toyotas and an Alpine, the early adopters of the formula. In LMP2, a big field. Not all finding quite the room they needed into the first corner. Lock up from the Jota Sport car and the real team car. But there didn't seem to be too much damage. Phil Hansen briefly leading for United Autosports, getting by both Toyotas. Porsche leading the field in the pro class, as Ben Keating led in the AM class of early passes. D-Station coming from the back row of the grids. This new entry run by TF Sport for all Japanese crew and with them fellow back row starters after not setting a qualifying time. 77. Ferrari turning around the real team car. Got away with that. That was judged to be a racing incident. And then drama as well with the Alpine finally finding a way past Phil Hansen. Took the better part of half an hour for Alpine to gradually bed themselves in with a brand new car. After 10 laps of the race, leader Mike Conway was asked to move aside for Sebastian Buemi in the other Toyota, number eight taking the lead. Little bit of, of seven kilometers to play with and everybody always wants the same bit at the same time. Number 25 uh, G-Drive car there triggering contact. Matt Campbell in the 77 Dempsey Proton car finally getting past Ben Keating as Paul Dallalana battled with Roberto Lacorte. Lacorte getting spun around in the Cetela Ferrari. Juan Pablo Montoya, uh, it was the cue ball and Roman Rusin off the pinball as Ben Keating found himself punted off into a separate postcode. A drive through penalty for Montoya for that and a robust move past Antonio Garcia by Jimmy Bruni to move up to fourth in GTE Pro in the second Porsche. The GTE Pro leader, the 92 car driven to pole by Kevin Estra. LMP2 still being led by United Autosports' Phil Hansen and Toyota Gazoo Racing 1-2 in hypercar. Well, after snow two years ago and torrential rain last year, a beautiful start to the six hours of Spa. The G-Drive number 26 car, the team manager has been say, summoned to race control with extreme expedition immediately, please. So we haven't seen a penalty for Roman Rusinov, but there might be something still to be talked about there. You can see our class leaders, Dempsey Proton, at the moment in front. And pit exit of car 26, that's the G-Drive car under investigation. So possible unsafe release. I'm Martin Haven in the booth with me is Graham Goodwin and Alan McNish in the pit lane. Duncan Vincent and Louise Beckett and Alan. Opening hour of the season, 
It's been worth a six-hour wait so far, hasn't it? A six-month wait, I beg your pardon. Yeah, certainly they're uh, dusting off the cobwebs pretty quickly as they're going at it. We've seen some plenty sort of action. What the think the overriding thing for me is the gap uh, between the top three cars is seven seconds right now uh, between the Toyotas and also the Alpine. Uh, in LMP2, it's still as heated, but there's massive depth in that category as uh, Loic Duval straps himself into the TDS run operation there uh, to come back to the WEC. But it's been really, really frenetic all the way through. Real team they're making their way in this new category with 1-2 in LMP2. It's uh, these two, United Autosports leading, and uh, second place is Guido van der Garde Racing Team Netherlands. I would add, by the way, looking at the hypercar class, that uh, despite all the kind of travails and tribulations and whatever else has been thrown at the Alpine Elf Maverick squad, they're just six seconds back from second place now with what we believe may be a penalty hanging over one of the Toyotas. It's not been a bad start, has it? And actually lapping as quick as the Toyotas. Last lap for Andre Negrau, 2.066 for the leader, Sebastian Buemi, 2.067. And for Mike Conway in second place, 2.069. So very little to choose between them. As we saw, it took them a little while to light the blue touch paper for Andre Negrau. They wanted to get the race underway and get the, a little bit of a handle on the car. I think they're comfortable they've got a handle on it now. And in traffic here, Phil Hansen, the dark blue car with the red roof. That's the leader in LMP2. And Gerda van der Gaard, the familiar yellow and black, the Minardi colours of Racing Team Netherland in second place. And both cars, both teams, have been mighty impressive last season in LMP2. Not a surprise to see them at the front here again. I would say the one thing is there's a clear, in my view, a clear difference is that the United Autosport car is better after pit stops when it's on heavy fuel, whereas the racing team Netherlands seems to be better on lighter fuel loads later in the stints because uh, Guido sort of hangs on there, can't really do very much, and then he comes right back at Hansen towards the end of the stint. Now, right now, we are uh, well about halfway through the second stint, so we've got a little bit more to go, probably another 10 laps to go before they pop into the pits. Well, that's the way you'd want it, isn't it, as a driver, that you can pull away once you've been in a pit lane and the other guy's got to continually try and catch because it's much easier to have an advantage when you get to traffic. The further you can be in front, the more options you have. Geert van der Gaard here trying to get around. Is that the real team car? Yes, it is. Yeah, so Like again, the valve just out of the pits in that yeah, particular car. Down through Rouge and starting to climb through Radion along the Kemmel Strait. Just creeping up behind him. Loic with more fuel on board and fresh tyres, but straight out of the pit lane. He'll contest positions whenever he can, but right now, there was the run. Aston on Aston, Dempsey Proton has handed over the 77 car to Christian Reed, AF Courses, Alessio Rivera in second. Satoshi Hoshino took over the D-Station car that is now down to fourth, because yep. Ben Keating has just passed him for third place. Correct, change of position there between the two Aston Martins, the two TF Sports operated cars. The baby blue car off into... ALC Bratislava, who we reported heading into the pits at the end of the formation lap, have uh, accepted the inevitable. They cannot get the fuel cell out of the car, stop it leaking and back into the car, or they can't stop it leaking anyway. And they have given up that on the equal struggle. So their race debut, I'm afraid, will have to come next time out on the roller coaster at Portimao in mid-June. And they will need that to head into Le Mans in August. You don't want to go to Le Mans with no World Endurance Racing experience under your belt. Portimao for them will be an eight-hour test of proof. Toyota still 1-2. Mike Conway still sitting just six or seven tenths behind Sebastian Buemi. Buemi not getting away. And Conway, frankly, not bothering to close. I don't think he's just keeping pace with the leader, who is now through behind the Dempsey Proton car and Christian Reed, the GTE AM leader. And Alan, look how long it takes the top car, the leader, to get by the GT car. He just, I think, was doing it into Bruxelles. 25 is in. We mentioned damage on the left side pod. That's the driver's side. And it looked like steam was coming out. Obviously, the side pods are to contain the cooling radiators, oil and water cooling radiators. 
doesn't look like it's steaming particularly, which either means it wasn't too much of a problem or it's run out of water. Well, it's a big, it's a, still a big hole. So aerodynamically, I don't think the car was ever designed to have a hole there. <laughs> and at the same time as well, it is uh, aerodynamically, it's definitely negative. And so I cannot imagine it being positive. The question is, what is the least negative continue or to actually then change the side pod, which I presume is the negative is changing the side pod. Well, we might be able to find out actually, because we're going to get down to G drive. We'll hear from Esteban Garcia, who handed over the car to Loic Duval and he's with Louise Beckett. Esteban Garcia bringing in the number 70 from your first stint in Spa. I could see your reactions with Norman. Uh, how was that for you? There was damage on the back. The rear's been changed. What was that like? Yes, I can say that it was a very easy beginning, actually, for LMP2 in WEC. But anyway, it's always pleasure, you know, and we have to keep this in mind. And, uh, of course, uh, I can say that the pro are very aggressive, even in GT. So uh, it was uh, hard for me to, uh, to pass and uh, I have to, um, to, to concentrate myself also to not make any uh, mistake because, you know, the, the guys were kicking me, you know, in, the, in my back. So um, after that, uh, tire went flat and I had to stop. And uh, unfortunately, uh, it was uh, three uh, laps before uh, what uh, we, we had in mind. So it's just a shame anyway. But... Uh, um, you know, it's a uh, work, so that means uh, endurance, and that means also team spirit. I'm fortunately not alone, <laughs> and I love, I, I'm, uh, I'm sure that uh, Loic and Norman will do a fantastic job right now, and I have to jump again uh, for three laps only before the, the end of the, of the race. Right, OK, so anyway. you've done the majority of your driving, but you've just mentioned your other two drivers. You've got great support there with Norman Nato and Loic Duval, who's out in the car now. So how are they, how are they training you? And what are they, how are they guiding you through? So they have a lot to do to train me anyway. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we are doing it uh, with a lot of pleasure. We, we know each other better and better. Uh, they help me also. They give me really good advice, especially also Loic with his huge experience. Uh, Norman also. Uh, so all the time we are uh, uh, three together, but with the rest also of the, of the team. So very, very good uh, team spirit. Great. Thanks very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, the key area there is that we hadn't realized they had come in, been forced to come in a little early because of a puncture, and that means that he did not get to his minimum drive time, which he will have to complete. Otherwise, the car will serve a penalty, will be excluded. So he'll have to do three laps of stump stage. Meanwhile, Juan Montoya alongside Robert, uh, alongside. Oh, is that putting a lap on the G Drive car? Oh! I think there might be a little bit of a vendetta building here. That's the 26 car of Roman Rusinov. And that is one Pablo Montoya in 21. The white car from Dragon Speed goes by. Or is that Roberto Mary in 25? It's so hard to tell which of the G-Drive cars it is because they are identical livery. Uh, so... It's the one and without is that, the hole in the side. Yeah, it's yeah, hard it's to tell at this. It's no, it's 25, it's 25, OK. So it was Roberto Mary, but then again, Juan Montoya won't have known who it was. He's already had a biff off one orange and black car, so he was going back and uh, making sure he didn't get another one. Roberto Mary then in the 25 G-Drive car. And that car currently in 12th place in LMP2. Juan Montoya in the 8th place in P2. Pressed in the rise in Réunion. In theory, all four wheels, or no, you can't have all four wheels inside the apex curb. If you do, then that's a breach of track limits. And 25 with that number plate. Oh, more contact under braking. Now that is Rusinov, isn't it? That yeah. Was, that was the incident that's under investigation. Oh, no, now. that was the original incident. Yes, yes it yes, was. Yes. That's yeah, a yeah, replay. Yeah. I thought that was a replay of the other G-Drive car in another instance. So that's where the damage came on the side. And that's the 25 getting damage on the other side. And battle with Juan Pablo Montoya. So Montoya had Roberto Gonzalez in the Jota Sport car behind him. And now coming up behind is the race leader, Sebastian Buemi. 
And Roberto Mary, not a man in my experience who takes very kindly to being biffed for no reason when he's been entirely innocent. So, um, yeah, there may, may be a little bit of, of uh, Latin temperament coming in here. And Buemi, of course, is going to try and get by these two. Mary is going to dive. You knew he was going to dive. I knew he was going to dive. And suddenly, and Davidson, uh, Mike Conway rather, in second place is going, yep, I'm in here. Let's have a go. First Otis threads the needle between the two P2 cars. Good example here of how hard the cars are going to match up against quick LMP2s. Answer is it's not going to be easy. There he goes by safely without clipping the Dragon Speed car. And this is right under the nose of Pascal Vassalon, who's on the pit wall, right, almost right there at, at La Source. He's going, oh, oh. Another moment that you don't want to look at as a, as a team boss on the pit wall. And here comes the Alpine. He's the next to catch this little group. The dark green car with the red highlights. That is the Jota Sport car of Roberto Gonzalez, the Mexican driver. Up behind the white car with the blue highlights. That's the Dragon Speed Entry of Juan Montoya. And the next car in the race in LMP2 is Bicecar Visa. She's in 10th for Richard Mill. Yeah, mate. 10 more laps to go, 10 more laps to go. The Alpine is not far behind. 1.3 seconds now. Well, that was a message to Mike Conway of pictures of the car about which they were talking. That was Andre Negrau we were seeing in the Alpine. And as he said, 1.6 seconds behind Mike Conway. Conway is 1.4 seconds or 1.3 seconds behind the Toyota. So the top three, the hypercar class, covered by under four seconds despite all this traffic, or perhaps because of. Well, that's exactly the point we're making from the start of the race, is that traffic is going to play a much bigger part. Now you've got the Alpine struggling with the same traffic as the two Toyotas were, but uh, with the Toyotas not able to blast by, uh, with the power they've got available, it's going to close things up as the 21 moments to pit lane. Well, that's one down and one to go. And that makes it a lot easier for the Alpine because you don't have to worry about the car that you're closest to chinking out to go by the car that's further away. So Andre Negrau gets by the Jota Sport car of Roberto Gonzalez with no problems. And it's very encouraging for Negrau. Don't forget, you know, in the Rebellion, he spent a, a bit of time trying to chase Toyotas that just disappeared. The crowd never drove, drove uh, the No, I beg your pardon. Sorry. Uh, but the, this is the crowd's first yeah. time in, in a, a top-class top class car. Yes, you're right. So he's, but he's still, you know, they're, they're sniffing distance, not just in the dim and distant distance. Uh, Wanda Montoya is out. That's Henrik Hedman in. In comes Ooh. the LMP2 leader. Yep. And this is Phil Hansen. Expect to see. Racing Team Nederland behind as well. They do. When we get the shot of the pit lane, they will stop together. Don't forget, they turn the car around fast at the gap this time, 1.8. United will be very fired up not to be beaten on pit road. Now, Phil Hansen climbs out of the car. Ah, they're inserting the Albuquerque. Indeed they are. Now, is there a driver change? Now, I would, if, if yep. I were in the position, I'd be putting Fritz van Aert in now in Racing Team Nederland. Now, if that's the, the weather is good, yep. they're in second place, put Fritz in, there's a big gap back to WRT in third. OK, you've got Frins, Van Dorn, all the other guys, let them go, let them go. Get Fritz in the car now, this is the time to put him in. Now, that, for me, is a surprise from United. I would have expected Fabio Scherer at this point, but clearly, they're looking to do what they can. There's a driver change there. Habsburg, Habsburg's yeah. going in. Robin Frins jumping out from third place. Let's hope that all Ferdi's boxing exercises haven't uh, tightened up his forearms. Managed by Jamie Campbell-Walter. And out goes the racing team Nederland car. That will take the lead, for now at least, of... Yeah, Fritz van Ed is in the car, so... I, I, I think that's absolutely the right time to put him in. Four seconds, they were quicker in the pit wow. stop than United. Now, if we remember back before when Guido van der Garde came in, he came in about four seconds behind and he left directly behind United. So twice now, TDS have been four seconds faster in the pit stop than the United car. So if you take five of those, that's 20 seconds over the course of the race. 
Ferdy Habsburg with fresh tyres and a full tank. Off he goes. Oh, there was a wheel nut rolling away there, or a bit of rubber debris or something. So this is the battle now. Philippe Albuquerque up behind Fritz van Ed. Fritz is the boss of Jumbo Supermarkets, a hyper enthusiast and actually a pretty decent peddler, as it turned out last year in this car. And he will do everything he can to hold off the United car, but on cold tyres, Albuquerque oh. sees the moment. Fritz just a little deep down the hill there, and through goes Felipe immediately. Yeah, no, cold tyres, well, certainly they come out of the blankets and straight on, but not up to optimum pressures, that's for sure. But uh, WRT also, they were slower than even United, so they did a 120 pit stop, United 170, Team, but the racing team Netherlands, this car, 113. And so the TDS run racing team Netherlands is blasting it in the pits. Right now, got uh, their amateur driver in there, so they're definitely going to drop back. But as it rolls out, they've got, I think, Nick de Vries coming up later on, and he's been pretty quick in the car before. No, no they've not. No, so they haven't, you're right. Sean Bonuta. <laughs> uh, they made the same mistake earlier this week. Sophia so Flersch going in in place of Bites Kavissa in the number one car. This is the Richard Mill racing team, all-female crewed car. So, Philippe Albuquerque and Fritz van Ayr taking over the first and second cars. Ferdy Habsburg, Dennis Anderson in at high class, the all-Danish crude entry. Bites brought the Richard Mille car in. Pat Kelly brought in the PR1 motorsports car as well. Jota are in with Stoffel van Dorn. G-Drive with Roman Rusinov. Alex Brundle in from third with into Europol. Great to see, by the way, not just some of the new big-name drivers into LMP2. The uh, stars in reasonably priced cars, as Martin Haven has been saying all week, <laughs> a lot. Uh, but I'm, also, I'm making that a catchphrase now. Also Nobody had, else is using it. <laughs> also, we've had Esteban Garcia. We've already spoke to in pit lane. Dennis Anderson stepping in now yep. into WEC. The gentleman drivers coming up through that pyramid uh, from LMS and now into the WEC and looking forward very many of them to their first opportunity to race at the moment 24 hours. There's a lot of good stuff to come. Well, quite a number of them will have started in Michelin Le Mans Cup, so they oh, yeah. may even have had road to Le Mans experience, then ELMS, then World Endurance. But you're, but you're absolutely right. It's that pyramid, isn't it? You know, it, it encourages ambition in drivers, in engineers, in teams. One of the Jota cars out of the pits, one of the Jota cars into the pits. So uh, 28 is out and running with Sean Galeal yep. at the wheel, the 38 on pit road with Roberto Gonzalez. And Sean Galeal predominantly explains the colour scheme change here because he's responsible for KFC, not, uh, and not globally, but on the car, and Coca-Cola as well. So. And Taco Bell. And Taco Bell. Yes. Kiss to Taco Bell. It's on the front of the car. Very good. Uh, so, yeah, so Sean Galeal has had a, a junior single-seater career right up to F2, and now uh, racing strongly for the first time in the World Endurance Championship, but in prototypes raced in uh, the Asian Le Mans series as well. So he's got a little bit of experience under his belt of the LMP2 cars. And here is the third-place car in the race, Andre Negrau. Now, they stopped just shy of where the Toyotas could stop earlier on in the first stint and we expect that may well happen again but look at the way the gaps have come down down from three to 1.8 seconds the grow is closing on mike conway well robin freens is no longer in the wrt car but he is in the garage with the microphone robin friends coming in from the wrt uh, how was it it seemed like from the team radio you enjoyed it Oh, definitely enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, we had good fun. Uh, also fighting with Stoffel. I mean, I know Stoffel for, for many years now, so uh, it was good fun out there. I, f I felt pretty strong in the car, so it makes it even more fun. Um, just a bit struggling on, on top speed because I couldn't really overtake the cars in front. But in the corners, the car feels good. And we're moving our way forward. I think we are P3 now, or we are just on a, on a podium position, which uh, is definitely the target for today. Uh, I heard also on team radio there was some water in the cockpit. Do you know what that was? Uh, I don't know. It started to leaking. Um, I don't drink. I don't have the water tube uh, while driving because I just never use it. Um, so maybe that's why it was a bit leaking. Uh, so my right side is a bit wet, but it's not sweaty. It's just water. Uh, but everything seems to be okay. So uh, Ferdinand is using the water, so hopefully that doesn't have that issue. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, Robin Freens certainly had a very entertaining first stint. As he said, got himself up into third place, got the team up into third place. And Ferdy Habsburg, 32 seconds behind the lead duo. In fact, Felipe Albuquerque now nine seconds ahead of Fritz Van Aert. Third place then in LMP2 for Team WRT. Just saw the pit stop there for Jota, handing over the car, uh, or taking over the car, Antonio Felix da Costa, the reigning Formula E champion. Nico Lapierre takes over at Alpine Elf Matmut. I uh, should say, by the way, that was an excellent couple of stints from Andre de Grau, his yep. first uh, time in the uh, top class. Learning as they go, they've had only four days of testing before this week with that package. And it is a mighty ste step up, whatever people might think from an LMP2. Uh, they're learning all the time. That's, I think that bodes well for the season. Now, we talked about graduates up the ladder. Sixth place, Alex Brundle brought in the inter Europol competition car, the yellow and green machine, into the pit lane. Kubis Mikowski has taken over the Polish driver who's been with inter Europol right from the start, from V to V through uh, Michelin Le Mans Cup, through European Le Mans Series, and now into the World Championship. So it's his first drive in the FIA World Endurance Championship with a full season entry. Oh, big wobble there for the number 77 car. That's the leader in GTE, um, or was, was, because AF Corsa's Alessio Rivera has now taken over the lead from Christian Reed, who had more than a big wobble uh, on the way out to qualify in the 77 Dempsey Proton car. Almost destroyed it in a big shunt here. Got a big weave on in the middle of Eau Rouge, as you saw there. And by the time he crested the rise at Renion, was facing backwards at unabated speed. Let's hear from Mike Conway in the 7 Toyota. Yeah, Mike, five more laps to go. Five more laps to go before driver change. It's quite a big difference to the Alpine, though, who has uh, done 21 and 22 lap stints. As Conway told, five more laps, so they're going to be coming in probably around about 40, lap 48, 49. Oh, wow. <laughs> they almost collected the P2 car ahead as well. Yep. That's uh, dropped the seven back just a little. That means he's got to re-pass the Corvette now, and... Yo! Yeah. That's an interesting little incident, isn't it? Well, that's partly due to the fact that now he's coming to the end of the stint. The rubber will have come off the tyre. He was in behind the other car, uh, and so aero-wise wouldn't be quite as good on braking efficiency. And uh, as well, just the different way that they're recuperating energy on that car with a new car. Well, let's catch up with... Racing Team Lelands, Fritz van Aert is in the car in second place, which is where it was handed over by Gerdo van der Gaard. Guido van der Gaard putting in a great effort for Racing Team Netherlands. Uh, but the main thing I want to speak to you about is pit stops. I've actually seen your team here just timing and uh, watching a recording of the pit stop. And clearly, you're saving time there. Yeah, I think uh, the guys, they work quite hard on it uh, during the winter. And I think that was one thing that we had to improve from last year. Uh, and the crew did a, b a really, really good job. I think uh, the car getting better and better during the run. The beginning was struggling a little bit. To say Phil Hansen and United, they were strong all weekend. We pulled quite a big gap, and on the end, uh, I could come back. And yeah, it was nice that we were leading for a couple of laps. But Fritz now in the car. We are leading the, the Pro Am series, which is the most important. So we'll see where we end up today. Is that the key? You've got to find other ways of where you can make up that time when they have performed so strong so far. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know. Um, we still have a gentleman in the car, uh, and uh, between the gentleman and the silver driver, yeah. it's always hard. This is like a big gap, but uh, yeah, we try to fight hard. We try to win on all several points, like pit stops or fueling or whatever. So uh, yeah, so far so good. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, they've had nearly six months since the last race in Bahrain, and that's a lot of pit stop practice. And whether however much they put in, they have certainly earned their keep with it. It's been very impressive stuff in the pits. Here's the Dempsey Proton and AF Corsa battle. So the 88 Dempsey Proton car, this is the second car being driven by Indonesian Andrew Harianto and Francesco Castellacci in the 54 car. Francesco spent a lot of time with this crew, and it's a, it's a well-knit operation. Let's see if he can find a way to go past. This is the battle for sixth position. Leading in 
the class. 83, the air, of course, a car. Alessio Rivera joins the crew from last year that won the title. Christian Reed second for Dempsey Proton. Ben Keating third in the TF Sport, the Four Horsemen Aston. Satoshi Hoshino in fourth place. He's taken over the D Station Aston. And Marcos Gomez back up to fifth in the 98 Aston that started on pole and then slipped way down the order. And Paul Dallalana was struggling to keep it on track. Great hypermotion view there of our GTE AM leader. Uh, Martin, we've got a fastest lap of the race uh, under 205 for the very first time, and it's gone not to Toyota, but to Nico Lapierre, uh, recently aboard the number 36 Alpine Elf Matmut car. Now, is that a mark of what we've got to come here? Of course, there is a difference in this pit stop cycle between the, the uh, two hypercar teams. Yeah, but he was only three, he's only got three laps less fuel. And I and I think, you know, as you said, Andre Negrau was not going to really, really rag the car from the start, not least because the team hadn't given him 100% of everything, but also because it's first ever stints in P2. Nico Lapierre, he'll get in and oh, yeah. he'll just give it the beans because that's what he's used to. On full tanks. Yeah. Just had a message in from the pit lane from Louise beckett -Al. What was that? But uh, we've got Porsches in with Jimmy Bruni, and that's going to be a driver change as well. That's uh, the pit stop for the 91 Porsche. And Jimmy Bruni jumped in at the previous stop. We saw him getting his elbows out and uh, barging his way through. And the, but now it's... So they're going to change their strategy and the flick it around there. Decision number 32 gives a drive-through penalty on car 25 for causing a collision with car 60. Drive-through penalty, car 25, for causing a collision with car 60. That's from very much earlier in the race, Martin. And, and fans often go, well, that, that was an hour ago. It was over an hour ago. It was, you know, nearly an hour and 20 minutes ago. Why is it taking them so long? We saw that happen, you know, a tea break and, and lunch ago. Well, the deal is you review the video, you look at the data from the cars, and then you get the drivers and all the teams in to give their view of it because a penalty in a race this tight is a very big decision to make. And you, you've got to be certain that you are penalizing somebody either for carelessness or malice or forethought, and not because it was somebody else being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So Richard Leitz in the pit lane for the 91 Porsche team. And uh, Louise, I think, has got some information down there, Martin. Let's see, uh, Lou, what have you got for us? Yeah, well, I did think that was very early for the 91 to come in, so I just want to ask the team, and there was a problem with the right rear tyre, and that's why they came in and did the full change. Was it a puncture, Louise? Do you know? I will find out. I couldn't see, but then, you know, maybe I wouldn't have been able to. Let me find out and get back to you. Yeah, the important thing is there, if it's a problem, then they've only got four and a half sets. Now, yeah, you think one tyre out of it. However, the strategy for the race is to use four and a half sets, and it's not to keep a couple just in case. So it will definitely compromise that car. And with five cars, uh, it's a loss of tyre pressure, Louise is saying, so it could be a slow puncture, it could be a valve, could be something else. But whichever way, it is certainly not optimum for them because that tyre will then come out of their strategy for the rest of this race. And it's dropped them down, sorry, uh, uh, Graham, it's dropped them down to sixth in the total category, fifth for Pro, but actually with the lead AM car being ahead of them now. But in fact, if they were only three laps on that tyre, then it may well be used again if it hasn't got a puncture, if it was just a valve problem or something like that. Let's hear from Nico Lapierre and the Alpine team. Toyota, 8.5, 8 8.0. Ça va le faire, ça va le faire. Toyota, weak point 5, weak point 0. So the Toyota is in 2085, 280. You're doing a 6.1. Yeah, but you, the car in front is slower, do you understand? No, but what they're saying is he's going to jump them at the pit stops. Yes. yes. With this performance, yeah. then Nicolas Lapierre, when the two Toyotas come into the pits, and they won't come in on the same lap, I do not expect, because they didn't on the previous, yeah. but with this performance delta, he will go into the lead of the race by the time the Toyotas come out. So we expect in a couple of, uh, a couple of laps yeah. then Toyota to start doing their pit stops. But he is currently 59.2 seconds behind the leader,
and it is a one minute pit stop minimum for each of the Toyotas. So, yeah, it's from where he is now. a significant advantage, is yeah. a straight answer. The point I was going to make, by the way, about that uh, uh, Porsche, remember that was the car that uh, we had Lou talking to Richard Leitz, changed lefts only uh, yeah. at the first stop. Yeah. So they are. Hold their tyres on the right hand side. Yeah, so so they were due to go anyway, so they're probably out of the thing. So so the new tyre has done three laps more than you might have expected. Now the other thing of course that is going to help Nico Lapierre is that the number eight car will actually stay in the pits for the 35 seconds of fuel that it's supposed to have had the first time round. I'd like to think so. You would like to think so. Uh, still no news on that. First race of the 2021 FIA World Endurance Championship. Battle in LMP between Jota's Antonio Felix da Costa, seasoned single-seater sports car and GT racer and reigning Formula E champion, and young Polish star Kuba Szmikowski for Inter Europol. Both of them are gold rated. Of the two, Antonio with a lot more experience in a lot more things, but had to dive bomb here, Alan McNish, to make a good, clean pass to move up into ninth place overall and sixth in LMP2. Yeah, Jota making their way back through the field a little bit as we see the second place Toyota following the first place Toyota, still Bohemi being shadowed by Mike Conway as they come down into the bus stop chicane. Expect a Toyota pit stop as uh, there we see Jose Maria Lopez just getting prepared to jump in. Pichito and the first of the cars is in, that's Conway, who in second coming in and uh, Buemi continues on for one more lap and so we've got the first one this will be interesting because this is going to be in about a minute's time where we see where Lapierre is after this stop yeah Lapierre is 56 seconds behind it's a 22 second pit stop delta which means from in to out at speed limit that's how long that takes plus they must fuel for 35 seconds so it's a minimum of 57 seconds and that's before you change tires the driver change you can do while you're fueling you can see the team man in here to help and they are going to strap in jose maria lopez it was Kamui Kobayashi that set the first ever hypercar pole so a hypercar record here at spa francorchamps and they're not yet leaping in with tires but here comes the alpine he gets a good car, quick run, goes by the AF Corsa Ferrari. That is our GTE AM leader, and he is now up into second place overall. That will be reflected at the next timing sector because the Toyota is... Oh, they got a box of bits out, and they're twiddling a thing. That is some kind of pressurised... Yeah, it's charging it's a the system. Toppy up oil like... thing, presumably. Yep. This is going to be a significant advantage, isn't it, to Nico Lapierre? No, oh, it's huge. Lapierre's already on the way up to Le Comte. Now, Toyota was six seconds shy of the 35 that they have to have the fuel hose connected for for the first stop in the eight car. 25 seconds slower stop than the previous one. Ooh. It's a huge, huge drop. Tires, one minute though, 30. With tyres this time, though. Yeah, yeah but still, tyres are not there. So they drop probably 10, 11 seconds. But now the advantage that the senior tech team have is that although this car this year is called an Alpine Elf Matmut, it is fundamentally the rebellion that has raced for the last couple of years in LMP1. Now it's new to them, they don't know its ins and out, they don't know its intricacies but it is a reliable race car. And quick. It does, and it doesn't have new car problems. Whereas the two Toyotas may, because this is their first race, these two new hypercars. The race leader is in. Driver change here as well. Boemi so, out, Hartley in. So, like the new chrome dome on Brendan's uh, helmet. That, a lot of chrome on this year's livery. 
And again, two team members in there to help out. While you're fueling, you can do safety and driver change. So safety includes cleaning the windscreen. You can also measure tire and brake temps. Here comes the Alpine onto the start-finish straight as we watch the pit stop for the number eight. Crosses the line now. And this will be a very significant lead at this stage. Well, we're nearly at a third distance. We're an hour and 48 minutes in, so another 12 minutes will be at the two-hour mark. And despite their pace, Toyota have not been able to capitalise. The question is now, very quickly, with the strategy laptop, Alpine are running shorter stints. They'll need an extra stop. OK. So that's but the game can... now. The game now is to build a lead that means that it counts that out. Toyota still at the box. We are P1. P1. You can Good hear job. the joy. <laughs> I half expected La Marseillaise at that point. Anyway, I, I almost hummed it as the car came across the line, actually. But, but you know, for, for a Great. team in their first race in a brand new category, it's very encouraging. Yes, it's a, it's a proven machine, but they don't know the running of it and they don't know the setting up of it. And that was clear in prologue and in qualifying and free practice. But for Toyota, it's an all-new car. 92 Porsche team, let's hear from our GT Pro leaders. So, punch your right rear box, box. Ooh, Oh, both so cars. 91 had a uh, problem right rear, and now the 92, the lead car, Kevin Estra, is leading by 14 seconds into the pitch. Right rear issue as well. I do not believe in coincidences. Two right rear issues on a Porsche suggest common problem. Well, and yeah, you can go back. Two contacts between the 21 Dragon Speed car and G-Drive. <laughs> that suggests a problem as well, but you're right. It's something that they're doing. It's a curb that they're riding somewhere. Yeah, it could also be the or inner edge camber. going up through Eau Rouge. Yeah. And that inner edge on the right rear takes a lot of heat and temperature, and it yeah. could be something there. There's many, many things it could be going. Uh, it's best we don't sort of, sort of speculate guess. on it but uh, it seems to be, I would say, consistent. Well, here's a first. Neil Jarni, his first race drive in a GT Porsche. As he told us yesterday, or day before yesterday now, you know, he spent so long running in cars at the front, he does not remember to check the mirrors. And he said, you know, there, I'm still trying to pass stuff and there's lots of quick stuff whistling past me. He said, it's a very different world out there. And when you're in a prototype, you're following a, a GT car going, where's this guy going? What's he doing? He said, now I know the answer is you're trying desperately to keep the car on the track while not getting hit by a prototype. So he's now discovering all the things that prototype drivers don't necessarily know about hauling a GT car around. But Neil Jarni begins his GT program, and of course this is a build-up to when Porsche come into uh, the hypercar category, the top tier of sports car racing. They've announced will be from 2023 onwards. Audi will join them, and Graham Ferrari will join them in the top tier of sports cars. That's the first time in 25 plus years. Absolutely, and uh, before that, of course, Peugeot yep. uh, will be along next year for a bit of a go at this. It's already bubbling up quite nicely with the three cars, Alan. Yep. And a lot of other manufacturers expressing a lot of interest because essentially... Oh, there's more to come. There's you can a lot build, more to come. Do you want to build a road-style car? You can. Do you want to build a prototype? You can. Do you want a hybrid? You can. Do you not want a hybrid? That's fine, don't have hybrid. It's a very open church. Well, let's hear from United Autosports. Catch up with Phil Hansen and Louise Beckett. Phil Hansen, you've come in from the United 22. What a great performance you put in there. Yeah, it was good. Um, obviously, the plan was to, to hold position and as we were on pole at the start. Um, tried to make as big a gap as we could, but it was tricky with the tight neck, um, catching traffic at all the wrong moments, it seemed. But yeah, same for everyone. Did you try and, and battle it out with the uh, Racing Team Netherlands? I don't think he ever really got close enough. Obviously, <laughs> the um, the first lap he was very close. He got held up a bit through a roost by the Porsche uh, Toyotas, um, which wasn't ideal. But yeah, he never really quite got close enough in the in the rest of the first stint and the second stint. We can see that those teams are trying any other way they can to get closer to you. So pit stops may be where they can save some time or gain back some time. What can you do to uh, fight back from that? Yeah, uh, we, we need to understand why their first pit stop was so quick. Um, I, I, 
doubt they were doing anything to try and, you know, fill three seconds less fuel unless they have some, some crazy fuel saving strategy, which I, I highly doubt. Um, yeah, we need to find out why we lost so much time in that first stop. But ultimately, you know, they've got an AM in the car, so that's not the car we're really fighting. Um, the most important thing was just to stay out in front and stay out of trouble in the early, early parts of the race. OK, thank you. No worries. And Corvette, Bonnie Gavin getting in. So Antonio Garcia brought the car in from fourth place in the GT Pro class because that 91 Porsche puncture has dropped it back down to fifth again. And Oli Gavin announced at the beginning of the weekend this will be his last race as a pro race driver. He's already started other careers, began his commentary career with Graham Goodwin in uh, the Asian Le Mans series encounters in the, uh, at the end of the winter and has also established his own driving school. So if you think the new Corvette road car looks and sounds fantastic, you need to have a quick word and, and check out the Oliver Gavin Driving Academy because he will show you just how sensational a road car really can be in good hands. I'm going to do something a little bit out of kilter here, and it's um, we've not got fans here. And this is, for me, it's a significant moment. Yeah. Ollie's been such an ambassador of the sport. It would be very nice when he got out of the car and eventually checked into social media. If some of you guys out there have enjoyed uh, watching his wins through the years, uh, showed a bit of appreciation. At Oliver Gavin, hashtag 6 spa show him that you've really enjoyed the last 25 years of achievement from Oliver oh. Gavin. What an ambassador yeah. for the sport he's been. He, he has been and he remains an ambassador for Corvette. Little position change there. Nick de Vries dive bombs Sean Galeel to move up to third place in the 26 G-Drive car. One thing about G-Drive, they are never short on driving talent to accompany Roman Rusinov. Roman himself, very decent uh, prototype peddler. Racing Team Netherlands, Fritz van Aert with the two going around the outside. And that was Galeel followed by de Vries. So Fritz just getting there onto the dirty part of Piff Paff and losing a bit of ground. The deal for the gentleman drivers is to lose as little time as possible. And that's what it's about. Keep your speed up as much as you can. And if that means letting the hot shoes and the ex Grand Prix drivers and the pro cars go by, let them go. It's about the long game. And Fritz has been very good at playing that. He's put in some good, solid stints. And he always brings the car. Oh, see, I, now I shouldn't have said no. that sentence, should I? No. He's been very good at that. By the way... I should say, by the way, there's a very good point, because when there was the incident for the uh, the jumbo car at the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona, I think I'm right. Is that their second or third ever um, retirement from a the race? And they've been very strong. Uh, fastest first sector of the race for Jose Maria Lopez. Uh, uh, in the number seven car. Fastest of all for Brendan Hartley in the first sector on the last lap. So the two Toyotas now really starting to motor. Aha, unsafe release. Five seconds added to the next pit stop of car 26. Blocking yep. car one, that's the uh, Richard Mill Racing Team car, which is currently still in 10th place with Sophia Flersch in LMP2. But it's car 26 that is actually getting yeah. the penalty, which is Nick de Vries, which is in third place. We just saw him taking that third place from Sean Galeel in the Jota car. And so they're going to have five seconds. Next time they come into the pits, basically, they'll have to wait for five seconds before they can do any work to the car. Am-class battle here. This is the Dempsey Proton car of Christian Reed and Ben Keating in the TF Sport Aston Martin. Very differing results of their qualifying sessions. A very badly damaged 77 car and a shaken Christian Reed as he went off on uh, a warming up lap. Ben Keating ended up with pole position in the TF Sport Aston. This is the battle for second. Alessio Rivera in the AF course at 83 Ferrari. That is currently our leader in the GTE Pro class. Alessio Rivera, the Italian, a silver ranked driver. So Ben Keating and Christian Reed. Well, Alessio with success last season in the Italian GT endurance. Uh, challenge and uh, part of this worldwide network of let's find someone quick that no one's heard of yet. <laughs> but uh, we've had a few of those and they've moved on to significant careers in endurance sport. Here we go. Is uh, neat and tidy through there. One of two Alessios in the race. One who is Italian and Alessio Piccariello, who is Belgian, who, who the least Belgian sounding name, but there you go. 
and uh, will race at Le Mans this year with the Absolute Racing crew. They're uh, assisting the 88 Dempsey Proton effort this weekend. Are we expecting AM class pit stops at the moment? Because D station are in. Satoshi Hoshino yep. is the in the therefore. pits. Yep. Yep. Four hours and two minutes of the race remaining. And real team racing also in the pits with Loic Duval, but they are out of kilter. Fritz van Eyde in fifth place for Racing Team Netherlands, the yellow and black car. That's also the car that's leading in the Pro-Am challenge. So there'll be a separate trophy for Pro-Ams if they're not on the overall podium. And a little run out wide there for the 98 Aston Martin of Marcos Gomez. Discovering the gravel trap. He's not the first as he runs over somebody else's bit of debris there as well. But you see, if you run out wide, the tire drops off there. The, that outside edge of the gravel is not smooth. Here's the 60 car. Remember, this was the car involved in that side-to-side -side contact with the 25. Did notice the right-hand mirror was knocked off the Ferrari in that moment. What if they might change the door at some point? No, they, they've clearly fixed it in the previous pit stop. Whoa! Drifted in. Yeah. Uh, we're on a two-pot strategy here in the booth. Uh, it is tea time and courtesy of the lovely Fiona Miller. We have two brand-new teapots. So we are on a two-stop strategy. 52 is in, here we go. This is Miguel Molina coming in from second place. It's a 1-2 in GT Pro for Ferrari. 51 stays out with Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And as ever, James Collado's probably not even left the hotel yet, knowing that Alessandro was starting. He wouldn't be needed for at least three hours of the race. So Ferrari 1-2, Neil Jani in third in the 92 Porsche that was the leader before it too picked up a puncture. There he is. So all three hypercars have led this race now. Uh, I think, other than the pit stops, only the 22 United Autosports car has led in LMP2. And uh, we've had Porsche and Ferrari lead in GT Pro. But, uh, Porsche, Ferrari and Aston Martin have led in GTM. 52 car off the jacks and away. Now, Alan, the pit stop times for Toyota, the last stop. Yes. How significantly different were they? OK, so the, if we take it from the leader, Alpine, uh, they did a 1.12.3 pit stop, total pit stop time. Toyota number seven, which is in second with Jose Maria Lopez, 130.3. And then Toyota number eight is a 146.6. So effectively, they've lost uh, 15 or 18 and uh, 34 seconds in the pits. So... In the last stop alone. Yeah. Toyota's... Oh, that's a G-Drive car Whoa! off. It just brushes the but barrier. which one? Is it 25 or 26? Gets away with that. And so is that the Jota Sport car of Sean Galeo? So is that Nick de Vries who's been dead? It was. Quick Nick Rallycross star. So has the number eight Toyota served a 30 second penalty, a 30 second hold in the pits, or has it still got to serve a 30 second hold? I'm assuming since it's 15 seconds behind the number seven car, it can't have served a 30 second stop. Well, let's get down to the pit lane with Louise Beckett and hear from Mike Conway. He started this new era from pole for Toyota Gazoo Racing. Mike Conway from the number seven. Uh, the, the biggest question we have is that, that swap over between the seven and eight. Um, do you know the reason why that was, the team called that? Uh, yeah, I don't know, I thought it was a bit early, but um, yeah, they just wanted to see the pace of the other car. Uh, I think at the end we were quite similar throughout the, the two stints, so it didn't change too much. Um, but yeah, in the end, it was just management of the tyres, really. Um, we're quite hard on the tyres, so we knew the second stint would be pretty crucial to, to keep them alive, you know. So first stint, just kind of taking it pretty easy and uh, just make sure we have some at the end. And uh, we did, but still on the limit. So uh, as you can tell, the LMP2s were all over us when they came out on, on good tyres. So yeah, they really kill us in the second sector when we have not much left on the tyres. So. But, you know, we do what we can do. And, um, yeah, the Alpine were right there as well. Um, they were keeping us honest the whole way. And catching us 
at, actually at the end there. So um, I expect a good race. Yeah. Uh, first racing outing for the new car, for the hypercar. Uh, yeah. Was it as you expected, or are you still, do you still feel like you're learning stuff? I think we're, we're learning for sure. Um, just getting mileage at new tracks is always good for us to, to understand the car a bit better. And um, yeah, we had a lot of issues at the beginning of the week, so um, just to get some good smooth running in is the goal, really. Um, but yeah, we're fighting out there, which is good. We've had a good call, so that's kind of what we wanted in the end. Have you been working hard in the office? It sounds like it, in the cockpit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I don't look too sweaty, but um, yeah, the car's not so easy when the tyres go off pretty bad, but um, yeah, that's what it's all about. OK, thank you. All right, thanks a lot. And uh, there's Conway's car with Jose Maria Lopez as it drops down in second place. 24 seconds now, though, behind the leading Alpine with Nicola Lapierre at the wheel. And the important thing for me there, Graham, was when he was talking about the tyres going off and how difficult the car was. We've got to remember that the complete way of driving has changed uh, with the way the boost strategy is now. They don't have that huge... And Jose Maria Lopez going wide there, just locked up a little bit and, and uh, ran a bit wide in the chicane. So clearly when the, the best performance of the tyre does drop off, they're right on the edge of the working windows. It looks like they don't have the security into it that they had before. And that's going to be something they'll learn about in racing conditions because, of course, it's very different from testing when you've got traffic and everything else to come into this. Incident involving car 777 and 26 under investigation. That, I presume, Martin, was the incident we saw the G-Drive car going across the gravel. Drivers left. G-Drive again. Yep. 25 and 26. You know, we talked about this earlier. There's only one rule in endurance racing. Don't hit anything and stay out of the pits. All right, two. But they, they have hit everything. Both cars have hit things. Now, we didn't see anything on the screens, but we've heard from Toyota that that last stop for the brake car, they did serve a 30-second hold, which we can only presume is for the short fueling uh, of the car. We uh, talked about that a little while ago. The, the actual not uh, holding the car with the Correct. 35 minimum refueling time, where Sebastian Buemi at the first pit stop of the race actually sort of hesitated, went, and then had to stop, and then went again. So effectively, he did the total time, but he's also got a 30-second hold as well, so Absolutely. he's been double penalised in a way. However, that's a new regulation they had to get around, didn't get around it, and right now they, that particular car is 38 seconds off the lead as Lopez is starting just to creep back in to the lead of Nicolas Lapierre as well. Yeah, 205s and 206s we've been seeing from the Toyotas, 206s and 207s, I think, are right from Nicolas Lapierre in the recent running as we've got the Corvette now with Oli Gavin looking to get by the... 77 Dempsey Proton car and with the Northwest AMR the 98 car tucked in behind looking to take advantage of that yeah you've got to use the the openings that somebody else creates haven't you and that's exactly what you saw from Paul Dallalana he's at the wheel of the 98 Northwest AMR machine up behind Christian Reed so two leading lights in the field I mean Dallalana puts the 98 program together. Christian Reed very much puts the 77 and 88 Dempsey Proton programs together because, of course, you know, he owns the team. Father Gerald is here. His son is here as well, who's beginning his racing career. You know, is there is there a handstuck moment where Gerald will make a comeback and get all three of them in the car? Reed, 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 because obviously that'll be a, a joy for all commentators. I, I think Pe uh, it would be great to see it, wouldn't it? It would be uh, fun. Has, it would be fun. Has not dri driven for a little wee while, but. Uh, you know, I think at the Ilames Paddock uh, in Barcelona spotted Christian having a good chat with the Pacini brothers, and that, he tells me, is about uh, potential F4 plans for his young son. So it's coming. I tell you what, if, if he's uh, getting into the Spanish F4 championship that's had three support races, <laughs> behind, of course, is Francois Perrotta, who leads the race. It's Ferrari 1-2 at the moment, TF Sport in third, with Dylan Pereira in the 33 car in AM. And looking here at this battle again between Jota and G-Drive, and this is Sean Galaire the recovering Nick de Vries, and in front, oh no, Tom Ferrier's heart sinks again <laughs> because it's the pale blue car. <laughs> the magnet, as I think we'll call yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely right. The car that got clattered off earlier in a, uh, a G-Drive and 
dragon speed encounter. Sean Gallel gets by with no dramas this time. Great stuff, and in the slipstream there, the G-Drive car goes to the outside. Gallel defends there and will successfully defend through the goal. 26 receives a black and white flag for contact with 777, presumably because the D-Station car stayed on and Nick de Vries did not. A little replay here. Is that going to be a change of position? Yeah, encumbered by the passing Toyota and well read there by still Marcus Gomez in the Aston Martin. No, it's Paul Dallalana's yeah, back Paul, Paul Dallalana's back in now, yes. Um, Thomas Floor has taken over the 54A, of course, of Ferrari that came in from second place. So Floor at the wheel of that car, which is, is that one of the unchanged, I think unchanged melodies, same drivers, same year on year I think and, and the, the same car one. and the same car because obviously the livery and the driver squad remains the same at Toyota Gazoo Racing but the car is just, just a 100% different, different. <laughs> yes and that you know we heard Mike say that you know it is road relevant is the key word for Toyota with hypercar it's leading the design of new hypercar Toyota direction. They're using a very much more road production based hybrid system, which is different from the pure racing one they had. And heavier, by Less way. powerful and heavier. Yeah. The car is heavier, it's harder work on its tires. It's got less aero than a P1 car. And so in a lot of ways, it is a much harder car to wrestle around according to its designers and according to the drivers. Alan McNish is giving me that look. <laughs> um, one other quick point before we move on to whatever else is happening on track here. We did say at the start of the race, didn't we, that the hypercar teams could not afford to be anything other than fault-free. We're seeing what that, the effect of that in that the Toyotas are not leading this race. We're also seeing that are still on the lead lap. Yep. One minute and 14 seconds behind the Alpine is the top LMP2 car of Felipe Albuquerque. And to put that into perspective, he's 39 seconds behind Brendan Hartley, who is 35 seconds behind the Alpine, and Hartley's in third. So there's a the similar gap between first and third in hypercar as there is between the lead LMP2 car and the third-placed hypercar Toyota. So there was a little ripple of applause as uh, we saw the replay of... Nick de Vries getting by Sean Gallel back up to third place for the 26 G Drive car. And actually, this has sort of been the format of so many of their ELMS races here, Graham, where they've been up and down the order like the Assyrian Empire. Uh, that, uh, the, uh, yes, of course. Uh, Nick de Vries would expect to be pretty stellar in this. He was astonishing in the Racing Team Netherlands effort last year. Also going well at the moment for the Jota cars. They've been just, just creeping up the order throughout. Uh, leader is in in LMP2. Philip Albuquerque took over the car after a double opening stint from Phil Hansen, and that car is now in the pits. Here he is, number 22 from United Autosports. So this will trigger our next round of pit stops. Car 92 under investigation for its pit stop. That is our GTE Pro leader, Neil Jarni. Don't forget, he came in out of kilter with the rest, so he is now cycled in front of AS Corsa's James Collado. It's not four hours into the race, and they've managed to get Alessandro Pierre Guidi out from behind the steering wheel. This is obviously a new regime that Batty, Batty Pregliasco has uh, initiated at AF Corsa. Richard Leach third in GTE Pro, Daniel Serra fourth for Porsche and Ferrari, and Oli Gavin fifth for Corvette. There goes your LMP2 erstwhile leader, Ferdinand Habsburg. The Austrian prince is in the lead now for Team WRT. It's a bit of a quicker pit stop by United Autosports there uh, for Felipe Albuquerque. And uh, now we ride on board coming up towards Lecom with, uh, as you say, Habsburg that's uh, now leading. Got a bit of traffic up ahead of him, though. You can see the gaggle of cars, and he's going to get that gaggle of cars, I would assume, as you sort of drop down towards Pujol, area of the circuit where you can't really overtake that easily. And so it may be just okay for him in terms of keeping up the momentum, but that car has got much, much quicker. The first stint dropped back, it wasn't very good, but second stint, Robin Frins brought it back into contention. And since then, Habsburg's been actually able to shadow the United Autosports in terms of lap times. The delta in time between him and uh, United in gap on the circuit stayed the same all through this last stint. 
remember uh, Ferdy Habsburg has had plenty of LMP2 experience this year did the full Age of Le Mans series four four hour races in ten days and then the uh, European Le Mans series where he's racing for Algar Pro Racing as well so plenty of opportunity to get into the rhythm of the Orica 07 and you just saw the sense that like Alpine WRT have just not given it 100% right from the start. They weren't really happy after qualifying and free practice, so maybe they're just allowing the car to build speed naturally. Ben Keating, great opening stint in the four horsemen Aston Martin. Let's hear from him now. Ben Keating, you've come in from your stint. I was in the garage at the moment. You were the casualty in that LMP battle, LMP2 battle. Uh, that ride must have gone on forever. Yeah, it was really crazy. I, uh, I, I feel really lucky that uh, we had enough of a gap and I was able to gather myself up quickly enough to be able to keep the lead. That was the craziest thing in the whole part of it. But, uh, you know, I should know Juan Pablo Montoya from racing with him at IMSA. Uh, if I had known that was him behind the wheel, I would have watched more carefully because <laughs> I know from there you can't trust him when you're close to him in a, a pro prototype. Yes, I have tried to speak to him, and he hasn't had a word with me just yet, but um, uh, you did really well to recover it. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was really good. You know, it, uh, most people watching probably don't know that I completely totaled a car on the first day of the prologue. Uh, and so this was a backup car, uh, and oh, I had so many things running through my head. This team did an amazing job of getting the car foul, put up back together again, qualified on the pole, and oh, it was so close. I don't know how far I was from the wall, but it wasn't very far. Uh, and you know, as I'm sliding back, I'm trying to downshift to first gear, and you know, finding the starter and trying to get going again. Uh, I, like I said, I just feel really lucky that uh, there's that much runoff, and it's asphalt runoff, uh, and uh, we were able to keep the lead. So, yeah, it's good. Aside from that, you put in a great drive. Uh, Matt Campbell was cl coming in behind you. I mean, he's not a slow driver. No, uh, the, uh, the the engineer was saying, hey, that's Matt Campbell, you can let him go. I got on the radio and I said, what kind of fun would that be? Uh, so I had a little bit of fun with Matt. Uh, you know, eventually, obviously, he got by. I was really upset that I made a mistake when the 83 was behind me. I was hoping I could hold up Rivera for a while, but he's been, whew, He's been fast, so we'll see how it ends up at the end of six hours. Yeah, we will do. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You remember I said at the start of the show about um, the general drivers living your life for you, you fans back at home. That's your life you'd like to have. And ben Keating, what a glorious personality he's yeah. got. Drips enthusiasm from, from every port, doesn't he? I saw a last minute dive for the pits for Herdy Habsburg, Herdy Habsburg. So I don't know whether that was a late call from the team for him to go in, but boy, he only just made it through, didn't he? Look, blue car, blue car, blue car. It's, it's like Senior Tech Alpine have got three cars suddenly in the, in the road. That was the race leader, Nico Lapierre, uh, weaving his way between PR1 and real team racing. Yeah, Habsburg into the pits and that's dropped him back, but also high class racing was the one we just saw uh, shooting in at the back of uh, our shot there. So now it is United Autosports sitting back out. The interesting thing is going to be at the end of this lap, Martin, when uh, we've got the G drive of Nick de Vries and also the Jota cars of uh, Galil and de Costa and where it all shakes out. But uh, it certainly looks like it's still going to be Albuquerque that's actually sitting pretty at the yeah. front yeah. as we are now looking at the race leader, Alpine Nicolas Lapierre. Yeah, bit of a busy LMP2 pits at the moment. There's eight, seven cars in. There's the G-Drive number 26 car. I think DeFree stays in. Jota's 28 car, Sean Galeo, got out ahead of him. Good. WRT is ahead as well. That was Ferdy Habsburg, so he will hang on to his place. Fritz van Ed also stopped for Racing Team Netherlands, and Dennis Anderson, as you said, for high class. Also in into Europol, Kamish Chichmikoski. I should know that was commented on long enough. Easy for you to say. It's not. Well, just go with Jakub, because then you get a hard consonant before you get into Shmikovsky and all those extra consonants. Cooper, we're close. Yeah. Philip Albuquerque then for United Auto Sports USA. Cycles back to the top of the pile. United with three cars on the Le Mans entry list. 
That's starting to, uh, you know, that's Rothmans Porsche. In fact, they never had three car entry, did they, Rothmans Porsche? That's a, that's a big multi car entry in prototype racing. Here's the Iron Dames car down the inside of the Chetila. That's for position. Oh, and uncomfortable. The Chetila Ferrari turns around the 80 car. 85. So that's on page two of my timing screen. Al, who's in which? All right, so the answer there is Rahel Frey was the victim. She got turned around in the Iron Dames car. And here is the PR1 machine in the pit lane. See a little Pro-Am livery on the... And look, on the right-hand side there, there's a sports car. There's an endurance racing name from the past, Van Merkstein. Oh, that takes us right back to Porsche <laughs> LMP2 territory, doesn't it? He's here. Uh, Joss Verstappen, I believe, is here this weekend, yeah. uh, driver coaching uh, somebody in the, the, the low paddock. So it was high class. In fact, not uh, there was PR1. Gabriel Aubrey taking over the PR1 car. High class, Dennis Anderson was down and gone. And uh, Brendan Hartley in third place in Hypercar. Last lap, a 2.08.7. And still, the Alpine going two seconds quicker. Let's hear from Brendan. I was driving the car. We almost had a big crash. Yeah, copy, saw them, saw them. Da Costa, Da Costa ahead. Okay, so this is the Jota car of Brendan Hartley. He goes outside, and Antonio thought he was coming inside and tried to leave some room. Yikes. That would have been a big crash as well. That's not what they were hoping for. I definitely don't think that Antonio Felix da Costa was blocking there. That was last lap. Antonio's just been in and out of the pits. He's now on an out lap, as is Kubis Mikowski and Gabby Aubrey. But for Brendan Hartley, that was uh, a big heart-in-the-mouth moment, hence his slightly agitated sound on the radio. Three hours and 40 minutes remain of the Spa Six Hours, the opening race of the FIA World Endurance Championship Season 9 here in 2021. And let's have a look here. This is where Brendan tries to put the move in. And again, Antonio was having a little think about getting by the GT Pro Ferrari and didn't, moved back. I think Brendan was a little bit wary by that stage. Alpine is in, the race leader, Nico Lapierre. Double stint from Andre Negrau to start. Nico will stay in. And also in the locker, Philippe Signot has Mathieu Vazivier, another superstar in junior single seaters, turning into a very quick endurance racing driver as well. Yeah, the seventh Toyota goes back then to the lead, eight goes through into second, and as it does so, uh, the Alpine is rolling. Yep. So again, this is shaping up. If they continue untroubled, to be quite a finish. Yep. It's exactly what we hoped for in all the classes, actually. We were saying, look, everything seems to have concertinaed together. And of course, that's what you want from motor racing. You want as much close racing action as possible. Car number 20, this is the high class racing car. Complete change of basic color for high class. They've never had this sort of claret and white before, which is what's completely confusing me. I know, but it's not even a Danish red, really, is it? And it, it yeah, certainly, don't say doesn't, that for the certainly doesn't look like a Danish fight. Well, unless they've gone for metallic puce. Remember, one of their two. Oh, oh, they yeah, heard you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He heard you say that, and that's what you've, you've done that. Between the two G-Drive cars, again, no such thing as a coincidence, but that was... Oh, that's wide as well. Oh, yeah. that's wide. Yeah. yeah, he's struggling for grip there, isn't he, is he? Well, I think he's also a little bit looking in his mirror as yeah. he came down. You know, make one mistake and you've got to calm yourself down instantly. You can't let that mistake build up to make another one. You've got to instantly forget it. You can't change it. Once it's gone, you can't do anything about it. you just got to focus on going forward. And I think that running wide there at Eau Rouge, and he got out of it very well. Stunning recovery, I have to say, <laughs> yeah. Stavlo, stunning. That yeah. is one for the, one for the wall, but... Um, 
the second one, I would say, was maybe a little bit more uh, heartbeat moment from the first. Yeah, Dennis Anderson, bronze driver, has been in the LMS for a couple of seasons now, getting quicker and quicker. But you do see this from the gentleman drivers. If a mistake comes in, if it throws them off the rhythm, yep. it will just take them a little while longer. Remember, high-class racing in the news before we got here into uh, Spa with the announcement of the first of their, uh, the first of their uh, Le Mans crews. That is going to be... Uh, and it's fueled back as the silver driver, but then Kevin and Jan Magnussen in what uh, Jan told me uh, last week, the last possible opportunity for that to happen with the father and son, an all Danish crew in the second of the high class racing cars. We wait to find out who's going to be the other one. That will be very good news. Well, we just saw Neil Jarni leading for Porsche. Now, those are words we say quite frequently, or have said quite frequently over the last few years. But in the last couple of seasons, not so much. However, he is currently leading in GTE Pro for Porsche. This is a new position for him as a GT driver in one of the, quote, slower cars. Head of AF Courses, James Collado, by nearly 30 seconds. Richard Leitz, three seconds behind Collado's Ferrari in the second Porsche. And Daniel Serra, 15 seconds back. The 52 Ferrari doesn't quite seem to have the pace in this middle sector of the race, but we don't know what they are doing with tyres in any of the GT cars. Here's the Corvette, fifth place for Oli Gavin. And up behind him, Dragon Speed versus G-Drive. Hold on to your hats. Dragon Speed versus both G-Drives. The 21 car has hit both of them, been hit by the 26 and has hit it back and also sideswiped the 25 car. So now the drivers don't necessarily know who is in there. Nick de Vries is in the 26 G drive car. He's a lap up. Yes, he is because the Dragon Speed car number 11, Henrik Hedman and Roberto Mary in the 25 G drive car, which was the first of those, they are actually battling for position 10th and 11th in the class, which means that Sofia Flourish is up to ninth place. Here is again the Ferrari battle with Rahel Frey. And there is the Dempsey Proton car. Is that 88 or 77? They're now both got blue highlights. That's 88. You know, it, it looks totally different. Um, when you see them side by side, but in daylight, they are very difficult well, to pick out the difference. In daylight, with the sunlight reflecting off my TV monitor, it's, it's hard to tell it's a Porsche. That's my excuse, and I'm sticking to it. Marco Seafried was ahead of Thomas Floor, dropped back, and has got back in front. So he's running sixth, Thomas Floor in seventh, and the battle for eighth is what's right behind him. 85, the uh, Iron Lynx, eight Iron Dames machine. And the 47 Chetilar racing Porsche, a uh, Ferrari rather. And who do we think that was in the uh, Chetilar car? Uh, give me one moment. Sorry, yeah. it was on completely wrong screen. Yeah, we haven't Which got. number was it, please? 47. 47 was Sergiotto. Okay. Giorgio Sergiotto. And in fact, easing away from him, Rahel Freya is now closing in on the AF Corsica car of Thomas Floor. Is the replay of that incident. Yeah. So that's where she got by. That was a clean pass. She got spun around two laps previously. And that investigation continues. And she goes by Thomas Floor. It does, as does Sergiotto. So yep. Thomas Floor dropping back down the order. Drops a couple of spots, Rahel Frey. Started out in junior single seaters. She raced in DTM in GT racing. Now up into seventh place. Her next target, Marco Seafried. We saw that Dempsey Proton Porsche not far away, only a three second margin. And Rahel is going quicker. There was no, uh, uh, no further action, by the way, for that incident involving uh, Rahel and the 47. So that has been judged a racing incident. And on we go. He's uh, pulled back that uh, disadvantage and more. And here are our two leaders. Number seven, Toyota, Jose Maria Lopez, leading Hypercar. And the number 22, United Auto Sports car, just in front, leading in LMP2. And Philippe made that easy, I think. Doesn't want to be under pressure going through and up the other side of Orouge. You don't want them taking the air off your rear wing as you're going through Eau Rouge. I'd say, by the way, that is the first time that the LMP2 leader has fallen off the line. Oh, yes, so it is. After two and a half hours. Yep. It would have been uh, 
22 and a half minutes <laughs> be one here, possibly not here at Spa. But uh, yeah, it's a very different uh, balance between the hypercar category and LMP2 right now. So in LMP2, Philippe Albuquerque leading by a minute and 10 seconds over G Drive's 26 car with Nick de Vries. He is four seconds ahead of Sean Galeal. And that gap is not changing much. Galeal is not giving away much. WRT with Ferdy Habsburg, four seconds behind him in fourth. And then the Jota car of Antonio Felix da Costa, seven seconds behind Habsburg in fifth and eight ahead of Gero van der Gaard, who's taken over from Fritz van Aert in the 29 racing team Netherlands car. But Sean Galeal, you talk about Sean in the 28 car, capable of being very rapid indeed and consistently very rapid, but is another of those drivers that has made mistakes before now and lets that just get under his skin a little bit. If he can stay, it, it's confidence. If, if his confidence is high, he's an extremely able driver. It's very difficult to, to balance that line in your early career between being really quick and just that bit too quick where you have the big one. Absolutely. And that can come with experience. Well, number seven Toyota leading the race here for Toyota Gazoo Racing. And that TS-010 had not turned the wheel until the beginning of the prologue on Monday, Graham, is, is what we're being told by Toyota. It is literally a brand new chassis. We understand, obviously, that most manufacturing in Europe is struggling at the moment. Lots of car manufacturers yep. can't get hold of semiconductors. Semi what? Well, those are the chips that allow your engine management system, your gearbox management system, your sat nav and all the other stuff to work. And if Jaguar Land Rover and BMW and Mercedes can't get hold of them, then small fry like racing teams, no matter how big a racing team you are, also can't get hold of them. And the reason is not that the manufacturers have stopped making them or that they've stopped shipping them, because everybody's buying, being ele buying, buying electronics while they've been locked at home for a year, and so they've all been diverted to different places. Here's the number 60 car, Ryan Links unlapping himself from the uh, race leader in GTM, Francois Perodo, Dylan Herrera, 53 seconds back. Uh, on the race leader, the new chrome livery. So, uh, debut in the ELMS uh, prologue, but first time we've seen it race here as the 83. I think it looks stunning. In fact, Dylan Pereira, Rahel Frey and Marco Seafried are the three fastest cars in GTEM at the moment. There is Dylan Pereira in that. We, we do need to find out what they officially call it, that really bluey blue. Very blue. Yeah, very blue. That's Caribbean Sea blue, isn't it? That's the, the water off Bali, apparently. You know, I can tell from the photographs. I think it's possibly a colour he likes from one of his shirts, but uh, <laughs> that may be a different story. And the four horsemen, well, that, that's tempting fate at Spa, isn't it? You know, we had snow, we've had hail, we had you know, torrential rain, biblical flooding almost last year at the beginning of the race. We, we haven't had plague of frogs, but... The four horsemen, I never really expected to see them appear. Absolutely. Thank you, Tink, enjoying a snack. Yeah, so. well, that's what everybody's doing. Everybody's on a, in a, on a packed lunch, aren't they, because of the, uh, the COVID separation. And again, we're racing behind closed doors here at Spa, but finally, almost six months after our last encounter at Bahrain, we are back to racing in the World Endurance Championship. So the gap uh, after that uh, stop for the 36. 37 seconds from the lead. Let's hear what's going on at the moment in the cockpit with Nico Lapierre. We are P3, Toyota, wheelbox in five laps. You can push on your tire. I let you in it. This, uh, they can sniff something here, can't they? They can, they can sniff that there is a maybe a possibility of a, of a, of a real result here for the Alpine team. Worth mentioning one other, one other thing really here about this effort. This is, of course, uh, it was reasonably, in motorsport terms, a last-minute effort to get this together for the hypercar class. But this is about a bigger deal. This is about attracting the attention of the Alpine brand, the Renault Empire, to come with a new car. That is still very much on the table. And success at a race like this and success against Toyota could be a very big deal indeed for the future of this program. I think you've got to remember within that particular group, you do have Renault, you've got Alpine, you have Nissan, 
and uh, the Alpine name we clearly know from uh, the rebranding of their Formula One operations, but at the same time it all comes out of the same house, and that same house is sitting in Paris, and uh, they're clearly looking at their motorsport involvements across the board. Luca De Meo is now the new head of uh, the, the group, and he's restructuring moving forward, someone that has been actually at Le Mans many times in the past, and a supporter of that with a, with a great passion. And it's a, it's a moving time, as you say, as well, with quite a lot of manufacturers now looking at the new categories and how to get involved. Yep, it's going to be an interesting few months ahead, an interesting few years ahead, yep. with brands who've already, big brands who've already committed, big, big brands who've committed, other brands still to come. Battle between the Dempsey Pros on Porsche, just being lapped by the Toyota, and Rahel Frey in the Iron Lynx Ferrari. The gap is at 1.8 seconds. Rahel finding six tenths of a second on the previous lap, closing in. And again, that car was crashed in the prologue quite heavily. Uh, Catherine Legg, who was due to race with the Richard Mill Racing Team in European Le Mans Series last year, crashed in the prologue in... Uh, Paul Ricard, because of a car failure, badly broke her leg, didn't get to race until Daytona again this year. She's racing in IMSA with Christina Nielsen, but she now comes back with the Iron Dames team. And then she, she was saying after the press conference, she said, it's just me in Europe. I get into a race car and I have a big crash. At least this time she was able to literally walk away from it. The team have rebuilt the car. So my help Ray at the wheel at the moment and closing in on the Porsche in front, Manuela Gosner and Catherine Legg, the other drivers of this car. And one retirement in GTE Am so far. And that is the GR racing car, Mike Wainwright, crashing on the way to the grid. Maria Andrade uh, gets ready to suit up and get aboard the number 25 car. It's been a while since we've had Visit Angola on a race car. It's, it's kind of takes me back a, a decade or more. Ricardo Tessera, I think, was the last driver with uh, Visit Angola signage on his car. Raced up to Formula 2 level. He did a bit of sports car racing as well. So Rahel Frey pulling closer and closer to Marco Seyfried. And both of them catching Satoshi Hishino. This is developing into a three-way battle for fourth in this class. Bigger gaps before we get into the podium positions at the moment. How long in the AM class stints in GT? It's about an hour. It's about an hour. All right, so Hoshino's got maybe 25 minutes to go. He's starting to run out of grip, I think, because he's now being warned about track limits. Mind you, sir, is Matteo Crisoni, but uh, Hoshino is in his second stint here. Yeah, and one person not being warned about track limits is this car we're on board with now, which is uh, Ferdinand Habsburg, WRT, closing up for third place. And the car ahead is the Jota Sport car of Sean Galeel. And Habsburg's been actually consistently quicker through the course of this stint since he's got in. And like I said previously, the... Uh, the WRT car seems to have basically the pace of the leading cars, not quite as consistently, but it can do it on occasion. But Habsburg will be taking third place, I think, very, very soon. Well, Habsburg's last lap, 209.77. Uh, Brendan Hartley's last lap in the Toyota hypercar in second place was a 210.6. Now, they may have met different amounts of traffic, but on the other hand, it shows you that the hypercar and the P2 cars are not worlds apart. Here comes Rahel Frey. That's a, go That's a double overtake. Double overtake. of Marco Seyfried. That's Satoshi, uh, Satoshi Yoshida in the background. Yeah. Uh, Yoshida's dropped places. by them both. So Rahel Frey is now up to fourth place and 6.3 seconds behind Paul Dallalana. I would put decent money on her being in a podium spot by the time she brings the Iron Lynx car into the pits for a driver change. Very determined driver, Rahel. She yeah. really gets on with it, throws the car around, but she's got a pretty steely focus on what she's actually doing. And uh, yeah, I think you're right, she'll be charging in on the back of Dalalana. And here we see the WRT car again, getting a little bit closer. And we'll be going to the radio to listen to Sean Galeel. Habsburg is right behind you, this is for position. 
Yeah, it definitely is for position, and it's going to be one that'll come very, very soon. Uh, just behind, though, Habsburg, you've also got Antonio Felix da Costa in the other Jota car as well. And so, therefore, there's uh, quite a little sandwich there all within six seconds. As you saw in the background, Anthony Davidson suited and booted. As, uh, well, look in the garage there, you know, outside, lovely sunshine, in the shadow in the garage, hat, scarf, everything pulled up around your ears. It's not a hot day. It's been like that all week. I mean, out in the sunshine, you can get sunburned, but actually in the shade, it is freezing. Yep, it is. Or rusty. It's, one it's or the other. not warm. It's not warm. I didn't see many sunburnt people around, I've got to say, in the paddock earlier on, but here we're back to it. Coming back to this, when you talked about the black times, Habsburg's average lap, which in reality is the thing we need to look at as opposed to peak laps, has been about one second faster than Jean Galil over the course of this stint. This stint so far is about 10 laps in, and so we've got about another 12 laps, and you can see the rear of uh, the Jota Sport car up ahead just moving around underneath Galil as he tried to commit to the chicane there, and it's not secure, it's not sitting underneath him. That left rear tyre is the one that takes a pounding round here, and it's a left rear tyre that looks like that uh, Galil's struggling a little bit with it, as uh, Habsburg takes a nice big run to try to look towards the scheme, but I think he's still too far back. Yeah. Getting into the point where we expect to see the Totas down pit lane. The gap at the moment, first to third, where the Alpine sits, is 43 seconds. So that will put the Alpine back up into the lead at this stage, although the pace of the Totas right now um, is pretty strong compared to where Nico Lapierre is, although that last lap, a bit of an outlier with traffic. Well, great on board with Ferdy Habsburg, not a whiff of a lift all the way up the hill, and he has reeled Sean Galeal in. It is now down to a car length. As you were saying, he's not going to get him at the bus stop. I thought you are right, but if he doesn't get him by Le Combe, I'll be very surprised. And whoa, 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 whoa. there's the Alpine, trying to get back in front of the Porsche, just not quite having enough room to get it stopped and squared away. It was a four or five second loss there as we think back to this battle for third place and he is in the slipstream, but Galeel will go to the left. Habsburg's going to have to make a dive if he's going to do it. No, not this time. No, but there's traffic in front and he may well have seen that as they come up the hill. Be thinking, OK, I'll bide my time. Number seven is in. This is Jose Maria Lopez. Pachito leads for Toyota Gazoo Racing. This brand new hypercar. The TS-010. And remember, a 1 minute 30 was the last pit stop, which was a very slow one, and they were also charging uh, the oil in. And we saw them uh, not doing it this time, though, at the moment. A little check in behind to make sure that this is actually checking for rubber pickup. Big balls of rubber are now out onto the circuit. And so they check in around to make sure that uh, they can scrape anything they can out or it's not sticking into the suspension uh, because it can actually restrict the suspension movement in around the back axle, especially. Lights flashing now from the WRT man. If you mind uh, checking in for the first time this year, I don't know what you are fundamental change in terms of the aero on the LMP2 cars this year. They're running lower downforce, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent less downforce, but lower drag too. So that will affect their ability to make it stick into the corners. Seven car is rolling. That was one minute and one second on pit lane for Jose Maria Lopez. Drops in behind Nicolas Lapierre. It's going to be somewhere between seven and ten seconds the gap when they come through the next timing beam. A little bit more, I would say it'll be about your 10 seconds sort of gap, and that's going to be in a. As we see the leader at the moment, Brendan Hartley, and he should be popping into the pits on this particular lap as well. As, uh, and he'll drop there. We have second place, Nicolas Lapierre. And he's made it around. Lacombe was the last lap where he had uh, ran wide and straight across the sort of runoff area. He's got to be careful not to have too many of those because it is going to be reasonably nip and tuck with the extra stops that uh, this particular car's got to do in comparison to the Toyota. And so if they keep it neat and tidy, they're in the game. If they don't, then they probably won't be. Absolutely. Indebted to Sam Smith for sending us the um, rules regarding pit stop times versus your energy consumption and your stint length. And then, you definitely need a slide rule and advanced mathematics to work it out. There's the Toyota off at the top of the hill, and that is Jose Maria Lopez on his outlap. Whatever you can do, Nicole, up here, I can do better. I can do worse. <laughs> there you go. Here comes the eight car down pit lane as well. This is the race leader, Brendan Hartley. Oh, 
hypermotion shot of the car shows just how hard it works also gives you a great view through that sort of double you've got a flat floor and then basically the first story has got open windows and then the second story has got the driver and all the gubbins so there's this enormous air channels underneath the nose of the car through that come out in front of the side pods toyota in testing must have had a lot of problems with pickup because it's now a strategy to make sure all those areas around the back are as clean as possible now it's possibly something with the new hypercar but it's also possibly something just with the evolution of the circuit and also the amount of pickup that's on the track drivers may be reporting small vibrations pick up you get it a lot here at the bus stop chicane funnily enough where it sits onto the curb and I don't know why it sits on that particular curb as now that Toyota's back on its way yeah dives out just in front of the real team racing machine car number 70 now has Norman Nato aboard we saw him in the garage a little earlier on as we were hearing from Esteban Garcia it's starting driver and Nico Lapierre wasting no time in traffic in the lead of the race once more for Alpine Jota now under pressure from WRT and through immediately goes uh, goes Ferdy Habsburg dives past Sean Galeel oh, it was five laps of uh, immediately in that yeah. one particularly so Galeel did defend it really well Habsburg now passed and I would suspect that he's going to actually pull away but the person that's gained out of those two battling against each other is the second Jota car which is Antonio Felix da Costa who is now pulled from six and a half seconds behind to about three seconds behind this one and he's got Guido van der Garde right behind him as well there they are in the background so that's going to be a four car battle very very soon indeed yeah. P2 is still serving up the entertainment it's a cracking race now in P2 it certainly is, there's a 91 Porsches in the pits, and that's the fourth place car, Richard Leitz at the wheel. Now, remember, both Porsches have had an early pit stop on their second stint after 18 and 19 laps, with a right rear uh, tyre that has been dropping in pressure for whatever reason, something that they hasn't seemed to be able to explain so far. However, their third stint looks to have gone all OK. Be interesting to see what kind of stint times Neil Yanni was putting out. Of course, this is his first race in uh, WC aboard a GT Pro car. As we've been talking through the week, a fundamentally different challenge for the XLMP1 driver. Not too badly, I'd have to say. 23 laps, a 2 minute 15.790 was his average. James Collado, ex GT Pro World Champion in the Ferrari, a 2 minutes 15.897. Richard Leitz, his teammate, very experienced in this car, a 2.15.557. Right, other money, well done, Neil Yanni. And there's a change, I think that's the 88 and the 98 together on track. That is a switch of position. Marco Seyfried going through and ahead of Paul Dallalana. Rahel Fry already oh, up in the oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Before you even finish the oh. sentence, Dalalana came back at him through Eau Rouge, but through Radion runs out all four wheels wide. He this needs to give the place back because there could be uh, a penalty for that if he gains advantage. It's a three-car battle because yeah. the Chetilar car is in there as well, as well as one of the Toyotas. Oh. I could get caught up in this if they've yeah. both checked that one out. If you go to Chetilar car, it's the number eight car, the third-place car, Brendan Hartley, yeah. who's in a rush to... Make oh, up time. Yeah, so squeezes time. through. Squeezes through. So Marco Seafried came out on top in fourth. Giorgio Senna Giotto now up to fifth. Paul Dallalana down to sixth. And this is where it started, Alan. The Porsche sends the Aston where he wants him to the outside and then cuts back. Yeah, and once Dallalana has bumped over that red point, he has to wait all the way until the end to come back. But that's brave. You don't want to go in there and, well, he, he ran wide. I was going to say, you don't want to go in there and have to run wide, but he ran wide. Uh, yeah. Should say, by the way, end of the pit stop for car eight. The last pit stop is under investigation. So is there further drama to come for Toyota Kazoo Racing? Well, clearly they're still trying to work out the formula. Safe release. I've taken a look at it and yeah, here we go. He the, did come out very close proximity to the yeah. 70 car, didn't he? It was, uh, I think the thing is, is whether the 70 car braked or not, the LMP2 car that was already in the fast lane going towards that pit exit and the thing is I have to say that in that situation the driver Brendan Hartley would never have been able to see there's no way at that sort of angle you can move your head and the mirror would not pick it up and so therefore he's going purely on the lollipop man at the front when he releases the car you go without any real vision of what's around you we're on board with Sean Galeel ahead of us 
is oh. Kedo van der Gaard and Antonio Felix da Costa. This is a three-way battle. Low yeah, fuel. Low fuel at the bottom of that steering wheel, so that's flashing. That means that uh, I would suggest he's on his in-lap. Yep. Come in now or don't bother coming back. Fantastic uh, by the people there in our van to be able to pick that up on the steering wheel. And you see there the tyre pressure's just above it. There's that's Ferdi Habsburg, third place. Antonio Felix Costa is fourth. Just One more lap. Yeah, he yeah. doesn't need to. Now, you've got a strategy, and there is a... So when That's you get to a point where the fuel has gone down to a level and you get your low fuel alarm, it may be that on certain circuits it's different. It'd be once past the pits or immediately in if it's Le Mans. If it is a shorter circuit, you maybe do two times past the pits before you come in uh, because there is effectively a not a reservoir like you but it's, it's similar to a road car when you come on to your fuel light then you've got a period of time and you don't just come in immediately when the light is on you go to the absolute limit yeah interesting moments here Lapierre still in the lead with that uh, leapfrog again the two Toyotas with their latest pit stop it's under seven seconds is the gap both the lead cars it's the number seven car that's chasing Jose Maria Lopez uh, lapping in the 207s at the moment. This is an interesting point in the race. Now, of all the things that you would have thought that Toyota Gazoo Racing would not cost themselves time with, it's mistakes in the pit lane, and that's what's dropped the number eight car 30 seconds behind its sister car. Here's the battle for third place in LMP2. We talked about Antonio Felix da Costa catching three seconds on Ferdinand Habsburg. He's caught the other three seconds now. He's right on the back of him. And he's pulling along Guido van der Garde and the racing team Netherlands. So it's, oh. And he's gone for it into the S's. That squeeze, but Habsburg just told him, not here, mate. You've got to wait a little bit longer. He shut the door on him politely, I have to say, but he certainly shut the door on him. Then you've now got Guido van der Garde sitting there to pick up the pieces and Sean Galeel sitting just behind him as well. Third, fourth, fifth and sixth, all in the one shot. And they could all be on an in-lap maybe this time round. Yeah, Ferdi Habsburg held his line. Antonio trying to pass on a, a real Formula E type dive. Didn't happen for him. Yeah, but he got the DTM chop from Ferdi Habsburg, <laughs> didn't he? Yeah, it was a polite chop, oh, I have yes. to say. He, he, you know, it was a late move by, by uh, Da Costa, and Da Costa would need to have help, and he knew that from Habsburg if it was going to come off. These three run through and uh, onto another lap, whereas in the background we may see the... No, the Jota car keeps on going. No, Ferdi Habsburg sliding there through the bus stop as he goes by the Iron Lynx car. That's Matteo Crisoni, who's in seventh place with the yellow highlights, the Ferrari with the yellow highlights, he's in seventh in the GTM class. And they are now starting to close in on the number one car as well, the Richard Mille racing team car of Sophia Fleur. So they're about to put a lap on that car. Yeah, yeah they are, but the person that got held up there was uh, the racing team Netherlands, just a little bit, not too much. But uh, now Habsburg's got to think a little bit strategically. How's he going to get past Flourish and use Flourish to try to get away from Da Costa? And that gives him maybe one or two laps of breathing space where he can collect his sort of thoughts. But more importantly, try and get the tyre temperatures and things under control as well. And so now, in this section of circuit, he's got to go and do to Flourish what Da Costa tried to do to him. Yeah, but not leave the door too wide open. What he doesn't want is to run her out off the road. He wants to get by and then her shut the door right behind him. Yeah, but he needs to get by. That's the yeah. principal point. Get by first. GT traffic coming ahead of this battle as well. And he's got a nice run through there, but Flourish is she's well neat and tidy and no problems. The, the cost is too far away. Yes, he is. But look how much closer Gear de Vandegaard is coming now. He's coming with a head of steam. Yeah, that 92 Porsche, Graham, that's going to be quite easily when you get towards Blanchemont. It's more, a, it's a few as we see there, Vincent Voss, who's led this team. In fact, I raced against Vincent back in the day. But uh, Vincent Voss there led WRT team to all the GT glories as well as uh, into DTM and now into LMP. And World Touring Cars. I mean, there's very few racing formats that they haven't tried. Jakob Schmikowski pits for into Europol, so the first of the LMP2 pit stoppers. This battle continues, can't get by Sofia Flersch. Oh, neat. this oh, is a little move oh, there. Oh, Da Costa. Antonio has another Formula E lunge. 
Yeah, but that was very, very opportunistic. He saw that Habsburg was trying to line up Flourish coming into this corner and went for it. But that's giving Guido van der Garde a bit of a move. But now, now he's done it again, and Habsburg has got to settle with this one now, I think. Oh, no, he's not. He's on the curbs. He stays on. Yeah, he's, he's dropped the momentum now, though. What he didn't want oh. was to allow both cars to go through. He's alongside the rear wheel. He's side oh. by side, door handle to door handle. Well, there's nothing wrong with the bravery element in any of these drivers. Sophia Fleur is trying to find her way through the cars in front. Antonio Felix da Costa is still there, door handle to door handle. But now he is using the GTs to box in. Ferdy Habsburg, the WRT driver, is stuck behind the Porsche, loses both places. That's experience on the part of Antonio Felix da Costa and bravery on the part of uh, Ferdy Habsburg. And it was also a little bit inexperienced by Habsburg as well to get blocked in behind the GT cars. And Van de Garda there, he just squeezed himself into the spot where Habsburg had nowhere to go. He had to lift off. And this is the, the set, end of the first part where Da Costa went down the inside. He squeezed Habsburg out onto the rumble strip. Habsburg lost a bit of momentum at this particular point, And that allowed then uh, everybody to sort of concertina up. What happened down at Rouge was definitely the stuff of bravery, which is what we see now. Both of them going round the outside. Habsburg's on the dirty side and then runs off the circuit. So I'm sure he got a little bit of pick up there. And yes, only in the co in the pit, but also in the comms box. We were holding our head, waiting to see what was going to happen. See, Van Zandt Voss would have been very happy to do that when he was sitting at the wheel of a Chrysler Viper, but when he's having to watch it happen, a little less so. Now, the, the quick two have gone by as well, so uh, Da Costa and, and uh, Van der Garde have gone by Sophia Flersch, and now Ferdi Habsburg goes by as well, leaving her to deal with Sean Galeel and Gabriel Aubrey, who'll be the next in the line. Ahead of all of this, Felipe Albuquerque still leading by more than a minute over Nick de Vries, Antonio Felix da Costa, Gerda van der Gaard are third and third B because it's not really much of a gap down from third to fourth. Yeah, first and second are basically shadowing each other at time, but it's one minute in between them, which was predominantly taken out in the first two stints of the race. And uh, we have to remember that, uh, you know, this particular car also had a true gent in it being Fritz van Erd as well. And uh, without any safety cars or full course yellows so far, then it's, it's been pure racing for nearly three hours of this six hours of spa. Yeah, don't worry, folks. Alan was touching laminate then, yes, which is as was. close as we get to this wood. solid oak. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Jarni, the GTE Pro leader, is in the pits in the 92 car. Rui Andrade takes over G-Drive's number 25 car. So James Collado cycles to the front in GTE Pro. But all eyes on the battle in LMP2. We always knew it was going to be exciting with more than a dozen P2 cars, and it has not let us down. Uh, Tyres going on at least left side for Neil Gianni. It is only left side again. Yeah, left side only. Uh, while all this is happening, by the way, lead battle overall between the leading Alpine Elf, Matt McCarr, the 36 car, still in the hands of Nicolas Lapierre, and Jose Maria Lopez's number seven, Toyota Gazoo Racing GR010 hybrid, is around four seconds. And Lopez just a fraction quicker lap on lap, so he's closing the gap on lap here. And you wonder again, you know, as TTR are learning a little bit more about this car as we ride on board, are they just massaging it closer and closer into its sweet spot, exactly as we've heard? Oh, about big lockup, big lockup. I'll tell you what else. That's the third lockup from a Toyota at the top of the hill there, the second from the number seven car, so... The number eight car has done it as well. Yeah, but one thing Louise Beckett in the pit lane, and she's got a fantastic temperature thermometer, it's called her hand, and she said it's getting much, much colder out there. The colder it gets at the end of the Lake Com, the long straight up the hill, then the less, t uh, also the longer you run on the tire, the less rubber it is, which means that it dissipates the heat quicker, which means it's much easier to lock. Well, the other thing with three hours almost completed it is that's how long it's taken Louise to complain about it being cold. Duncan would have been up three minutes. We'd have heard it. So here we go. There's the race leader, the Alpine. And the gap is now down, or was at the last split, under three seconds despite that runoff. Jose Maria Lopez not losing much in terms of ground. 
uh, abuse of track limits again by Paul Dallalana. He's struggling the 98 Aston. He has been, in all of his stints, has been abusing the track limits and being reported to the stewards. He's had two drive-throughs, one for a tag with someone else and another one for abusing track limits already. So definitely he's, uh, he's going to know the stewards not only by name but also by whole family and probably invited to Christmas dinner at this rate. Well, they probably know his credit card details by heart now. That was the LMP2 leader, Philippe Albuquerque. He hits his marks at United Auto Sports, skates to a halt, and driver change. So he is out. Phil Hansen did a double. Philippe did a double. Fabio Scherer. This is their new boy in the lineup, Fabio Scherer, the Swiss. He's a silver ranked driver. This will be his first World Endurance Championship start with United Auto Sports. That's a great looking helmet livery, isn't it? All sorts going on there. Temperature is currently 10 degrees down, four from the start of the race. Yep. Air temperature, that is. Track temperature is a different thing. Tracks what the tyre actually knows. Well, part of the track temperature change will be the fact that it's significantly more cloudy now than it was at the beginning of the race, where it was very sunny. Watching anxiously from the garage there, Phil Hansen. And Trevor the, Foster, team manager. And in the G-Drive garage, they are about to go for a driver change as well. The Argentine colours on the helmet of Franco Colapinto, oh. and that was close ahead oh, of Dragon Speed's Henrik Hedman. That was exactly the same as what happened with the Toyota as well, and it was being investigated for an unsafe release, so I'm not sure whether the same again would come up. I get, as I said previously, though, it really depends on whether the car behind had to brake or not. And from this angle, it's very difficult to see as well, I must say. One thing here, Van de Garde, de Costa, got ahead of Habsburg. However, Habsburg, and this is the replay of it all start, that's just the opportunistic dive by de Costa, pushed Habsburg well wide. Very dusty tyres at this moment in time. Another little push off, and uh, then he had a run round the outside, battling side by side, wheel by wheel, all the way through Rouge. Ultimately, Habsburg seemed to be leading at this stage, however, it was all to sort of go a little bit wrong when he got blocked at the end of the Kemmel straight uh, in behind these GT cars as Vincent Voss, yep, holding his head. Wait and see what happened. All turned out OK, but what I was about to say, sorry, gentlemen, is that that was a bit of an unsettling, nervous lap for Habsburg, but he's got back into it now, and he's pulled it. himself right back onto the back of Da Costa and Guido van der Garde. So he's forgotten about the problems of the previous lap, hasn't let him affect him and get straight back on with the job. Real mature drive from Ferdi Habsburg, and still very much part of this story. Developing, Nick de Vries, by the way, moves into the lead of LMP2 for the moment, but uh, he's going to be on pit lane before too much longer. Ben Hanley, by the way, took over the 20 on Dragon Speed car. And that was the car that we saw the 22 United car chop in front of coming out from the pits. So he's taken over from Henrik Hedman. So Hedman, Hedman rather, has done his uh, minimum drive time. Uh, we've so just got a quick look inside the cockpit. Uh, driver's view from the number seven car and clearly visible now the 36 car. Under two seconds is the gap, yeah. the lead gap. And we are at the halfway point now. Oh, yes, well done. That's like spotting when your car goes over to 100,000 miles. Not that Alan would know what that's like. Uh, but uh, <laughs> three hours down, three hours still to go. And into the pits comes Racing Team Netherland, Gera van der Gaard. And followed in by the, also WRT with Ferdi Hansberg as well. So Jota going a lap longer. How many laps was Sean Galeo's thing, uh, Digital Dash, saying low fuel? It's like 20 minutes ago, wasn't it? Yeah, I think he's just hitting reset all the time. It could actually be a sensor issue. Yeah. In reality, it could yep. be a problem where you just have to hit reset, and once you've hit it five times and it doesn't go away, and the car keeps running, and you've only done X laps in your stint, then uh, you kind of just start ignoring it. It's like the snooze button. <laughs> just keep, keep hitting it, snooze, snooze, ignore that. Wait for the team to tell you to come in, they won't yeah. forget. You need a hungry cat if you're doing that these days, but... <laughs> Sophia Flersch is also in the pits in the Richard Meal racing team car, as uh, we now get a flurry of LMP2 pit stops. 
Yep. The battle here for the lead of the race, Jose Maria Lopez has gently been catching back in on the back of the Alpine and Nicolas Lapierre. And how many laps till Nico needs fuel? Well, Nico's on 19 laps on this stint at this moment. And what are they doing, 21? Yeah, they're basically doing 21, 22 laps. 22 is more 22. likely, okay, so, so three, three laps. More, three Brendan's more. only eight laps into his 24 yeah. lap stint. Pit stop car 22 reported to the stewards for the safe release. Yeah. There's another issue as well, and it's just as I speak, it, it's changed. They hadn't changed the driver indicator, it still showed Felipe Albuquerque in their car. Yeah, you've got to uh, then inform the race direction if there is a problem, and yep. it is not the driver that is in the car. If you do not inform race direction, they can actually serve a penalty yeah, on just, you. It changed just a moment. changed on the yeah. screen, so obviously somebody in United has looked at the telly screen and go, Fabio, oh, Fabio, oh, oh. switch the switch over. Well, it's... Uh, uh, it, it's not oh. quite, it doesn't quite work like that, but uh, there's a bit of an issue here? going on there. It's WRT. Yeah. Well, Louise Beckett is right down there. Yeah, that has taken the team by surprise. They weren't ready for this car to go on to the dollies and come in. Like, everything was in its way, in its pathway. They've just cleared it out, so I'm going to get in there and find out. I don't know if you could see anything. Yeah, and Louis, they called it. they've got actually, they're in, in the footwell area, so they're going into the driver's footwell. They've got a little, uh, there's a, like an access panel, and uh, it's the right-hand side, so I would suggest it's something in and around the driver's footwell. So some master cylinder or electronic issue, perhaps G-Drive are in, front. in as well. That's the 26 car, Nick de Vries. Didn't look like the door was open. And behind the Dragon Speed number 21 car, Ben Hanley, but a, a lap ahead of them. Fabio Scherer, now the number 22 car, back in the lead of the race. They're only losing the lead in the pit stops. Here comes the Alpine. And the Toyota has dropped back to 2.2 seconds behind. So Nico Lapierre, as one of the Ferraris, dives into the pits, while Daniel Serra has just left, so I'm assuming he's not back. That'll be James Collado in from what was the lead of GTE Pro. Nico Lapierre coming to the end of his tyre life, but Pachito with fresh rubber on the car. We saw him taking a look in the mirrors as well as they came down the start from the straight. That would have been slightly easier for the Toyota with the Ferrari diving out the way. Two yeah. seconds almost dead as they cross the line. Lopez won't have fresh tyres, will they? They will be a stint fresher. They were not brand new this stint, though. So that's where it is at the halfway point. Alpine, Toyota, Toyota. Then United, Jota and G-Drive, the top three in LMP2. But as the pit stops cycle through, WRT back into the garage for a brief hold. AF Corsa pitting from the lead of GTE Pro, and that will hand the lead back to the Porsche team. And it is Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari, Corvette in GTE Am. 22nd overall is AF Corsa's number 83 Ferrari from the TF Sport car that started on pole. And Dempsey Proton's 88 machine after 77 had a delay. That car was up to the top three early on in the race, having started right at the back of the field. But there's been big problems. A hold up for the triple seven Aston Martin. And ARC Bratislava pitted very early on the at the end of the formation lap or end of lap one with a, a leaking fuel tank. GR Racing did not make it round on the formation lap. A crash by Mike Wainwright at uh, the top of the hill at uh, uh, Lake Homme. Sorry, apologies for buttoning there. I just they've got the engine covered off now and also the nose, and so therefore it's, it uh, looks like uh, brake brake master cylinder, yep. That's always the worry. Electronics tend not to be in the nose. You never quite know how cars are designed. Normally, when they go in in front of your feet, it's either brakes or clutch. Mm. You can see three cylinders there with fluid being topped up. And at the back, are they bleeding the clutch? Is it yeah, clutch? It's clutch? I think it's clutch, not brake, actually. But why would you come in mid-stint because you don't use the clutch. It's not like a normal manual car. It was the end of his stint. He was, yeah. the end of his stint. Done he was 21 laps. He was, that was his standard. OK, it so, it, so they couldn't leave because yeah. he couldn't yeah. select a gear because he couldn't use the clutch. Okay. I was watching these dramas, by the way. The, um, the lead car, the 22 United Auto Sports car, 16 seconds ahead at the moment of Antonio Felix da Costa in the Jota 38. That car, I think, owes us a pit stop, though, Alan.
Jota, yeah, they seem yeah, yeah, to be running on um, on a wing and a prayer and, and on fumes, but Tom Blomquist has taken over the 28 car of Sean Galeo, so we expect Antonio in very soon. In this lap, in fact, he's uh, done 21 looked laps. Looked to me like the, the 31 was just about to be wheeled out. The other yeah. thing to remember in that lead battle is the United car is under investigation for an unsafe release. 22 seconds for a drive-through, that's the pit delta, so probably slowing down and speeding up 25, maybe 30 seconds total. 25. At the, at the moment, he's 16 seconds ahead, so he would lose the lead if he had a drive-through. Box, box, in this lap for driver change, driver. Full service for that car, Nicola Lapierre has done two stints and uh, two very quick stints, I've got to say, a 2.068 and then a 2.078. So he's only dropped a second on the tyre life, which is very impressive, actually. And uh, that's led them back into the lead of this race. Now they're on a completely different sort of strategy to the Toyotas due to the fact that uh, the Toyotas can go three, four laps longer. And uh, so therefore it's slightly offset. However, a pretty good performance. But the Toyotas did not catch them on pace in that stint. No. There's been a driver change, by the way, at WRT. The car is now back on track. Charles Milesi starts his first stint in that car. So whatever it ailed them, hopefully it's fixed. Clutch, it's confirmed by Vincent Voss that it was actually a clutch issue they had, and so they are now back on their way. That's a bit disappointing uh, for them because clearly they brought it back up. I think they were 10th at the end of the first lap and into fighting for a podium position. But uh, these are one of the lessons that you learn when you only get into racing. Well, that's not a new team problem, is it? Clutches don't fail just because the team don't know what they're doing or they don't uh, need bleeding necessarily. So that's just particularly it's unfortunate. Wide. But uh, yes, of course, the Audi family connection. Of course, Alan's got uh, Vincent Voss's phone number in his phone. So driver change there as well at Alpine. Nico Lapierre has done his double stint. Andre Negrau did a double early on. So it's now Mathieu Vazivier. As we get into hour four of the six hours of Spa Francorchamps, the opening race of the FIA World Endurance Championship season nine for 2021. And how the world has changed from two, three years ago when we began a super season that would finish with Le Mans every year in the middle of the summer and race through the winter. Well, yeah, fate had other ideas. The, the great laid plans of mice and men, uh, that, that fell back and we're now in a uh, calendar year calendar season yeah they definitely do gun after glee as uh, robert burns said as now he goes back out onto the circuit mathieu xavier very very quick very aggressive in traffic and uh, someone that certainly cut his teeth as we see the 31 moving on its way uh, the lollipop's got to go up yeah he's not releasing are they just testing to see if he can can he get a gear there yeah he's, starting he's starting it starting it yeah, he's starting it in gear on the... We're three hours in, if you're going to try and start it on... The problem is that the batteries are about the size of a AAA in these cars. They don't... They're not supposed to do anything other than start it once. Not even then. Normally, even on the grid, you have a slave battery, so... They aren't like a road car battery. They don't have that oomph. Travails at Team WRT. Well, Ferdy, you've just been watching the pictures. You were here in the garage seeing it. Uh, tell us what's happened with the car. Yeah, I, I felt um, already on, when I first started that uh, there's uh, something soft with the clutch. I was not able to kill it, kill it manually. And then, uh, yeah, I already knew the soft is getting bad. And as I set off, it, it could not really, it was jumping and it, it's just getting worse and worse. So hopefully we'll be able to finish the race after the next couple of pit stops. Yeah, and you put in such a great drive. That was so good to watch that battle out there. Yeah, I, 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 I enjoyed it a lot of it, but unfortunately I, I, I came, up, came out on the bad end because I got a bit unlucky at the end, but uh, it's really hard to overtake with, with us at the moment on the straights. Uh, we're quick in the corners, not so quick on the straights. So something to focus on for the future but 
Yeah, I enjoyed myself a lot, uh, battling with a few of my friends out there. Yeah, I'm going to call them a bunch of bastards after that because <laughs> I feel like I should have had more space, but I'm always going to be that and I'm going to rough it up with a beer after the later. We do apologise for any swearing that may be <laughs> happening on air, um, but thank you very much. Cheers, cheers. Sorry about that too. There you go. That's, there's two indicators of when a foreigner learns to speak English well. One is the fluency and, and the uh, innocence of his swearing, and a second is his ability to, to tell a joke, and he combined two in one sentence there. So, Ferdy Habsburg, he is, yes, the scion of the Habsburg dynasty. So, Austrian, young Austrian driver making his first steps in World Endurance Championship and uh, definitely making his mark there. He may give a little bit less racing room the next time round. I think Jamie will say, all right, son, you were nice to them this time, elbows out the next time. Elbows out is definitely the way that it's got to be in this championship, but you've got to make sure that you don't actually lose the skin off your elbows yep. as you're fighting your way through. That was, that was Simon Trummer in the uh, PR1 that was car. PR1 Simon Trummer, yeah. Yes, uh, just a quick note, uh, very rapid out on circuit at the moment, the second place car in LMP2. Uh, the 26 G Drive racing car, the hands at the moment of Franco Colapinto, just put in on the previous lap a 205.917, which, if it's not the fastest time in LMP2, is very close to it. The young, I think still 17 year old Argentinian. Uh, just came out onto the circuit, new set of tyres on there, so we'll definitely be in a uh, good place, that's for sure. Ooh, here Up we go. Side. Racing it... Team Netherlands versus, is that? 28. That's Tom Blomqvist going by, yes, Fritz van Aert, and Davidson in the 38 Jota Sport car is already ahead in third. About 23 seconds gap now between the two Jota cars in what is going to be a battle for third position in class. Is Fritz doing a double? Uh, no, he's just got in again, hasn't he? OK, no, but it's his second stint, isn't it? Yes, OK. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fastest lap of the race but popped in by Mathieu Vazivier oh. in the 204.822, the gap. Uh, from the lead to third place is 64.6 seconds or a pit stop. It's, if a, you want it's to put a, it in almost a different way. exactly a pit stop, isn't yeah. it? Not sure what the Alpine team are doing with the car to massage it and getting it closer and closer to where they want it to be, but it's working. It's, it's pretty much <laughs> where they want it to be, isn't it? Now, yeah, absolutely. So Three hours and 13 minutes into the six hours of Spa-Francorchamps, the season opener for FIA WEC. A beautiful May day in Spa-Francorchamps in the Ardennes, perfect weather conditions in which to start a new golden era of top-tier sports car racing with the introduction of the hypercar class. Choice Gazoo Racing and Alpine first, second and fourth on the grid, but the LMP2 pole sitter, Phil Hansen for United Autosports, the reigning champions and Le Mans winners, was always going to be a bit of a thorn in the side of the Toyotas, and so it proved, briefly taking the lead down the hill on the run to Eau Rouge. As the Toyotas struggled with each other further back in the TT class, Porsche, Kevin Escher starting from an enormously convincing pole, but Ben Keating ahead in the GTE AM class. The back row starters, the 777 TF Sport Aston Martin, the D-Station car, and the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche soon finding their way through. Trouble for the number 70 car getting turned around, real team racing by a hit from behind. And the Alpine, after a number of laps, Andre Negrao, who started the third hypercar, a non-hybrid hypercar, got by into third place ahead of United Autosports. Toyota 1-2, initially car number seven, the pole sitter was ahead, but after 10 minutes, uh, 10 laps rather, the number eight car was waved in front. The team thought it was quicker, didn't seem to be much in it. Paul Dallalana in trouble in the 98 Aston, turning around the 47 Chetila Ferrari in the AM class, and then trouble for Ben Keating. Somehow there was room as he got rudely shoved off the track. As he said afterwards, though, don't know how far I was from the barriers, but they were close. They were indeed. Corvette's Antonio Garcia getting shoved out of the way by Jimmy Bruni in the Porsche in the battle in GTE Pro. And busy pit stops as the super competitive LMP2 field staying together. Fritz van Aert being waved out in front by Racing Team Nederland. 
lap and then going back in front of him, Philippe Albuquerque to retake the lead for United Autosports. That was the only time United have lost the lead other than pit stops. In the GCE AM class, lead battle between the 54 Ferrari and the 77 Porsche. 92 Porsche in front in GTE Pro, despite having an unforced pit stop for a right rear puncture, which had also afflicted the 91 car. WRT and Jota battling. Ferdinand Habsburg and Antonio Felix da Costa for third place. Barely daring to watch as they went wheel to wheel, the team boss in WRT, Van Saint Vos. And after three hours, Toyota 1 2 ahead of Alpine. That's the hypercar class positions. United Autosports lead G Drive with Jota in third and fourth in LMP2. In the GTE Pro class, it's Porsche Ferrari, Porsche Ferrari Corvette. And in GTE AM, 83 Ferrari ahead of the pole sitting 33 TF Sport Aston Martin. Dempsey Proton's 88 car lies in third place. So far, there have been even scant wavings of yellow flags, lots of blue flag action, and with the big AM class field attracting even more top class pro talent in their pro AM lineups. And the pro class field struggling to stay in front of very similar machinery, but with more fresh tyres at the AM's disposal. GT has been a dogfight, and so too has the prototype class. The hybrids, after the first couple of hours, have eased away from the LMP2 cars. It's predominantly because the LMP2 battle has been so intense. It is Toyota number seven that leads. This is Brendan Hartley, third driver in the number eight car. In fact, it's, uh, he's only the second guy to be behind the wheel. Sebastian Buemi did a double stint. Brendan in the second part of his double stint, as is Jose Maria, Le Maria Lopez, who took over the car from the double stinting Mike Conway, who started the race with the first ever hyper pole, uh, hyper car pole being set by their teammate, Kazuki uh, Kamui Kobayashi. He will wait to go in later in the car. And Kazuki Nakajima, who qualified the number eight car, will also go in later on. Yeah, the ebb and flow in the uh, lead of this race, fascinating stuff at the moment. We know there's the likelihood, almost certainty, the 36 car will need an extra pit stop because of that, 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 that uh, imbalance, if you like, between the, the, lap, they, the lap, laps they can get through on a stint. Lead is back under a minute to the third-placed Alpine. Mathieu Vazivier is consistently quicker than the two Toyotas ahead of him at the moment. 2.08 last time around from Lopez. 2.07 from Hartley. And then Mathieu Vazivier, the 2.06, 3.24. But let's go down to the pits where Nico Lapierre, after that stellar stint, is going to let us know what that felt like. Nico Lapierre coming in within the Alpine. Uh, how was that for you? It's, it's new for everybody, so how was it for you? Yeah, it was great. I mean, um, we had to push a lot at the beginning because we wanted to get the, the lead of the race, uh, to push them a bit, to get them out of their comfort zone. Um, so we had to push a bit on my first team, took the lead, and uh, now we're on different strategy because they go much longer on the stint. So obviously they're going to have uh, one pit stop less in the end. So we, we need to try to open a bit the gap, but it's difficult because they are very strong uh, over the stint, so it's going to be tight. I think they have a little advantage, to be honest, if the if the race stays green. But uh, let's see. For us, it's a learning process as well. It's the first race with this car, so we need to, to push and go to the end and learn as much as we can. Uh, there's been a lot of talk with your team and your engineer back there. So what were you feeding back? Yeah, I mean, in the end of the second seat, we had quite a lot of trouble with the tyres. Uh, so we lost a bit of time there. So we were looking at some solutions uh, in order to help this for Mathieu and also for the last two stints. OK, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. I hope they don't know too much more about uh, that package because it's nip and tuck stuff. It certainly is, and you see a bit of nip and tuck as does, uh, the United Autosport dies down the inside of uh, the racing team Netherlands there. Fritz van Ertz at the wheel of that car now, and uh, Shearer is at the wheel of the United Autosports, but you're exactly correct. It's a learning process for both the teams, though, in terms of Toyota, and what are we seeing here? Bit of a... Oh! Oh! 
That's a tag and a bit of a squeeze, maybe just got away with it. A little bit of damage to, as we're on board now with uh, Jose Maria Lopez. He loses the momentum, goes to side, I think probably a little bit of the memory of what, how they were able to do things with the LMP1 era right. and uh, misjudged the braking capability, which is significantly good on uh, the GTE Pros. Yeah, and uh, will that lead to a bit of a moment? Well, I think um, it'll lead to some the stewards having a look at a bit. It's also probably led to the left front uh, dive plane being knocked off of the front of that car, but you don't really seem to be running them anyway, so uh, I think he's probably got away with that one from bodywork damage. Aerodynamically, way, it should be OK. A little bit more soccer to the uh, the, the efforts of the Elp, Alpine Elf Matmut squad. 56 seconds now, by the way, the lead. That is, oh. is that the light cover? Yeah, it's a light cover of something. Not sure which card. Uh, it's a light cover oh, of the is. left front, yeah. Well, that's not going to help the aero, is it? Well, that's one point. It will keep the light cool, that's for sure. But <laughs> on the other side of it, it's not helping aero. The, the other thing we have to keep in mind is if that light goes out, they will have to change the nose to repair it. Yep. So you need to have your lights active and illuminated all times. And so that's the thing I would think they would be more... Uh, worried about than necessarily the aero at this particular moment in time. And what's certainly not uh, good news is it's not that deep into this uh, this stint, is it? So if there was a need to pit, he's going to be off sequence. Yeah, he is. As you can see there, the various different overtakes, and uh, that's not necessarily overtaking for position, but it is the energy that goes into it from the driver's point of view is trying to predict where these overtakes are going to be trying to make sure they are neat and tidy and invariably with 80 overtakes only in halfway through the race for a driver the chances are one of them or two of them is going to be a little bit tighter than you would maybe hope for yeah, still more and more entertainment in gtm this is for position this is the 77 car and some jackson evans battling away with andrew watson it's only for sixth position at the moment in class but uh, both are making their way back up as Jimmy Bruni suits up and gets ready to go into the fray. Yeah, this is Again, a replay. Tags that, and there goes, yep, yeah, there goes the light cover. Right. 31, pitch sideways. Richard Leitz is the driver of the Porsche. And you see, turns in, little tag, catches it. Very fortunately, I would say, for Jose Maria Lopez catches it. Yep. 77 and 777 again. These two seem to be magnetically attracted through the race. Started from the rear of the grid. 77 after the amazing rebuild overnight. Big incident for Christian Reed in qualifying yesterday. Yeah, it was top of all rouge in qualifying. Hadn't actually even done a timed lap. And I think that was the the big issue for them was that they had to start at the back of the grid. That's one thing, but having to repair the complete car the night before a six-hour race is not exactly what you want. But at the end of it, if they get this car to the end, then that will be a, a little bit of a thank you for the mechanics that uh, did a lot of work yesterday. Big hit for the 77. Some of the bodywork found just over the border in the Netherlands after that uh, shunt, but great to see Christian Reed walking away from that and able to start the race. I think he was... <laughs> fairly surprised to come in this morning and find the car in such great order. I think he would be fairly surprised after the impact at the top of Eau Rouge there that uh, he also didn't have too much stiffness about him as well. I, I suspect he's possibly feeling it. His pace was not quite where I'd expect Chris to be. Yeah, I think so. as well, confidence after something like that, oh, you yeah. know, once bitten, twice shy and everything else, but, uh, you know, you have to get back into it and get on with it yep. and sort of prove to the corner your boss, not it, but, uh, you know, there's a few scalps been taken by that corner over the years. Oh, and that was the 70 car ducking in to the pits, the real team racing car. Porsche 92 leads, by the way, in GTE Pro. Neil Janney, and uh, his first appearance in the GTE Pro squad for Porsche GT team, making that transition from World Championship level LMP1 to World Championship GTE. And it's keeping him in the, in the household and keeping him world endurance, you know, weight building up, I'm sure, for when they start testing for the hypercar or LMDH programme for Porsche. Well, you know, any of us of a certain age, you know, have had this problem through lockdown. What do you do to keep them off the PlayStation? <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, pit stop here for Real Team. 
makes it, in fact, the only car in the pit lane. It does definitely come in flourish. It always seems like that when you're a pit lane reporter, especially at Le Mans when the pit lane is so darn long and they're, they're going, go from pit in to pit out. But there is only one car now, so Louise is obviously having a cup of tea somewhere. Yeah, as we see the, uh, the now the car that's actually doing the big chase. And this is it, Mathieu Vaxivier. He got in, we've seen he's done the fastest lap so far of the race, but at the same time, his stint average on this one is over a second faster than Brendan Hartley and Jose Maria Lopez. Admittedly, the two Toyotas are on different strategies, but when Louise interviewed Nicolas Lapierre, he said, we have to keep them honest, we have to keep the pressure on them. In fact, Mathieu Vaxivier is doing exactly that. He wants to try and get past these two LMP2 cars as quickly as possible. Admittedly, those guys are going pretty quickly as well, and so it's not as if he's losing too much time, but Maxivier can keep the pressure on the Toyotas, and then you never know what happens at the end of this one. And we talked about star drivers in LMP2 and teams trying to position themselves to maybe take on roles in the hypercar class as it develops. That's what Vazivier is doing. Nico Lapierre, he's been there, he's done that. You know, he's raced in the top tier. He would love to be back. If Alpine came with a full program, those two drives would be great. You know, the old hand, the veteran, the experienced test driver and Lapierre, and a young hot shoe like Vazivier, who's hugely presentable to a French public as well as everybody else. That could be a, that could be a very good part of a combination for a, a French Alpine hypercar team. It comes into the bus stop. The, the, the other part of this is they're doing what, absolutely, as Lafayette said, they've got to do. Keep up the pressure, force the pressure. Toyota aren't used to this pressure in recent years. And if they're, if what they're seeing on their strategy laptops on uh, the, uh, the pit wall is telling this is anywhere remotely close, what other pressures is that going to bring to bear? Will that force them into making decisions they otherwise wouldn't make? Uh, effectively, it's reasonably simple for Alpine. They've just got to keep going this fast. <laughs> it really is that simple. Yeah, yeah. Go this fast, keep doing it, keep uh, pushing it through the pits uh, as quickly as you possibly can, and let's see where that puts us at the end of this race and coming into the remainder of this World Endurance Championship. Sounds so easy, Graham. <laughs> Sounds so easy. Uh, uh, believe me, I absolutely understand it's not, but the, just the, the body language and the way that that car is being... Uh, being pushed along here, just they are they're going for pace and nothing more. They are, but unfortunately, with that traffic in the last lap, they lost one and a half seconds. And so the pace and nothing more. They need to be clean as possible through the traffic. However, that also applies to Toyota. As we can see now, Tatiana Calderon in uh, the Richard Mille racing car. Uh, she, she's kept Ben Hanley behind brilliantly well. But uh, Ben Hanley is now trying. He's going to get quite aggressive. He's not going to make it there. There's, it's not a safe place to do it by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think it was a realistic thing. It was more to try and put Calderon a little bit off her guard. Behind, though, is a race leader in LMP. Two, Fabio Schirer is now catching up on this oh, particular battle. Oh. Yep, Ben Hanley half spun there. Didn't see the beginning of it, but half spun. Don't think there was contact. I think he just looked like he lost the front end of the car. Yeah, as we'll hopefully see it again. He dives down the inside of. Uh, yeah, he was on the, he's on the kerb, though. He's actually got two wheels well over the kerb. Honestly, squeezed maybe a little bit in where he shouldn't have done in yeah. that respect. I, I think that's 100% on him. Um, yes. And that's, uh, that's dropped Ben Hanley back from this particular part of the incident, Graham. Contact between cars 91. That is the Porsche of Richard Leitz and the number seven, turn 18. That is the one we saw, which lost the light cover on the number seven. The leading car in this race for Jose Maria Lopez. That could be another turning point in this race. It really could. Yeah, there's a few turning points to come, I think, as well. Good grief, yes. Vaxivi back on pace again. We saw the previous lap, he had traffic through it. And uh, this is the incident that now is under investigation. Watch that light cover there, just Bounces bouncing off. away. Richard Leitz. It was certainly avoidable contact, and yep. there certainly has to be placed at Jose Maria Lopez's door. This is the new nose that is prepared just in case. Now, this is always prepared. You always have a new nose and you always have a tail prepared and set up exactly the same as the race one. And uh, so, therefore, in that respect, they're in preparation generally, not specifically because of that. 
Remember early in the race, we saw one of the LMP2 cars getting in, turned around as they came down the hill towards Rivage by a Ferrari. No penalty there. That's little different other than it's a quicker car behind a slower car rather than a, quote, slower car behind a quicker car. I think the lucky thing, probably, if it doesn't get a penalty, is that Leitz actually didn't spin, uh, went off the circuit, admittedly, but uh, didn't spin it around. So you see Vax Sivier, this is the fastest lap that he did earlier on. In lap 89, we are now on lap 98. And so 10 laps ago in, in the start of his charge after taking over the car, new set of tyres, and off he went. The Porsche is going slowly. Oh, 91 is going slowly. Front, Not the lead car, Richard's lead. Front right, front right. I think it could actually be the right rear, rear right. Yeah, it's right rear, that's why that's, the front is off the ground. It's, now they had, one. they had a problem on both of their cars yeah. earlier on. Rear right. Exactly the same, the rear right, and it was after 18 and 19 laps, respectively, for the two Porsches. I said I didn't believe in coincidences. A third one tells me that that instinct is probably correct. Richard Leitz has done 20 laps on this one. Is it possible that oh, might have be. been yeah. because of that? He's got tagged in that corner by the nose. Is it at the split? of the Toyota has dug a sidewall hole. But uh, normally it would happen popped. straight away. Yes, agreed. Normally it happens straight away. May not be, though. We've got to look at it, but that's the third right rear issue that Porsche has had. I, I tell, oh. oh, I tell you what, though, that's going to make it very much tougher for the Toyota to wriggle out of a potential penalty if the car that was hit comes in at the end of the next lap without a tyre. Yep. On the corner that was hit. Agreed, it may have been happening anyway. Uh, the body, uh, that's from that's damage coming from the, the actual tire, tire yeah. coming off yeah. more than necessarily the impact with the Toyota. It would have been, uh, if looks we could, like it could be if we could get an inside shot from the inside of the circuit of, of, the, uh, of the car. Yeah, you can tell, ask me. Yeah, Louise, well. Can they tell us was the damage from the tyre or from the Toyota? I'm just trying to have a look. There's obviously a lot of people trying to get to this car at the moment, but, um, oh, they're going to bring this car in. I can see that there's damage around the wheel arch where there's been contact. And they've got a rear ready to replace. All right. Well, we'll come back to you as down pit road comes the race leader, Jose Maria Lopez, the number seven Toyota. They are undoubtedly going to change the rear floor and the rear bodywork because that's really sensitive for the aero balance. And here is the Toyota with that uh, blinking eye at the front that should be nicely covered up by a lovely aerodynamic lens. So that'll be a, a nose change required. They can't do that while fuel is going in. The 35 second minimum, actually, I've just had a, a, a quick uh, message with a, a colleague at Eurosport France saying, does that apply if you have a short stint? It doesn't apply if you have a short stint, but if your stints aren't going to end on a full stint, you need to do a short stint earlier in the race and back time that, but you have to be spot on with it. Interesting, there's the driver got a board through, goes. Uh... Mathieu Vazivier up into second place. Yeah. Driver gets aboard the Toyota, pointed to the front and said, have you noticed that? He genuinely did. I think they have, and I think we're going to see a nose change. Yeah. No, we're not. No, we're not. That they're sufficiently worried by where they are on pace here, Martin. They yeah. don't think they can afford the time to do that. Yeah, and alternatively, they also don't see any aero loss by not doing it, and the light's staying on, so they must be confident with that. Maybe. You know, you don't change things just in case. You change things when you predictively feel that you need to. Yeah, that will be a, a damage assessment, won't it? No, we're good. It's, it's, all, it's all still attached, and that's the key thing, isn't it? Well, it still works. Yeah. So the brake car should be in within the next lap which will again put the Alpine back up into the lead of this race. We've got Denbry on track. That would be, I'm sure, from the Porsche tyre. 17, that's Blanchimont. It is on the yeah. left-hand side, so it's offline, but... Yeah. Coming down through the GT battle, triple seven and 77. Andrew Watson in that black and green Aston, and in front of him, Jackson Evans, the man who was the favourite for last year's Porsche Mobile One Super Cup, and and won the first race, but actually uh, ended up with a, a fairly disappointing season. He's right in front, but he is a Porsche factory driver, so for Andrew Watson, 
It's a really good run. I don't think he him. is anymore. I don't think he is a Porsche factory well, driver. Yeah, I think he was a Porsche junior. I, think he's, year, yeah. I don't think he's actually officially on the roster this year. No. Apologies if I've got that wrong, Jackson, but I'm pretty certain I'm right. May not be. He was a, a factory junior driver last year. And of course, uh, Larry Tenforda, who we've seen uh, a few times making star appearances in this championship, was the Porsche Mobile One Super Cup champion. On to Gazi racing in the pit lane with Brendan Hartley. The number eight car follows in. A lap behind the number seven. We wait for Mathieu Vazivier to make his appearance past pit lane. He's coming through the bus stop now, just as the number eight comes to a halt. And we'll take the lead. Yep, driver change here as well. Kamu Kobayashi is in the number seven, and that means that Kazuki Nakajima will get in the number eight, unless odd things happen. Nope, there is Kaz. And the, the two of these guys have just become superlative sports car racers, haven't they? Nakajima and Kobayashi, both really, really quick and super reliable as well. Yeah, Kobayashi, I think, is one of the fastest people in the field at this moment in time. Uh, what he's been able to do and, you know, pull a race back when you think it's maybe gone is pretty sensational. And this is the point you would expect that Kobayashi would be pushing. Try and take track position back from Mathieu Vazivier. To go full course yellow. Oh, is that debris at uh, Blanchimont for that? We, we will wait and see. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Full course yellow, full course yellow. Three hours and what is it, 38 minutes into this race, we go caution mm. for the first time. Yeah, absolutely right. In the autumn, did we start behind the safety car? Was it that wet? Am I... I can't I, just, I thought I can't we were remember. dry last year. Yeah. Yeah, I well, think the, as well, the puncture caused by that incident uh, with the Toyota. So, as you said, wiggle room reduces a little bit uh, from the Toyota perspective, considering the that car had to actually stop Richard Leitz. It was, there you go, there's, there's yeah. debris. It's the belt. And, and there may be a little bit of other housekeeping going on. This is, Eduardo will compile a list. Okay, right, yep. we're going full course yellow. You do this, you do that, you do that. You do the dishes, you're putting away, you're drying up, you sweep the floor. Here we go. Okay, can we just to remind you, we go only one spin on this set, we go only one spin on this set. Single stint in tyres. Okay, does that mean they're going to do a short stint next stint? Because if you leave your short stint to the last stint, you don't gain any advantage from the short fueling time, the sub 35 second fueling time. But if you do it early, then you have a one shorter pit stop in the race. You, so you need to back time that from me. You need to end at the end of a full stint if you follow me but you've got to be very careful that you don't end at the end of a full stint plus a lap, which yeah. would be a bit of a disaster. I think the thing is, we know that's a fresh set of tyres because we've just seen it on the graphic, not 100% sure on the previous sets and whether yeah. they're going to recycle going forward. But at this moment in time, it's not ideal for them because those tyres just on Kobayashi's car, but already cooling down quite yeah. considerably, <laughs> pressure dropping down on them. Yeah. He's came out the blankets, out the pits, and then suddenly, yeah. boom, full course yellow. I was thinking exactly that, watching Fabio Scherer going so cold, is, is so slowly, is that the relatively cool track is just going to hoover the temperature out of these tyres. Everything is going to be a bit squirmy for the first lap. And uh, seeing what we saw in qualifying, I think everybody's going to just have to be a little bit careful. If you go back to green and you're somewhere up the Kemmel Strait, that's the best thing for you. If you go back to green and you're approaching La Source, and the, your next corner is going to be Eau Rouge on cooler tyres, you're going to have to be a little bit more circumspect. In the pits is the Alpine. It's been in and out. Uh, Jota have two cars in and out of the pits. Into Europol are in. G-Driver in with the 25 car. We just saw that leaving. Jan Magnussen has taken over the high-class racing number 20 entry. Welcome back to World Endurance Racing. Kevin Escher has pitted and gone in 92. James Collado and, uh, is in the yep. pit lane in this the 51 early. Ferrari. This is a short stint. This is a short stint, but this puts yep. them basically on the same stints as Toyota again. Yep. And so it brings them back into line. So Kobayashi, I think, has gone through to take the lead. 
I think. Yeah. At 80 kilometers per hour. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Hour. Well, and that's why you you take this opportunity to Push top back. up because you're losing so little time comparatively. Yeah, but you've just lost four or five seconds there and traffic as well. Another couple of seconds. The other Signatech car. And so there's, when every time you push the car back because the car ahead of you came into the pits, it's just one of those unfortunate situations under a full course yellow like this. But you do lose about three, four seconds pushing the car back. And then if there's traffic again, that's another sort of two or three seconds, or probably six, seven seconds in total time loss than what they normally would have done if it had been a clean stop. However, it is under safety car. Well, if it's full course yellow. Fasivier has come out of the pit lane. The Seven has not cleared sector one yet. Yeah. Okay, Kaz, so this is a mixed set. So you on the left, quality tires on the right. This will be single stint, single stint on this set. Copy, pink with me. So Kaz Nakajima crosses the line now. He is in third still in the number eight Toyota. So Alpine would were well well advised to make that stop there. They retain second place. And as you say, Graham, 25 seconds or so behind Kamui Kobayashi. But they are just about on the same strategy now. So Kobayashi under full course yellow has just cleared sector one. Sector one is at the end of the big long straight after Eau Rouge. And Kobayashi has is now coming down to, sorry, this is uh, Nakajima, I should say, coming down in towards Eau Rouge. 30 seconds to remove full course yellow, under 30 seconds to remove full course yellow. So on the left-hand side, you can see the uh, safety monitor, which relays all the flag signals. It's currently showing full course, yellow. full course yellow. It'll show blue flags, it'll show red flags, yellow flags, green flags. So it'll go to green when we Ten, go green. Nine. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. There you go. We go green. The monitor says we are green. And after a few seconds, it'll turn off. It does flash as well to draw, uh, draw the driver's attention. Yep. There are some strobe lights on the top that flash to draw your attention when a new message comes in. And it also sends back to race control a signal that says, yes, I have received that message in the car. So the driver it cannot then say, well, I didn't see the flags and there was nothing in the car because the car says, yes, there was. So waiting for these three cars, the seven, followed by the 36 and the eight to clear sector two, we then get to see what the real world gaps are. Not good news though for the 36, stuck behind two GT cars at the moment. Yeah, not able to sort of blast past them there. I'm no. surprised at that. I thought actually he'd have been able to at least nip down the inside of one of them, clearly struggling a little bit with uh, the, the grip at this point. However, you can see there on the graphic that uh, the lead Kobayashi car is just coming into the bus stop chicane. And now we've got Mathieu Vaxivier going through Blanchemont and coming into that same corner itself. About 13, 14 seconds seems to be the gap at the moment. Yep, and their little battle behind between Porsche managed to squeeze in front there and keep his position. Ahead of the AM-Class Ferrari, that is the AM-Class leader, Alessio Rivera. And that is behind the 92 Porsche, I think, of Kevin Esch. So oh. there's the WRT car. Clearly, their clutch bleeding yeah. has not cured the problem. And their debut in the FIA World Endurance Championship is done. But I think they serve oh. notice. They are going to be a very formidable competitor when we get to our next race in Portimao. I wouldn't say it's done completely. Still see a driver in the car. Yep. I think they're, yep. they're trying to top it up, but they're minus five laps. You're correct in terms of real terms. They're, well, four laps off the lead of LMP2 off this car, yep. which is being run by Fabio Shearer. Fabio Shearer, uh, 68 seconds or 69 seconds to the good ahead of the second place car. Just out of pits and would yeah. have benefited from that. So uh, that's uh, pit stop under yeah, full course yellow. But did they? Because they left it very late to come in. Was all their pit stop done under full course yellow? I'm not sure it Whatever was. Whatever they did, they're going to have benefited, ben yeah. benefited from it. But it's uh, under a uh, minute and 10 seconds now. Alan? And it's also under investigation as well from a previous pit stop yes. unsafe release. Yes. And so they have probably will need to just to try to make sure they've got that minute lead just in case a penalty does come their way. Indeed. So 
Camus Kobayashi under 14 seconds, 13.9 seconds ahead of Mathieu oh. Vazivies. Was that a big lock up there Ooh. into La Source? Uh, with a further 23 seconds back to Kazuki Nakajima, the top three Toyota, Alpine, Toyota, 36.8 seconds with two hours and 14 minutes remaining in this race. This is for position, isn't it? Yep, the orange second, and black T-Drive car is Franco Colapinto, he's second, and Davidson for Jota is in third. And it was, I uh, think it was a GT-class Porsche ahead. Oh, well, it wasn't, that's a pro to, that's the high-class car in front. Jan Magnussen, father of Kevin. This is the way he obviously Kev's dad. But it, in fact, now it's grandfather of. Oh, I can't remember what Kevin's new baby daughter is called. So he's he's been he's been elevated a, a step. I would still think of him as the most successful British Formula Three driver ever. Yeah. Multiple Le Mans winner, multiple American Le Mans series winner, yeah. and uh, all round one of the leading hotshots of uh, the Danish resurgence in motorsport. He was also good enough to... Well, I had a chat with Jan earlier this week, and good enough to say that he would be celebrating the end of Oliver Gavin's career, his long-time co-driver, of course, of Corvette Racing, by waving to him every time he passed him. By well, using both <laughs> fingers. <laughs> well, at least he can retire that uh, voodoo doll that he's used all these years as well. Five Ooh. seconds added to the next pit stops of cars number eight. Toyota Kazu Racing, Kazuki Nakajima, and 22, the leading United Autosports uh, LMP2 of Fabio Shearer for unra unsafe release and blocking a competitor. It's almost a get-out-of-jail-free card, that. From, that, that, uh, that I think they're lucky it's that, not a drive-through, to be honest with you. Yeah, but we still also have that uh, investigation uh, coming up, I would think, over the uh, Jose Maria Lopez and Richard Leitz incident coming into this corner. Yep. Which seems to have caused the right rear puncture on that Porsche. So, fastest first sector of the race for the number seven Toyota. They're getting a hurry up on at the moment. That is their sector, though. Remember, sector one and sector three, three are the Toyota sectors. Sector two is actually the LMP2 sector. It is. But uh, at the same time, uh, Mathieu Vaxivier has been pretty blindingly quick down through there as well. Sort of stabilised a little bit in the performances between them right now. But at the end, right as we stand, uh, the top three are covered by 30 to 7 seconds. Well, I'm watching all sorts of social media when it's behaving, whether or not it be Twitter, whether or not it be a couple of the... Uh, the chat rooms, and there's a very, how can I put this, active Discord server at the moment on this race, and it's fair to say the fan base around the world is very pleasantly surprised by the quality of racing by the 2021 World Endurance Championship. Good afternoon, everybody, tuning in, listening in, watching in, typing in from around the world. Uh, this has been quite a start to the season, Martin Hagen. Well, I would always say don't be surprised to see great races at tracks like Spa and Monza. They're not legendary race circuits just because they've been around a long while. They're legendary race circuits. They, they produce fantastic racing. Absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say out loud here, I'm not a massive fan of racing at Silverstone, but I've never seen a bad uh, endurance race there. It's, yeah. It does produce fantastic racing. It always has. I mean, from going in the in the very late 90s, 70s, rather early 80s to Silverstone to watch the six-hour race, there's, it's always been full of fascination. Watching here a car on its own. This is Rahel Frey in the uh, Iron Dames Ferrari. This is a GTE AM class car run by Iron Lynx. Now, because of the pit stops, they have dropped way back down the order. This car was, was in third place. Yeah, that was Rahel handing it back to the bronze driver to... Uh, Manuel Agosna. Yes, indeed. So Rahel is now back out and back into now, spirited are, mode. Are they out of sync with the stops? Uh, because that's a long way back from where I imagined it to be. Meanwhile, Tatiana Calderon in the other all-female crude car. This is her second time in the car, I think, in the race. It is. Um, 13th place, 10th in LMP2. And again, as at Le Mans last year, the game plan for this car was very simple. Keep it on the grey stuff, keep, keep going round, don't hit anything, finish the race. That's, that is Manuel Agosta in the car still, by the way. Oh, if, okay. If my scoreboard is correct. Well, in which case, the, I, th I thought the graphics were That is Catherine Legg. Right, and is Catherine, Catherine is Legg. about to get aboard. And, and what, it's great to see her back. That was a horrible accident at yeah. uh, Paul Ricard last year and some very nasty injuries for Cats. Catherine Legg's second ever race at Spa. Her first was in a Formula Renault car in yeah. her first year of racing. So 
as she did. A couple of Formula Renault Winter Series races, a couple of Formula Renault races, and a couple of Formula 3 races before she went to the States and dominated Toyota Atlantic, winning her first race at Long Beach and then winning the title. And that set her on a pretty stellar US racing career. She's racing in the IMSA Sports Car Championship this year as well, as combining it with the GTEM drive in the World Endurance Championship. So she has got a very busy portfolio for 2021 of endurance racing. And all of it will be in female crewed cars, driving the Earl Bamber Racing Porsche with Christina Nielsen in the WeatherTech Sports Car Series. And driving for the Iron Dames here. So here's the Chota Sport car van Davidson, still closing in on the G-Drive car, up behind the Corvette of Ollie Gavin. Gav saying this is a very different beast from the old Corvette. It's got a, a whole lot better balance, better aero, and kinder on its tyres, lives longer, uh, and it's a little bit less tinnitus providing as well for drivers and fans alone. He said it's too late for me, but it'll save the next generation of drivers. Uh, big push on pace at the moment from Kamubi Kobayashi down into the 205s and putting three seconds on Mathieu Vazavier last time around that gap goes up to nearly 24 seconds Toyota absolutely know they've got a fight on their hands here yeah no and question they, at all and absolutely if they win this race they've had to earn it it has not been uh, simple nor straightforward for the new Toyotas this and the, week and in this race. And it's by no means guaranteed that the overall podium will be all hypercar either. You know, with two brand new cars that have never raced before, one which had not turned a wheel before Monday and has had mechanical problems. Significant mechanical problems. It's not beyond the bounds of possibility. This is 22's release. Look stage left, and there you go. Well, and indeed, that car did have to slow down. That's unacceptable. And I think at that moment, United Auto Sports will have known something was coming their way. Yep. It's not a disaster. It is going to be five seconds added on to their next pit stop. And it's a fractional judgment as yep. well by the lollipop man to go, yeah, you've got room, go, go, go. Yep. You have to judge what 80 kilometers an hour is going to do as, as the other car's coming towards you. And that's 50 miles an hour. That's, you know, it's not easy to judge the closing distance in that speed and how quickly your driver will get off the apron as well. Yeah. Um, looking up and down the order here, a shout out here for the leading car in GTM, AF Course's 83 car. This is the championship defending car with the new driver. Before we get to that though, we will be going down to Lou in the pits. She's at Jota Sports and uh, with Antonio Felix da Costa from the number 38 Horica. Antonio, I just need to pull your eyes away from the screens because it's getting very close for Ants out there with the G-Drive. Yeah, um, really exciting races, to, to be honest, super exciting. Um, we lost a little bit of time in the beginning, got stuck behind some, some slower cars, but uh, we're coming back nicely. Uh, the crew is doing an amazing job in the, every pit stop. Uh, we're chunking some time away from the guys. We're now running third, super close to the 26. Um, yeah, the United car, they're, they're a step ahead uh, this weekend. They've looked super strong all weekend. But, um, yeah, it's going to be a long season. Um, and we're, yeah, we're definitely stronger than last year. So we, we want to take the fight up to them. You are looking more competitive out there. Are you getting more from your tyres? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, we ran the good years last year and we lear learned a lot about the tyre. It's not exactly the same tyre. And to be fair to the other guys, they've done... They've done a good job understanding it, but we, I still think we, on race pace, we might have, have an edge as a driver to, to, to know these cars. You know, all these guys, they're, they're awesome drivers and they're quick learners, so that edge is not going to be there forever. I, I spoke to Ferdy Hasberg. He had a few choice words in Ferdy? the nicest possible way. Yes, <laughs> that was I, great I to some, watch. I have some for him as well. I'm sure you do. I mean, I, mean, I love Ferdy. We, we're really good friends. And, uh, but I, I was not expecting him to go around the outside at Rouge. So, you know, I'm getting old. I don't like that stuff anymore. <laughs> oh, the experience that came through, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. I love a bit of banter. It's 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 great when the racing spirit just gets gets bubbling up and um, 
Yeah, we're enjoying that. The booth as much as I'm sure you're enjoying that at home. Yeah, he was saying he was getting old the other day. I've heard that line from him before. Yeah, but yeah. when he says he's getting old, I think it's early 30s. <laughs> <laughs> I said to mate, you've got a little bit to go, don't worry. Oh, dear me. Kamui Kobayashi still in the Tour of Fires, by the way, and still pulling away from Mathieu Vazivier. Interestingly, though, the number eight is not catching the second place Dalpine. The gap there, 17 seconds. I think that's growing, isn't it? It's, it's ebbing and flowing a little, but it's not. This gap's growing between Vaxavi and Kobayashi, definitely. Yep. And uh, Kobayashi, we heard, remember, on one stint tyre. Yep. It was uh, the right-hand side was the quali set, the left-hand side was oh. new set. Oh. And that's the race leader in LMP2, just doing a bit of uh, rally cross. Rally cross circuit here at Spires, down at the bottom of the <laughs> right. not at the top. And, Going up the Kemmel straight. Well, it actually goes up through Radion, turns around and comes back. So he was partly still on it. He was partly still on it, but I'm sure... But, Heading uh, in the wrong direction. You know, <laughs> I've never seen a rally cross car with that low of <laughs> right height on it. <laughs> did, see, like tires. did see what looked like something falling off that United car as it came through the rough and tumble bits. Probably O'Shara from uh, DTM last year with, oddly enough, with WRT. Yeah, he was teammates with Ferdy Hatsburg. That could give us some interesting moments later in the year, couldn't it? I think that uh, they're both obviously making their way through. United are still though, in a comfortable position, one minute and 11 seconds. Uh, they've got a five second hold at the next pit stop, so they will have to hold for five seconds and then they can work on the car due to an unsafe release at the previous pit stop. And that's also the same for the number eight of Toyota Gazoo Racing for Kazuki Nakajima as point, well. Point I was going to make before we had uh, the interview down with Antonio Felix de Costa was to point uh, your attention to the form and the speed of Alessio Rivera leading the race in GTM, the 83 AF Corsa car, who is all over the back end of Jimmy Bruni. Uh, in the GT Pro 91, we saw the, the point you made at the start of the race, Martin, is that uh, the GT Pros and GT Ams could get uh, pretty close at certain points here. Well, you say he's all over the back of him. He is seven tenths of a second behind the all pro car of Jimmy Bruni. Yep. So you're absolutely right. Unless you're Rivera, not a driver I've commentated on before, not a driver I've seen racing in junior categories, but he's definitely a driver I'm going to be watching an awful lot he's, more closely. He is absolutely one to watch. There's one or two of them uh, in the GTM class, as there often are in these days. But uh, cracking stuff from Alessio Rivera, a great pick from the 83 crew to bolster their efforts in pushing forward for the uh, uh, retaining their title. Was that uh, TV crew interviewing a recently retired racing driver? Well, I think Oli Gavin has just stepped out of a race car, possibly for the final time. This is hypermotion, slow-mo of Antonio Felix, uh, Antonio Felix de Costa, Antonio Garcia running around to open the door to let Oli out. We have got two hours to go, but I think basically the, the plan was for Antonio to do two hours at the beginning. It was. And two hours at the end, it and was. Ollie to do two hours at the middle. So they're being, you know, they're being nice to the old guy. They're getting the, getting the youngster in, 40-year-old Antonio Felix da Costa, the whippersnapper. It's not that Antonio Garcia, rather. He might be getting the bill for parking for this Corvette <laughs> road car. Um, can we say it again? Thank you, Ollie Gavin, for all the entertainment over the last 20 years. We did say this a few, by the way, Alan, when you retired as well. You probably didn't hear of that either. Well, I but just... You didn't know I'd retired. I announced it after I'd finished. Oh, we probably didn't then. Um, okay. I, yeah, we, we wouldn't anyway. I, I'd like to thank Ollie Gavin for my first ever race suit. Really? Yeah, when I, I bought my Mini 7 turned up at Silverstone on a test day, I was in a, a Coca-Cola Opal DTM race suit. Yes. Must not mention race suits, Alan McNish and, and Martin Haven. Must not, must not. What's that? Well, you couldn't have borrowed one from Al, could you? Let's face it. I could. A bit of shorts. Couldn't have worn it. <laughs> well, I could have borrowed it. But yeah. So no, it, 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 you know, he's been around all, almost all my commentary career. Yep. So I've, I've talked to, on Ollie Gavin in, in Opel Lotus, in Formula 3000, in F3, mm -hmm. in and in countless sports car races. And he's been such a mainstay in Corvette racing. But, you know, now the guys that, that came in at the beginning of the noughties with the programme, you know, the likes of him, Johnny O, uh, Ron Fellows, you know, Danny Binks. 
Doug know, Feehan. Yeah, Doug Feehan. You know, there, there's a, been a big change in the guard. Uh, Andy Booker, I mean, so many of those guys uh, came in in the prime of their career, but it was two decades ago, and, and you know, the young guys are, are, the, are the future. You know, the, the Tommy Mill... When, when Gav started racing for the team, Tommy Mill was about six. Yeah. Literally, you know, trailing around in short, in short pants behind his dad uh, in the paddock. So... You know, and he shares cars with him, and, and the Taylor and the Taylor brothers as well. You know, they were kids in primary school. Important to add, by the way, I mean, spent quite a lot of time with Ollie over the last few weeks and months, uh, for various reasons. He's very happy with his choices moving forward, and that's delightful. That's yep. great to hear that uh, he's got something he's genuinely enthused by. And uh, yes, he has 12 Corvette C8s on order. <laughs> <laughs> Not just to, to line up in the driveway. This is for the Holly Gavin Driving Academy. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it will be sad not to see him in a race car. But again, like Alan, it means we get to see probably a lot more of him than, than ever Ooh. we would do. Well, OK. That's a little wild there from Kamui Kobayashi. Number seven car survives a tiny bit of rally cross. But let's get down and hear from the man himself. We've bigged him up. Let's see if Louise can knock him down a peg. Ollie Gavin stepping out of the Corvette for the final time. I'm getting emotional just <laughs> saying it, so I cannot even begin to think how you feel. Yeah, it's been uh, quite a day, really. Um, I mean, I, I kind of went through all of this when I was at Sebring with the, the, my final race there with IMSA, but. It has brought a lot of those emotions back today and the, certainly the last few laps there, I was just driving around, I was thinking about everything that's happened and you know all of the 20 years that I've spent with this team, the success we've all had together. Um, just so proud of what the team has been able to do, what we've done with the four generations of Corvette, what the races that we've won. Um, and to be able to finish it here in, at Spa in the WEC is very, very special. Such a great race, such a great track. Um, and you can really feel the, for me anyway, the, the, the character of the charisma of the race, the character of the track. It's all the things that I fell in love with when I first went to Le Mans, the very first year that I went there. Uh, it was very, uh, it just drew me in and uh, I've loved competing there all the, all the years that I've competed at Le Mans and I've been fortunate enough to, to compete there 18 times with Le Mans, uh, with Corvette and, and uh, win five times and I feel very, very fortunate. Yeah, and we've loved watching you, I have to say. Uh, but your career in motorsports is not going to end, is it? No, no. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to go off and I'm going to set up uh, my Oliver Gavin Driving Academy. And uh, with that, I've got 12 European spec Corvette Stingrays on order. And I'm going to start showing the people that come to that the passion of driving a Corvette. And, and what it's like to, to learn how to drive one of those cars quickly and on the limit. And, at racetracks or improving grounds. And also I want to bring them to races like this and experience that emotion and try and get those people, you know, from the road car to what we're doing here with the racing program. It's all of that that I'm trying to do. It just, it's, I think I find it very emotional and I think if I could give some of that to some of the customers then I'll, I would have, I hopefully succeeded. Couldn't be a better person to do that. Alan McNish has just said congratulations thanks, from Alan. him. Thanks, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Okay, thanks very much. Well done. Thank you. Well, we lose a racing driver of a proper height, but we will very oh, like... Oh, 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 Toyota, which one? Eight or seven? It's eight. One of the two. <laughs> and it's off. Now, where is that? Well, we just saw the G-Drive. That's Kobayashi. La Source. That's a leader. That's a race leader. That's number seven. That is La Source, surely. He's gone straight on. No, it's no, it's not. Here, it's a cat. Oh, it's way, it's way too Whoa! quick. Oh, he was on the curbs. Yeah, yeah. Has he got a puncture? No, no, he's not. He got on the curbs and then. What was it? Yeah, he just locked up. He was, remember, he was on a big, big push. His last lap oh. was a really quick lap, a 205.980. I don't know, can we try and to go stuck. forward? Can be a real one? I don't know. Look at the banner Toyota Gazoo Racing. Yikes. Alpine lead. Uh, just before we saw that, by the way. Uh, the Try again, can we? You can hear the gravel rattling as he spins the wheels in reverse. No, he That's can't. it. He needs to be pulled out of there. The issue he had was he tried to turn the car. Yeah. If he had been. Oh.
Et bah, il va faire un Well, that saves Eduardo telling us 45 seconds to full course yellow. They will need to snatch that out of the gravel. And unfortunately for the number seven team, that is their hopes of winning this race. Very likely dashed. However, if it can happen to them, it can happen to anyone. It's the eight that's got the five second penalty, isn't it? Yes. At their next stop. Yes. So the effective lead at the moment is 21 seconds. And of course, the gap between eight and the leading LMP2 car, number 22, won't change because they too have a five second penalty. So that remains the same. But as the Toyota is going to lose a lap or two, that then brings an overall podium within reach of the LMP2 leader, whoever that might be. Front are breaking and the rears are still excel uh, still tough. <laughs> a little bit odd actually on that last week. But... He's shunting it down the gearbox. Is he yeah, trying yeah. to use the gears to stop it as well? Yeah, you you definitely go yeah. down the gears, there's no question. And was and was he losing a little bit of aero behind that P2 car? Is that, is that, the pits. that Jim is in the pits. Did that top the balance under full course yellow? Yep. Now they're going to go for their short fill. Yeah, but now you backtrack towards the end of the race. Yes, exactly. See what you needed to do. And back out. So we've got two hours to go of this race, uh, and therefore that is roughly for the lead car. Uh, being Mathieu Vaxivier, it's two and a half stints. Yep. And for the Toyota of Nakajima, he's just said to come into the pits there. Yes, yep. Then he will do 25, two and a two stints and three laps. Right, so that's what they've done. They short filled him for those three laps because you don't have to do 35 seconds if it's not the end of a full stint. This is like the final hour of the Nürburgring 24 hours where you need Paul Trusswell and his slide rule brain to, to work it out. But that's what they've done. They have they have ruled out having to do a short stint. He's put a lap on him. Or a 35, a 35 second stint for short field. Now the real question is, does the United car go by him? Okay, Mathieu, we are P1 of the race. P1 of the race. It was 37. Stay focused, stay focused. <laughs> It doesn't sound to me like there was the... <laughs> I think the pitch was quite excited yes, there as well. Stay focused! <laughs> <laughs> but it's natural. It to get of course. It, it energy, especially when you're coming to this point, the, the adrenaline surging through your veins. The engineering station on the pit wall, there at pit stops, their heartbeat goes up to about 120, oh, 130 wow. beats per minute. Oh, wow. And that's only sitting watching. And so, therefore, in this situation, then it increases. And there you see the United car, which is fourth overall, leading in LMP2, about to... And that's actually for position, believe it or it not. Will. So yep. when the Toyota comes into the pits, the seven goes into the pits with Kobayashi, then he is going to also uh, lose that third place to United. Which is, or does the United car just get a lap back? No, because... No, because they Gaz are on the same lap. The they lap. are on yep. the same lap. Yes, yes, yep. yes. It's 2.78 seconds is the difference. You know, we said it must have been an hour ago, back onto the lead lap for the United car uh, with the pit stop cycle. They could not afford uh, an issue like that for overall position. On board with Fabio Scherer. There is the Toyota in front of him. That is the battle for the final podium spot with an hour and 50 minutes to go. On pace, TGR should hold it. On pace, if they don't lose more than a lap in the pits, they should be able to get it back. Is he going to pit? Oh, he's front tires. Yeah, he's must front be tires. He's, he's going to have square tires. Yeah. Income 26, Franco Colapinto at T Drive and Ant Davidson as well in Mighty 38. They are both parked on the pit lane. So is Miguel Molina. So is Marcos Gomez in the 98 Aston. And he's done a stint and then Dalalana did a stint. He's done another stint. Giancarlo Fisichella in the 54A of Corsa car. So 26 and 38 stopping together. Out has gone Loic Duval for real team. Out has gone Rui Andrade in a 25 G drive car. Out sure. has gone Kevin Escher, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, Miguel Molina. They're the top three in GTE Pro. And Jimmy Bruni. The Corvette had only just recently stopped. Uh, should add, by the way, the uh, other point just before the incident for the number seven. 
Uh, there was an instance at La Source, which yep. saw the 25 turn around. Well, he, he nosed it up into the wall, trying to spin turn the car. He didn't move the full John Lacey spin turn, and that was the problem, because um, he didn't want to snap the half shafts. But uh, Rui Anjad got it out of the barriers and came back. Chicken. And he was fully on the kerbs, wasn't he? He wasn't just touching the kerbs. He had two wheels up on the kerb there. But Alan was right. He was on an absolute charge to try yep. to gap yep. the, uh, the Alpine. Alpine now back into the lead for what I think is the yep. fourth time in this race. He ain't coming in. 30 seconds to remove full course yellow. If you come in, you surrender everything. Now, obviously, he's not at speed, but he can still feel how threatening bit they are. Well, we're going to see, aren't we? Because he's got a he's got a quick car behind him in that uh, P2 leading car. Yeah, but he doesn't want to introduce two pit stops. I think that'll be yeah. the thing for them. Kobayashi's Nine, done 13 laps. Eight, if he does two more, seven, then he's clean to the end six, with consistent pit stops. Five, stop. four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed, full course yellow removed. Green, 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 back to green flag racing. Well, it, it took four hours before we had even a hint of a caution. Graham mentioned that, and now suddenly we've had two in short order, but for entirely unrelated incidents. Although, in fact, they weren't. They were both as a legacy of the number seven Toyota. So one was for hitting a Porsche that caused a puncture that caused debris, and the second one was the number seven car going off. Now, Toyota have an issue with this hypercar, under braking, we've seen both cars go off under braking in a straight line while not under pressure, and hit cars under braking while not under pressure. Remember, this is for position. This yep. is United 22 into its happy, happy, happier hunting ground here <laughs> yes. in the uh, the middle sector. This is where, through the whole week, we've seen the, the uh, P2 cars stronger than the hyper cars. Yeah, he needs to, Kobayashi here needs to stay out for two laps and then he can have two equal stints of 25 laps to the end of the race. If he comes in now, then he'll have an extra additional stop. So this is hanging on. And obviously it's not very nice. You can see the, by the fact that uh, he's, he's sort of hanging on there, literally, to make sure that uh, we've got Shida staying behind him. He doesn't want to make a mistake and be off again, does he? We've also, by the way, got a great battle underway for second position in LMP2 with Franco Colapinto out after uh, his latest pin stop in the 26 car, just four seconds ahead of Ant Davidson, 2014 world champion, let's not forget, in the Jota 38. I think that might be a bigger gap than there was before. Meanwhile, let's hear from Alpine's Mathieu Vassivier in the lead. Maybe a car losing oil. 26, in front of you, maybe a car losing oil. Take care with oil and tire pressure. Take care. OK, well, there is the Alpine. And they're saying maybe 26 in front of you is losing oil. This is obviously complaining maybe about a, a loose front end. Why are they catching the 36? Well, that's because he's complaining about a loose front oh. end. Now, this is a real problem for the Toyota, though, isn't it? No, this is a problem for the Alpine. And the United, well, it is, but the United car has just run very wide there at La Source as well. The Toyota's trying to fight a way back, get back on the lead lap. You're not going to win if you're not on the lead lap. But you look at the front of the Alpine, it's really had a bit of a head shake there, going down into the depression at compression at Eau Rouge. And now the hybrid drive of the Toyota can't get close. He's trying to clean off those tyres. BNU, Toyota, we are not fighting with them. One last BNS. Just confirmation, but I think you're right there. He's struggling after that full course yellow to clean the tire up and get it up to pressure. Now he's done 13 laps on that particular run, but remember before it there was also a full course yellow. Yeah. So he's done 14 laps, then a 13 laps, and uh, be getting quite struggling to sort of generate it. But the Toyota behind him being Kobayashi, one lap behind, is uh, still trying to sort of fight his way back. Okay, the gap to the second-placed car, it's not the Toyota, as Alan says, right behind the 36, it's the eight car. 22 seconds is the gap, the lap uh, gap, 207.9 for that last Toyota lap. Let's go down to pit lane, where Andre de Grau, earlier out of the 36 car, is with Louise Beckett. Andre, extremely tense times now. I mean, what is going through yours? The 
teams' minds? What's been said about pit stops, tyres, everything at this point? Yeah, so we have one more set of new tyres to put it, to put on. Uh, actually, for the Fukurcial, we gain a little bit for the end of the race between us and Toyota now. So yeah, it should be it should be complicated. They are quite fast, and between the pit stops, so they stop uh, two laps in front of us every time. So yeah, it's kind of. We have to try to go fast as soon as possible for the end of the race, but it should be really tight. Do you think you can do it? It's hard to say now, yeah, finger crossed, I, I hope so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Word from Andre there about why the front end of the car is struggling, but it is struggling still, isn't it? Well, you saw that big, huge bit of pickup just flying off the left-hand side of the car there as the Toyota Kobayashi goes back through into uh, that third place. Well, he still stays in third place, but puts himself back onto yeah. onto the lead lap. 22 and a half seconds. So the what what's not happening here? is the Alpine is not being caught by you know, Nakajima, certainly not that last lap, not by uh, not, very much. Not pulling away, no, uh, it's... but he's not being caught by much, you're right. United Autosport, Autosports, Fabio Scherer, 2.10 last lap, but fastest lap of the race for a Tom Blomqvist in fourth in the 28 Jota car, 2 minutes 6.8 on the last lap, and he set another personal best but he just came out of the pit, so I presume that's a brand new set of tyres. He's not cleaning the tyres up from yeah. uh, actually the full course yellow. It's a new set on and then go. Yep. So there's uh, small gaps all the way down through that uh, top four or five. Job van Oetert, by the way, took over the racing team Nederland car at their last stop. So he is now in fifth ahead of Renge van der Zander, his compatriot in sixth for Inter Europol. Fourth, Tom Blomqvist, third, and Davidson for Jota. Still second, 26, G-Drive. They never have a straightforward race here. Whatever they're racing in, World Endurance or ELMS, there's always a tail. But Franco Colapinto is second in LMP2 behind United Autosports. And I need to save every tire for it, or just the right side. We should save everything. We should save everything. <laughs> Yeah, you're 20 seconds ahead, Alessandro Pierre, Guidi in the AF Corsa car, Kevin Estra, so therefore you've got a little bit of margin because 20 seconds in GT Pro is like a lifetime in most categories. And so therefore a little bit of saving. Remember, they've had three right rear punctures for different reasons. One of them was debris, one not really sure about, and uh, the other one was definitely incident damage from the Toyota of Jose Maria Lopez. And so they'll be a little bit nervous about uh, not just the left-hand side, which takes the abuse, but that right rear as well. Great news, by the way, that we can expect a further season from both the, uh, the Porsche and the Ferrari factory teams in the FI World Endurance Championship and GT Pro. It just extends the life of this class uh, closer to the point where the cavalry arrive in hypercar. Multiple teams already declared, and as we've said previously this week, more to come. It's exciting times in sports car racing, and you know, from what I think most of us believed, gentlemen, was a firm transitional year. This shows well for what we've got to come for this year. This has been engaging stuff. Lead gap coming down a little last time. 20.1 seconds now. Mathieu Vazavier against uh, Kazuki Nakajima. And how many prior to this race would have predicted this? Tota trying to chase down the Alpine. United yeah. Autosports dominant at the moment in LMP2, ahead of Franco Colapinto's 26 G-Drive racing car, who's still got uh, Ant Davidson pretty close behind, but the young Argentinian is fending that uh, that attack off. Franco Colapinto, born in 2003. What was Ant Davidson doing in 2003? Well, he Thank raced you, at Le Mans with Velox and Pro Drive <laughs> in a 5, 5, 550 Maranello. He raced in the American Le Mans series at Sebring and Petit Le Mans for Velox Pro Drive in a 550 Maranello. 2002, he was in Formula One with Minardi. 2003, he was a Lucky Strike BAR test driver. Which year did he do his one touring car race to get uh, to Macau? Oh, OK. Uh, what I'm trying to say way? is that Colapinto is very, very young. Yeah, and 17 was, years old. And, uh, and was testing F1 before Franco Colapinto was thought of. 
Well, you don't know how long a, a kind of imagination his parents had, but I'll mean, <laughs> take your point. Well, there might have been some practice laps being put in, but uh, he definitely hadn't arrived by that stage. So, and, and that's one of the joys, you know, we talked about this earlier, sports car racing, cars that sound different, that look different, that perform in different ways, even in the same class. A Ferrari and a Porsche and a Corvette make their speed in different ways in different parts of the car. And you've got kids and veterans, you know, when Cooper McNeil came to Le Mans, he was 16, he was the youngest driver ever to start the race. And in that race, the oldest driver was Matt McMurray, you're thinking of. Eight. Matt McMurray. So, I mean, that's what we're looking at. That is a broad church. And, yeah, and so, Absolutely. And so people are going, well, hypercar, that's just sort of an open invitation to design anything you like. Yeah, that's sports car racing. Well, I mean, yeah, we, we've talked about balance of performance because that's coming and it's here in the top class. And there are those that accept, and there's those that don't like it, but a lot of people that don't like it also really love GT Pro, and that is a balance of performance. <laughs> uh, that's a balance of performance class, and has been for a while. And when you get it right, it's astonishing. Well, there's only two ways of having a level playing field. Version one, everybody has the same car, same engine, same tyres. Version two, you balance out apples, oranges, pears, bananas, and kiwi fruit, and that's what sports car racing, endurance racing does. And balance of performance, you know, if you don't like it, then Explain another way, you're going to get 26 cars qualifying within a second yep. for the Spa 24 hours. And what it gives you is it gives you variety. It gives you, you know, it gives you a depth of grid that otherwise you would struggle to get. Yep. It keeps teams, manufacturers, all sorts of enterprises interested in the fact that they've got a chance at competing and competing well. And that's why this is going to be about not just the factories that are coming to Hypercar, but the customer teams as well that are going to be looking to get their hands on one of those cars. And then we're in a real golden era. Well, now what we need is a manufacturer like Porsche did in the Group C era to sell cars to all comers and say, OK, bring it on. We can beat you, we're better. Absolutely. You know, and that, you know, the Group C era, if they'd only been the two Rothmans Porsche cars, the two Lancia Martinis and the odd straggler, the old, old, old outlier, would it have been a golden era? It wouldn't have. Well, but here, we've got the opportunity here for manufacturers to produce a car and for other people to race it with them. Here's the thing. If even half of what I understand to be coming is coming, we've got multiple manufacturers that are prepared to do exactly that. And that's really exciting. Well, looking there at Catherine Legg, there's Rahel Frey in the back of the garage, the uh, Swiss driver of that Iron Dames car. And it's great to have six female drivers on the grid. And, and yeah, part of why women in motorsport is so important to the FIA and, and to, to, to motor racing particularly, uh, only around 5% of all motorsport competitors, so license holders and competitors, are female. Now, lots and lots of girls have probably never seen a, a woman race a car and probably have no idea that it even happens. And that's what this is doing. It is, if you don't see it, you don't believe you can be it. If you Absolutely. see women racing, then you go, oh, that's the thing that girls can do? Wow, that's fantastic. You know, and, it, and it's like Lena Gade in the Audi team. So many young women who want a STEM career, who want an engineering career, Look at a woman like that, running a car that can win a race like them on, and they go, that's what I want to do. You will barely find a crew down this pit lane nowadays that hasn't got female engineers and mechanics on board. And they are absolutely as focused and as gripped by the, the reality of the task uh, as anybody else in that pit lane. And it is an absolute joy. It, it's an absolute joy. There were no downsides to this whatsoever. And this isn't tennis or golf or cricket or soccer where physical strength is a defining factor. Endurance is a defining factor, mental and physical. And that's not where the male body works better than the female body. The women can do it just as well. They just need the break. And that's what they're getting with Richard Mille with this number one car and also with the with the Iron Dames program in the European Le Mans series and here in the World Championship for the first time they are getting that massive opportunity to shine and to be shown in the spotlight and to inspire and motivate and just prove that it's possible as we're saying that uh, I think 
leading back into it. We were watching for quite a long time the Richard Mille racing car, Tatiana Calderon, at the wheel of that car at the moment. Uh, she's got a tremendous amount of it experience now of very high powered high downforce cars and information bringing... to the pit lane information to the pit lane Stewart's decision number 37 gives a drive-through penalty on car 7 for the contact with car 91 drive-through penalty car 7 for the contact on car 91 it caused the puncture for the right rear of Richard Leeds yeah days bad one for Kobayashi now just gets worse as he's got that slow drive through the pit lane. Now that was Jose Maria Lopez at the wheel at that particular time. So the time loss is going to be roughly 30 seconds. They still owe us a pit stop on that particular car as well. And so it's going to take them out of real contention. And so then it comes down to Mathieu Vaxivier in the Alpine against the sister car, number eight of Kazuki Nakajima. It's going to do two things. What it's going to do is drop them back off the lead lap. It's going to lose them third place at this point in the race because United Autosports will take third place overall with that drive-through. Not quite so much of a headline, but we now find out whether, why the number 25 G-Drive car was facing the wrong way, because there's been a drive-through penalty for the number 20 high-class car for contact with 25. So that's where that happened. We didn't catch it. We saw the aftermath, but it was at the hairpin at La Source. And so that's a drive-through for the number seven car. And yeah, as Lou said, you know, it never rains, it pours. When your day is bad, it just gets worse. It, it just feels like they're piling on more pressure. And so number seven, they will struggle to make the overall podium, potentially, although we still have 93 minutes of racing left to go. So we've got a full Grand Prix distance still to get through, and that needs to be decided before we can start making those sort of predictions. But they're going to have to push hard to do it now. Uh, United also thought, well, I'm sure, like the opportunity for the potential for what I'm pretty certain would be their first ever overall podium in their FIA WEC race. And what a spectacular return after that amazing 2020 that would be with a win and an overall podium for an LMP2 car. Well, Catherine Legg is drawing attention to herself in race control. She's just been warned for abusing track limits. So she will need to keep an eye on that. Meanwhile, Mathieu Vazivier, our race leader, pour la gloire de la patrie, 120 laps in, and he leads in Spa. Four laps to go, four laps. Finish your tire, four laps to finish your tire. Push on it. Push, 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 <laughs> load that tire, Mathieu. Give it everything you've got, my boy. You're 19 laps into this stint. It's been an average of a 208, which is slightly slower than Kamui Kobayashi, but we know he's out of the game, and it's slightly slower as well than Kazuki Nakajima, but only a couple of tenths of a second. 23 seconds is the gap, and that's been more or less where it's been uh, throughout that stint. And it's great to hear that from uh, from the driver's point of view, the team saying, leave nothing on it, go down to the canvas, give it everything. Andre Nigarau is ready to go. You saw Philip Sino there with the uh, grey hair just in front of him. If he didn't have grey hair before this week, he might have grown a few, but i tell you what, what started out as a, a really trying week for the uh, Alpine Elf Matmut team is actually becoming quite a decent race. Even if the car goes no further than this, it has certainly shown that they are more than capable on pace of taking the race to a giant of the sport like Toyota Gazoo Racing. And for a small team like Senior Tech, it's a really major feather in their cap. Yes, they've got a good piece of kit, but it's as new to them as the Toyota is to, to Toyota Gazoo Racing. Yeah, I'll just maybe remind everybody of Signatech's capabilities, having won the WEC in LMP2, having won Le Mans many yep. times in LMP2, having been a consistent runner and a front runner in LMP2 in everything they have done. So I think it's a step up, definitely, to the hyperclass, but I don't think it's a step too far. It's just a stepping stone on their way to success, and I'm pretty sure they're going to have success here as well. When? We'll have to wait and see. Amongst the other things, by the way, that Signatec do, and uh, further securing their links with the Alpine, uh, Alpine brand, brand, is that they build all of the single-make Alpine Cup cars and the Alpine GT4 cars uh, within their organisation. So there's a very firm link between what is now the sporting brand for Renault and uh, Signatec, uh, Philippe Signor's 
outfits and uh, it's been a, a, just a trail of spectacular success and by the way bringing young talent through with them let's have a listen to what's going on with the number eight tota uh, kazuki nakajima trying to push hard as the number seven car comes down pit lane be the drive through that's the uh, yes so apologies so this will be punishment taken 22 laps as we well. watch for where the United Autosports car is. They go through now and will take third position right there. So uh, LMP2 car, dominant form again here from United Autosports. It's been a fantastic run from them. Stellar stuff, by the way, from uh, Phil Hansen at the start of this race. Fabio Scherer, what a debut he's had to this point. And now they've got 90 minutes to fend off a factory Toyota for a... Yeah, they overall do. podium place but just uh, we do know that Kobayashi also owes us a pit stop because he's done 22 laps in this pit run so he'll do another maybe one or uh, two laps I would say and then he will be able to stop Fabio's must be tuned now as well though yeah Fabio Shido's done 21 laps so I think he'll be in on this lap or maybe the next one with the full course uh, having elongated his stint time a little bit so the gap at the moment between them on track is about seven and a half, eight seconds. You have to say, in terms of the pace that's been available, that looks like it's Tota's position by the time we get to the end of this uh, race, all, all of the things being equal. They're on they equal aren't. stint lengths from now to the end, okay. both cars, so therefore they should be equal to be able to run. So it is going to be a straight race to the end. Ja van Oite making his stop with racing team Nederland. Car Don't. comes in from fifth in LMP2. New tyres, left hand side. Sizable gap to the Jota cars ahead. Goes to uh, all four, so fresh boots. We shouldn't forget, by the way, he currently leads the Pro Am Challenge with that 29 car. Yep. Yeah, Fritz van Aert, we saw who is uh, the Am driver there. He was uh, in early on, second stint. No, it's actually, sorry, the third stint because the first double stint was done by Guido van der Garde. And uh, there we've got the number one Richard Meal racing car with Toy Tatiana Calderon, full service. The other yeah, car, Pierre Flarsch has jumped into that one now. Thank you very much, Louise, in the pit lane that's just been feeding that into my ear. Excellent. He's got, so this is the 33 car. Felipe Fraga is the third driver. Dylan Pereira, the Luxembourgoise, has finished his double stint and of course Ben Keating doing the heavy lifting right from the start of the race so Felipe Fraga he's done quite a lot of uh, AM class racing that car currently in second place but at the moment it's Alessio Rivera how long has he been in the 83 Ferrari and how soon do they have to take him out and put somebody in who needs to do some time behind the wheel uh, if you just give me a second I will be able to tell you the answer to that one well, now United here in the pits. Is the United stop, and they are going to reinsert Philippe Albuquerque. So that will be Fabio Scherer's work done for the afternoon. This yep. car, by the way, holds the ultimate best middle sector of the race, 57.45 seconds to the P2 car. As it did in qualifying. In fact, the did three he? sectors were set by three, the three fast sectors were set by three different cars. Sector one, I think, was Toyota number eight. Sector three, Toyota number seven. And sector two was the 22 United car. It's fair to say through this week, with the prologue test on Monday and Tuesday, with a huge amount of running, and then the race meeting proper from Thursday onwards, there have been, outside of the top class, that for me, gentlemen, have been two standout performers. One in LMP2, and we've been looking at him, Felipe Albuquerque, and the other in GTE Pro, and that's been Kevin Estra. Uh, when, <laughs> yeah. when, we've had, when we've had chips down. Oh, hang on a minute. That's not the way. Well, why was he wriggling through the chicane a little more well, than. Remember, he's the car that's probably losing oil. Franco Colapinto. It, maybe it's just the way we picked it up. It looks like. Oh, that is. This is a standard stop for yep. uh, Mathieu Vaxavier, remember, he was yep. told to push, 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 four laps to go, and he's coming to the end of that. And Just to quickly to answer your question, Rivera has done two hours and 31 minutes in the car. And so, therefore, he's in, and Mathieu, oh, cranky me, he was close to the wall there. He was pushing very, very close to the wall. You have to be careful, because it's easy to sneak that pit entry wall on the right-hand side. And it's now, this is a race leader. To the pits. 
So let's see if Four Rafael, tires and driver. Let's see if Rafael can go much longer than this. Yeah, he's got another hour. He could spend at the wheel, but that then denies somebody their minimum drive time. This is Mathieu Vazivier handing over to Andre Negrau. Negrau started the car. Looks like he will do the final 84 minutes, 85 minutes. Toyota into the lead. Nakajima has now gone into the lead. However, Nakajima does owe us a pit stop as well, so therefore it will switch itself back around again. It's still a handful, isn't it? Down the, through the compression at Eau Rouge, the car's just bouncing around. We saw that in the hyper motion through qualifying, but in the race it is as well. Full set of fresh boots for the Alpine. And Cinetech keeping their favourite number 36 on the car. That's a new deal this year. You can choose your number. I don't think you can You can choose number one, of course, because that's exactly what Richard Mille did. You don't have to be the champion. Uh, you can choose a favourite number, and that's why Ferrari, for instance, has gone from 51 and 71 to 51 and 52. You can choose any number between zero and triple nine. Yeah. And uh, you can use whatever font you want as well. The, the base plate has to be the class plate number. The only other factor that comes into place is if someone else wants a number, you have to pay for it. You have to argue. Do you have to is it like rock, paper, scissors to decide who gets it or I think it's a I think it's a fight to the death. <laughs> Dollars, euros, sterling. Excellent. So Toyota staying with seven and eight. Just a little bit of information as well. We saw that uh, the WRT car was in the pits with a clutch issue. Turns out that it was a release bearing that was actually the cause, and okay. they're now refitting the airbox in the floor and looking to go back out again. Good for them. It's, uh, they're going to need the practice. Well, we've, already exactly. we've already seen how well oh. hammer and tongs this is. You learn nothing by sitting in the pits. You learn a lot more by the car going round. Even if it's 10 laps off the pace, it's still going absolutely flacking f uh, through traffic and, you know, up and down the hills and round down Dale. It, racing is the best testing you can get, which is why manufacturers do it so often. 22 car pushes on now, Philippe Albuquerque, on his first flying lap of this stint. And the gap back to Colapinto is only 15 seconds at the moment, but we have to remember Colapinto does still owe us a pit stop as well. And in fact, actually, the gap is growing sector by sector, so Felipe is pushing hard. Franco Colapinto, the Argentine, in second place. And he is still just about five seconds ahead of Ant Davidson in third in the Jota Sport car. Let's get down to here from Tatiana Calderon at the Richard Mill Racing Team. Tatiana, bringing the number one in. How was that stint for you? Well, it was uh, pretty tough. Um, to be honest, uh, first first proper stint with the new configuration of car. A few full course yellow. It's, it's quite cold, so it was tricky on the restarts. But uh, I think we are learning every time on track, and hopefully, you know. No, everything can happen and we can uh, reach the top 10. Uh, I'd like to say it's lovely to see you and welcome to WEC. It's great to have you here in this championship. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing experience for us. A uh, big thank you to the Rich Army Racing Team for this opportunity and to race against one of the best drivers in the world. This uh, championship is, uh, is very tough. Uh, how do you feel, you're an ambassador for women in motorsport, so how do you feel, uh, how important it is to have the two crews that we've got here? Oh, it's, uh, it's incredible, uh, the, the work of the commission uh, to have two full female lineups here, um, it's, it's incredible. This is uh, the highest level of endurance racing and I think we have to show the world as well, this is another route. Um, and a lot of girls coming um, in, in the junior category. So I hope that we can be or oh, inspire uh, the next generation. I'm super happy to have their support here as well with Michelle Muto, who's, who came to, to support us in this first race. Great. Well, as I say, it's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was about to say, actually, Michelle Mouton was here. She's the uh, leading light of the FIA's Women in Motorsport Commission. And uh, it's been part of her remit to try and get more and more women racing, competing, not just racing, rallying, rally crossing. Because, of course, she was very nearly world rally champion in the Group B era. She's a multiple rally winner in Group B Audis in the time when 
physical strength really was a very major part of wrestling those cars around, but it's great to have her around as, a, as an ambassador for the Women in Motorsport program. And lest we forget, uh, Michelle, uh, also a class winner at the Le Mans 24 Hours, 1975. Yes, in the, the what was it again? Oh, no, yeah, Moine. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's one that we've never heard of. But With if, a Simca engine. If you are a, a fan of uh, Michel Vaillant, it's the sort of sports car yes. that a Michel Vaillant would probably have run. I'm, I'm trying to think of a of a British equivalent. I can't really. It's not. It doesn't look like kind of a, No, not really, because they were never that rounded at the back. You know, it's all that. There's no cam tail to it or anything. And, I'll come back to you on that. I'll, I'll deep put a, Sanderson. I, I will. I will put a picture up a, a, on Twitter. A deep Sanderson, and, but uh, a little bit more up to date. Yeah. But uh, Michelle, very focused indeed on the opportunities that await for women in motorsport. You're watching, by the way, on board the number seven car, chasing along with Kamu Kobayashi. But uh, realistically, the game is up. I think now. Just before we heard from Tatiana Calderon, we were looking on our screens to say that the number 26 G drive car yeah. being shown a black and orange flag for losing oil on track, and Franco Colapinto is in the pits. This is, it was when he was due to be stopping pretty much, but it's that losing oil thing. That's the worrying issue. And we heard, didn't we, after the second full course yellow, the senior tech team were suggesting that the car was struggling at the front because the 26 in front of them was losing oil. As this car's in the pit, so is Kamui Kobayashi in the Toyota as well, but I think Toyota's is going to be a normal pit stop. However, for uh, the G-Drive, it looks like it's going to be a little bit more serious. They're not going to change that nose section, are they? No. Well, they haven't changed it in five, no, quite right. five pit stops up till now. I wouldn't think yep. they're going to do it now. Remember, when the eight car stops, they will have that five seconds to add. They've not had a pit stop, have they, since that uh, judgment was levied? So there will be five seconds, I think I'm right, for that eight. Yes, yes. they've got a few laps to go. They can now start to look at how they run the end of the race on the number eight, and they would, uh, I would assume, split the remaining 26, 27 laps into two. And so they don't necessarily have to, a full tank and then a light tank, but to actually have two half tanks effectively, which is a, a slightly faster way to do it. Well, that, yeah. that's that's apologies. That hands, by the way, second and third place in uh, the LMP2 class to the two Jota cars uh, and Davidson as the seven gets away and Tom Bronkvist. Now, I want to go back a step to the interview again with Tatiana Calderon as, as Kamui Kobayashi leaves the pit lane. And she said with this new uh, iteration, I can't remember what the word is, new format of LMP2 car. Yes. And Graham, we, you know, we've been talking about this week, but we actually haven't mentioned it we on haven't. air. So what does she mean? Because she's raced LMP2 before, and she so has, has the yep. Richard Mill Racing Team. Yeah, well, she raced in LMS last year. She raced at the Mont with this same pairing. Oh, a long time. Ooh, that was <laughs> very close. Let's just watch this before we get into that explanation yeah. as to why right. LMP2 is so different. Franco thought about sticking his nose in there and then That's thought not otherwise. That's not Franco. No, it's the other is it the other G-Drive car? Yeah. car? OK, Rui Andrade. Uh, but uh, it, to it allow the introduction of this new breed at the top of sports car racing, and uh, that means major cost cuttings, it means major uh, moves towards more road relevance, which has brought weight into the, uh, into the category, that the LMP2s, which are blisteringly fast, uh, have been since these Gibson engine cars were introduced in 2017, uh, that they needed to be effectively just reeled in a little. So what's happened with those cars is now, now from last year, now 20 kilos. We're going to watch on board the United Autosports car of Felipe Albuquerque as the Toyota comes through. And it all gets very busy for a moment. So 20 kilos heavier. They have something like 65 horsepower less than last year. And that's been uh, achieved by uh, a variety of methods. It's a... Uh, uh, new inlet trumpets for the car, it's a new exhaust system for the car, it's a new engine map for the car. And they are also now running on the rather more slippery, low downforce, so lower downforce, so something like 15 to 20% less downforce than previously, as Richard Dean watches on, uh, and lower drag. That has played pretty well for them here. They're a bit of an outlier here at, uh, at Spa. So what you've got is a car with less downforce, that's heavier, and that is also less powerful than the LMP2 cars we saw before. The critical thing within the class, of course, is it's the same for all of them. 
So actually what we've seen in the races we've had so far with this newer uh, version of LMP2, and they number two races, the uh, LMS race at Barcelona two weeks ago and this race, and they've both been crackers, it's got to be said. Uh, it's, it's, of course you don't like to run a car at less capability than it's actually got, but there's a very good reason for it, and it's all about what we've got now, but more particularly, a whole lot of more that is coming. And by the way, a lot of these P2 teams want to be part of that picture. Can we all spell stratification? I love that word. That's, it, that's, that's the deal. It's not slowing down or reducing the power of whatever. Stratification giving a step between LMP2, which is very well proven, super quick, super strong driver lineups, teams that know the cars inside out. I mean, they're well proven product against a brand new category full of brand new cars and some of them brand new teams. So that's the deal. Well, there's the 26 car. Lou was saying just in my ear that she thinks they may be done. Oh we will try and find out if that is the case. As soon as she has something, she will know. Meanwhile, Chota Sports and Davidson in second in LMP2, fastest first sector of the race for that car. And Kamui Kobayashi, in the number seven Toyota, fastest first sector of the entire race of any car just being set. So sector one is a bit quick at the moment. It is getting cloudier and cloudier. The temperature's not gonna rise on track. Probably won't drop much because it's, well, it's not a particularly cold, cold day. It's not a very warm day, but it should be okay. Fastest first sector of the race last time around from Kamui yeah. Kobayashi. Um, the well, G-Drive... That's, that's this current lap he's on is. now, yeah. Uh, the uh, G-Drive racing uh, situation, that's going to depend on what the problem is for the car. There's two reasons why that's less dramatic than for more or less any other car in the race. The first thing is, it is not a full-season WEC car. Right. They are guesting here for preparation for later in the year. The second thing is, they have another race at the Red Bull Ring in two weeks' time in the European Le Mans series. If there is something there that they may damage, they're not going to get a podium position here. It, they, they're not in the points battle. They certainly don't want to affect the results in a world championship race. And it may very well be they've decided they've learned all they can here this week and that uh, that will be enough. Well, they, they will have come to win the class, no question about it. They always come to win the class, but sometimes you have to deal with the hand you've been dealt. You do. That's the hand they've been dealt, and you're absolutely right. They're not a season-long championship contender. It's not critical to get the car back out. It's more critical not to do any damage to the car, because if you go off because it suddenly springs a big leak, then the Red Bull ring is in doubt, and that is a championship race for them. Last time around, the lead car in LMP2 in the hands of Philippe Albuquerque, uh, 206978. The overall leader, the Toyota Kazoo Racing number eight, a 206934. Yep. In fact, only Kamui Kobayashi in hypercar went quicker. So. Let's get down to the G-Drive team. Louise is down there. She said she would find somebody to talk to us. So let's hear from Argentine teenager Franco Colapinto. Franco Colapinto, you put in an excellent performance. Uh, there's clearly an issue with the 26. It's now in the garage and it seems to have stopped. So uh, tell us what's happened. Uh, yeah, well, the pace was really good, so really happy with the team. The pit stops were amazing, so I think it was a great performance during all the weekend. Uh, and luckily, we can submit to issue with the car that uh, Jota reported. So now we are out of the race because we cannot repair, and, and yeah, and luckily uh, that's it for us. But it was also a race to prepare for, for the rest of the LMS season and for Le Mans, so I think it was very useful, mostly for me, because I had no, not much experience in this track race. Unlucky the finish, uh, we deserve a, a podium or a win, uh, but well, it is what it is. Uh, it's not that they did an amazing job, that, that is the most positive thing, and we will be stronger, stronger in the months for sure. You were amongst some great battles with some great drivers, so how was that for you? Yeah, it was very cool, you know, I, I raced also in Asian Le Mans with, with, with G-Drag, and we did also a great job, so... Uh, obviously, I'm still getting used to it, getting used to the fuel, cons the fuel consumption, the tire deck, and blah, 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 but obviously, it's, it's, it's a good start for us. Uh, I like it. Uh, it didn't finish as expected, but uh, I, we are happy with the, with the car and the great pace we had during all the weekend. Okay, thank you. Well thank done. Thank you very much. Bye.
Desi Oman, who's grown up an awful lot the last 12 weeks through the Asia Le Mans series with uh, some fantastic performances there from the team and uh, some eye-catching stuff there with the European Le Mans series uh, opener at Barcelona and here. More or less exactly what I said, wasn't it? I think it's uh, that just makes perfect yep. sense to me. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, lots more to come from the G-Drive Racing squad, from Argo Pro Racing, and for that matter, from Franco Colapinto. And of course, they do have a second iron in the fire, so the 25 car, it will also learn for, for its driving crew, although it's being run out of a by a by a different team it's being run under the same banner meanwhile back with cars that are still very competitive this is Job van Oetert fourth place for racing team Nederland ahead of Loic Duval for real team and Seaman Trummer for PR1 that's your 456 but it is also your 123 in the Pro-Am grouping so this is teams that have at least a bronze driver in the car and uh, racing team Nederland, of course, it's Fritz van Aert who is their bronze driver. You don't have to have a bronze driver, but for teams that do, the top team will end up with a different trophy. And there is the PR1 car. T. Uh, Seaman Trummer uh, is has handed the car over. I think there's been a driver change yeah, there. There has. Uh, meantime, big dramas as we've got, I think, the WRT car about to come back out. But we've got multiple drive-through penalties coming Ooh. for the 98. That is the Aston Martin racing car, the uh, Northwest AMR, the 47, the Chetilar car, the 20, that is high class racing, the 52 car, the 60 car from Iron Lynx, and the 22 car, oh. uh, which is United Autosports. They have currently only a 23 second gap to the second place car in LMP2. That is for full course yellow violation for the first full course yellow. Uh, call that came out that was the debris one wasn't it i think yeah yes. it was i was tired debris so that's, that's not slowing down enough as you go from uh, you don't know whether it's slowing down or speeding up but whichever way they've actually yeah. got a full course yellow penalty here's the race director eduardo freitas information to the pit line in the sequence of the first full course yellow procedures we have the following penalties Cars 98, 98, 47, 47, 20, 20, 52, 52, 60, 60, and 22. All these cars have a drive through penalty for a full course yellow violation. I repeat on the first full course yellow, cars 98, 47, 20, 52, 60, and 22 have drive-through penalties for full course yellow violations. The worst of it is, I it's fear more. they're not the last ones as well, so I'm sure we're going to be hearing from Eduardo Freitas in a few seconds later, and it's going to have another twist in the tail as we see the WRT car coming out after a clutch release bearing change and back on its way. Melisi at the wheel, but I think we're definitely going to have another wee sting in the tail. There will be a total of 10 full course yellow drive through penalties out of a field remaining of 32 cars one of which was parked in the garage and here is uh, the 22 the leading uh, united autosports car and that is one of the cars that's already receiving a drive through penalty for a violation on the first full course yellow yep. he's taking it now where is the 38 that's the next car in the order overall but however <laughs> That could be coming later on, that yeah. particular well, one. Well, we've, we've been notified that 38, 29, 52 and 70 will also receive penalties for violations of the second full course yellow. So for 38, they may move up to second place, They're but the one that They're could... Taking it They're coming down for it later now. Yeah. So it hasn't been announced on the uh, graphics, but they are taking their drive through. So that moves 28 right into the frame. They were third. They will take second. They've got ahead of the Sister car. And will be very much closer to first in LMP2. As we as could have a big battle on our hands. Big turnaround. United State in the lead. 28 uh, is now ahead of 38. And 29 is also ahead of 28. 29 has just served a drive through penalty. That is a penalty for second full course yellow. Actually, apologies. They're a lap off this. They're a lap down. So, 
it is now 28. Real team are in the pits, 70. Lloyd Duval, he's serving a penalty. So this is four of the top five cars in LMP2 with a drive-through. Yeah, but it effectively means still status quo if they're all doing the drive-through. Yes. Except for the one that didn't get a drive-through. 28. Which is then for not status quo. Yeah. They've gained effectively 30 seconds yep. in the fight for the lead of the race. While we're explaining all of that, gentlemen, <laughs> there was also a car that was in a podium position in the challenge we have for the LMP2 Pro-Am. That was the guesting PR1 Motorsports car into the pits, um, losing third place in that challenge yeah. to the 21 Dragon Speed car. We're going to listen down to 28 Jota. Okay, 38 and 29 are through the mid lane of our drive through. You are jumping them and box this up. Oh, you're in second, <laughs> but come on in. <laughs> but. That's so is good because, else. yeah, yeah, everybody else needs to make a fuel stop as well. So United still lead over 28 Jota by 24 odd seconds. And Davidson third in the 38 Jota car. Well, was third, but he's actually behind Jot van Oeyter in the 29 car. But he's a lap down. Although he's a lap down, so he's different on the road. So there is the car that is in second. This is going to be great in the highlights. I'm just going to get <laughs> so tied up in knots with this. 98, Paul Dallalana's car also with a penalty. Um, and I think Paul was at the wheel. Augusto Farfus comes down pit road to serve it. Who else? 47, Chetilar. Antonio Fuoco didn't earn the penalty, but he has served that one. Am I, I mean, it's almost quicker to say the 20 cars that weren't penalised. Am I dreaming, but wasn't the one car in both lists? No. No. OK. Um, oh, 52, yes, yes, both times. Yeah. Oh, that's the uh, Miguel Molina Ferrari that's, that was in second place in GTE Pro. That is going to put the Corvette on the podium. Yeah, because he's going to take two... And he's, he is, in fact, now on his outlap, so is that his first or his second? No, that's his seventh trip through the pits, and, and Alessandro Pierguidi's only made two, so Miguel Molina has done two consecutive drive-throughs, I believe. It, maybe it won't put the... I mean, it's, I'm not sure whether that's going to leave the Corvette, but it's going to close in dramatically. Yeah. While all that's happening, by the way, there's been another move. It's one we said might happen, has happened. It's the 83 AF Corsa car leading GTE Am has gone by Jimmy Bruni. And yeah. Uh, now is 19th overall. TF Sports, second place in that uh, class, by the way. In comes well, the Corvette for a uh, regular pit stop. We're in that pit window for the end of the race for GTE Pro. Fate has a habit of kicking a man when it's down, and 91 is definitely getting the kicking from Fate, isn't it? Puncture dropped it down earlier on. It's been clattered. It's had, uh, yeah, a couple of problems. So there's the Corvette. Hour and two minutes. Is this the final stop or are yes, they going yeah. to be okay? They're going to be good to go. There is Antonio Garcia. I think he's enjoyed this. Uh, I've, I've not seen him doing anything other than smiling this week, which has been great. <laughs> well, when was the last time he raced at Spa? I wonder. Uh, I can remember seeing him in the Spa 24 hours in a GT1 car. Okay. Well, I saw him here in the European Touring Car Championship or World Tour World Touring Car Championship, racing for Roberto Rabaglia in the BMW Italy Spain cars. And there is the 92 Porsche, Kevin Est at the wheel of the GT Pro leader, still more than 20 seconds ahead of Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And the battle on, well, in fact, second, third and fourth in GT combined are AF Corsa Ferraris. Second is the 51 Pro Car, third is the 52 Pro Car, fourth GT car on the road is the 83 AM class leading Alessio Rivera. Amazing. Ahead of the Corvette and the second factory Porsche. In fact, he's a lap ahead of the Corvette and the second factory Porsche. As we're seeing Kazuki Nakajima, who's probably got about maybe two or three laps to go before his next pit stop, which He's going to be right on the limit whether he can make it to the end from there or he's still going to need a splash. And so for him, it's pretty critical to do it. Just a little bit of information. Remember, we saw Colapinto, fantastic run in uh, the G-Drive in LMP2. Came in with a little bit of an oil leak. Looks like it's a broken oil line. Duncan Vincent's just sent me a little message. 
to say that it's a broken oil line and that should be the end of the day for them. So from having a really good run lying in second to a bit of disappointment. Yeah, we heard from Franco and Tenegas basically at this point, not a lot more to learn from them. They're not in the championship hunt in the WEC. They've got an ELMS race in a couple of weeks time and with no podium in prospects, that's uh, game over. Final hour of the first race, season nine of the FIA World Endurance Championship 2021. This is Spa, six hours, five down and one to go. Toyota Gazoo Racing, car number eight, leads the race and leads the hypercar category as it has been introduced for the very first time here at Spa. Alpine lie in second place. Andre Negrau chasing Kazuki Nakajima. There's a 39 second advantage for the Toyota. The number seven Toyota is in third place. Let's hear from our leaders. How is the situation? Yeah, good, good. One more, one more pit stop for us, and it will be driver change. One more stop, it will be driver change. We're in a good position. They are in a good position. They have a 38, nearly 40 second advantage over the Alpine in second place. But in their pit stop, they have an extra five seconds stationary as a penalty for unsafe release in an earlier stop. That's the top three. All the hypercars are still going. These brand new cars in this brand new class. In fourth place is our LMP2 leader. United Autosports started on pole and continue to lead into the final hour. The GT cars, the pro team led by, pro class led by the Porsche GT team, 92, the pole sitter there as well with Kevin Esch. So the two pole setters in uh, LMP2 and GT are leading. And AF Corsa, 83, the reigning champions lead in GTE AM. Okay, two more laps, two to go. Quick follow up. So Kaz Nakajima will be heading in in the number eight car, the race leader in a couple of laps. And that car was started by Sebastian Buemi. Brendan Hartley did the middle sector and Kaz Nakajima may well go through the final stint as well. Day in the Ardennes, that's not a call for help. That's the start of the 2021 season of the FIA World Endurance Championship. The dawn of a new era of top tier sports car racing as Hypercar makes its debut. The three Hypercars qualifying first, second, and fourth with an LMP2 pole sitting lap from Philip Albuquerque putting the United Auto Sports car in the mix on row two. And from the start, as the Toyotas were perhaps cautious in the first corner of the race, Phil Hansen, who started for United, shot by both to take the lead as eight battled seven. The Porsche that started on the GT Pro class held the lead into the first corner. Aston Martin had started on pole in the AM class and they too held the lead. Ten laps in, number eight Toyota waved in front of number seven, the early leader. Team felt it was quicker. Then trouble for Ben Keating, the AM class pole sitter who was in the top three at that stage. He got nerfed off, was contact between Juan Pablo Montoya and Roman Rusinov. A little bit less obvious contact there. Antonio Garcia being passed by the 91 Porsche. And then at the head of the GTE AM class, battle as the 54 Ferrari came through into the top order. LMP2 has been a knockdown, drag out fight. This is Antonio Felix da Costa in the dark Jota car. And alongside him, a fantastic run in the WRT car that was halted with a clutch bearing problem in the fourth hour contact from the Toyota causing a puncture the debris of which was left to be rescued under full course yellow the first caution after nearly four hours and then WRT with that clutch problem in the garage the home team off went the number seven car lost it under braking and Kobayashi ended up in the gravel queue at the second full course yellow. As a result of the two full course yellows, no fewer than 10 penalties handed out. Nine different cars penalized, once penalized twice. And then Alpine leading the race at that stage, but struggling to get front tire temperature back up. 
as they stopped. Toyota back in front. But the number seven car, a distant hope of victory, relying on two retirements ahead of it. G-Drive leaking oil, the number 26 car in the garage. United Autosport leading in LMP2. Number eight car leading into the final hour outright as the pit stops start again. One hour to go, 55 minutes now. AF Corsa leading in the GTEM class. Alessio Rivera finally, I think, being persuaded to give the car to somebody else. After a mammoth stint, he's in the pits. So too is Kaz Nakajima. And you saw Brendan Hartley there giving the big thumbs up to his teammate, which means that he's going to be Seb Buemi, who takes over. He started the race, and it looks as though he may well end it two for the number eight Toyota team. Martin Haven, Alan McNish and Graham Goodwin watching the action with you. Louise Beckett in the pit lane. And Graham, so far, despite their problems in the two-day prologue and in practice, the Toyotas have been relatively reliable, considering it is a brand new car and the number seven had not even turned a wheel on a racetrack before Monday morning. Yeah, remember this stop, they're going to take a further five-second hold in the number eight car. 36 has gone through to lead. Uh, the other change, by the way, quite right, so let's go Rivera. Oh! Oh! My goodness, there, the, G uh, the Jota car didn't see that the leading Alpine was coming down the inside. Sorry that to jump the in there, but the 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 world, was <laughs> jumping out there. We've just seen the car going into the lead as uh, the Toyota is in the pits. And uh, it was very, very fortunate. It was side to side. I don't think any damage actually, as it's turned out. But uh, that's yeah, a heart in the mouth moment for <laughs> us, and definitely <laughs> without question for both of the drivers involved. Wow! Oh, yeah, look at his mirrors there, isn't he? Is he gone? Is he gone? I'm I not think. sure whether that's Tom Blomqvist or Ann Davidson, but either way, let's watch again. Uh, he's come down the inside and he's just oh, did not know he was there. A huge accident. Did not know he was there. He took the normal racing line and suddenly, bang, there's contact. I think it was Tom Blomquist who was in that Jota car that uh, just had the incident there. The Toyota, though, is back out of the pits. Now 37 seconds, give or take, is the gap between the leader, Negrau, and the Alpine and that Toyota. However, Negrau does owe us a pit stop, but it's not going to be a full fuel pit stop because he doesn't, will not need a full tank. Uh, however, it will drop it back down into second, then it'll be a sprint for the line by both. Uh, the point I was going to make, as that absolute drama happened, quite right, you should jump <laughs> in with that one, uh, is Nicholas Nielsen now aboard the 83 car. For the first time, he's the gold driver, needs to do 55 minutes, he will do that. I believe, yep. I think. That's AF Corsa, the 83 car. Felipe Fraga in the lead for TF Sport Aston. Look at the headlights flashing, and still, and that's on the driver's side of the Jota Sport car as well. The eyes. Oh, the eyes definitely oh. open there. Wow. He did so well there. So there is the 83 AF Corsa Ferrari that's been leading for the last hour or so in GTM. And was that flash of blue in front of him, the race leader? Yes, it, it is. is. Felipe yes, it is. Fraga in the Aston. Does always a stop. 2.8 seconds in front. That's going to be an epic battle towards the end. Dempsey Proton in third with Alessio Piccarello. Let's hear from Francois Perodo at AF Corsa. See what he's got to say about the prospects for the 83 car. Francois Perodo, the number 83, leading in the GT category. Now one hour to go, less than an hour, handed over to Nicholas Nielsen. What a race so far. Yeah, it's been really good. The first race of the season for me, so a bit difficult, but uh, managed to grab three places in the first lap. Then had a great fight with my old friend, Paul Dallalana. And then uh, I tried to keep up with number 33, Ben Keating, but the guy was flying. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been hard. It's been a really fast, uh, it's been a tough first, first stint. And uh, the engineer asked me if I could do a double stint. I was like, no way. <laughs> I was completely dead after one hour, but uh, it turned out OK in terms of strategy so far. So we did, uh, Alessio did the second hour, I did the third one. And he's just done a double stint. So yeah, the car, is, the car seems really good. Can Nicholas bring it home? I hope so. That's his job. <laughs> <laughs> good. Well, let's see. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Excellent. Can Nicholas bring it home? That's his well, job. That's what he's paid uh, to do. That's what he's here for. He's got, better. Got Talking point. about things paid to do, Sebastian Buemi has just done the fastest first sector of the race so far. 
uh, in second place on his chase of uh, Andre Negrao as we watch his teammate Kamui Kobayashi back into third place and also in a little bit of a, a recovery mission uh, to make it to the podium after the incident that dropped them out of contention, which you will see now. Oh no, this is a different one. Oh wow. It's exactly the same oh. corner as well. And again, running into the problems under braking behind a prototype. That's that car yeah. got a problem. I don't think it's the prototype is the sort of common denominator there. I think it's the car. And uh, it looks like he's struggling. And we've seen the Toyotas especially uh, in these conditions for whatever reason struggle in the heavy braking areas uh, up at Lake Calm at the top of the hill also down into the Brussels hairpin on a couple of occasions so it looks like the recuperation and braking balance of that car isn't quite, I see recuperation of energy from the hybrid system isn't quite at the optimum yet Prideful position with them, prideful position all right, so there's confirmation. The yellow nose on the Jota Sport in front is Tom Blomqvist, and that is the car that had contact with the race leader. That white nose is 38. OK, so that's a mental note. The Iron Dames stop in the inset picture. Who else is in the pits? 77 Dempsey Proton, the Chetilar Ferrari, and Catherine Legg in the Iron Lynx car, the Iron Dames, the all-female crew car just leaving the pit lane. The fastest lap of the race goes in the chasing number eight car Whoa. to Sebastian Buemi. A 203.930 brings the gap down now to 31.50 seconds. That lap is that uh, it's about four and a half seconds, three and a half seconds, yeah. sorry, quicker than Andre de Grau on that last lap. Yeah. That's a big, big slice. Now, of course, the ground may have been in traffic for some or all of it, and Seb may well have had clear well, air. However, we know how excitable Sebastian Buemi is, and if there's a chance of winning the race, and there is a chance of winning the race, he's got to make up 30 seconds in 48 minutes, then he will give it everything he can. OK, OK, Seb. TC is free. TC is free. Use the TC as you wish now. OK. So traction control is free, basically. They can release the car, so I think they've had the TC wound up, the traction control, so the car's quite tight, maybe not releasing it. Looked very slow off some of the initial accelerations earlier on, and so now they've gone for a bit more performance. I would suggest that that radio is maybe a lap ago, when I look at the lap time, that Sebastian <laughs> yeah. Boemi has just delivered. We have to remember two things. One, that car is on new tyres, yep. and Boemi's just came out of the pits. The second thing is that the Alpine that's leading still owes us one pit stop. So as much as Boemi's chasing him down, then Negrau still will have a pit stop that uh, Boemi does not have any longer. So another lap in the 205s for Boemi, 206s for and the ground last time around, gap comes down by a further second, it's 30.3 seconds now, with 47 minutes to go. Third place car in GTE Am, final stop for the Dempsey Proton 88, Chetilar have left the pits in fourth, and how close is that battle going to be? Well, it's a minute and 20 seconds, so maybe not that close. Nick Nielsen leading for AF Corsa, the champions looking to start their defence with a win in GTE Am, 92 leading in GTE Pro, and 22, the champions leading in LMP2 as well. Alpine leading the 36, Alpine Elf Matmut car leading in hypercar, but with a stop to make and Toyota just 30 seconds behind. It could be quite a grandstand finish. Oh, yeah. I mean, in, 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 you, you're right, the change in uh, GTM with the latest pit stops is the 92 Porsche uh, pits from the lead. The second place car, the 51A, of course, a car on its way out from its latest pit stop from second. And this third place 52A, of course, are also on pit road right now in GTM. Just look at the names at the moment. Nicholas Nielsen, the youngsters here. Nicholas Nielsen, Felipe Fraga, Alessio Piccariello, Antonio Fuoco, another young gun from Italy, Giancarlo Fisichella uh, there in that, uh, that mix. It, this, is, this is where we've got so many talents coming forward that we're going to see in endurance racing for many, many years to come. Porsche going to work. 
Yeah, it's a, they've saved a full set, haven't they? Yep. That's a four-tyre change in case it was needed. And, and we've seen them do that so many times. And it, that bears out exactly what they were saying this morning. Survive five hours, see where you are. Absolutely. See where you are with a gun driver and a set of tyres that are brand spanking new that haven't done a lap. That's what they're giving Kevin Est because they want him to win it. Because at the back of the pro field is the 91 car. It was not their day. But the problem is, if you lose that advantage to your teammates in race one, it becomes a much tougher five-race chase to the title. Yeah, it's uh, just seen that uh, super slow-mo of the number 92 car reminds me. I don't think we've referred yet to the fact that these cars are in the revised uh, spec this year with the rear exiting exhausts, yep. not the side exiting exhausts that we had last season. Again, that it lowers the decibel count, makes it a little easier on the ears if you happen to be trackside, and hopefully before the end of the year that will be an, a, a, a factor. Phil Hansen, Fabio Scherer, Philip Albuquerque, you see their respective driving times. Of course, Philip is adding to that as he continues to the end of the race, another 45 minutes or so. We've got a battle underway for a podium place in GTM. We'll come to that in a moment or two with Picariello under threat from Antonio Fuoco, the set of our racing car chasing down the 88 Dempsey Proton car. But it's all about the front of this field yep. in the hypercar. Jota on Jota, green on green action. So Tom Blomqvist ahead of Ann Davidson. Blomqvist holding him at the moment. And uh, Tom. BMW factory days, now part of this full season effort in the WEC. Started the LMP2 program in Asia in the Gulf for the four race program earlier this year in February. Had the, the mother and father of all accidents in Abu Dhabi, recovered well from that, and the uh, crew for the following two races. Interesting there, you saw him move over to the left, Alan. Right, come if you're coming. Oh, you're not. Right, OK, I'm taking... Oh, you are. Oh, you're not. Well, would, you, would you just make your mind up? Well, I think it's more a case of, uh, <laughs> look, if you're going to do it, do it. Yeah, uh, and the not Toyota sure there'll couldn't. be a second discussion about it afterwards. Yeah. But both of these Jota cars are on exactly the same stint strategies. And so it is a full race to the end for that second place. Now, this is the point where, from a driver's perspective, in the respective cars, they just don't care which one... Well, actually, they do care. They want their own car to finish <laughs> ahead. From the team perspective, they want to make sure that both cars finish second and third. However way it rounds, it works at this stage of the season. They're not really that bothered too much, but uh, they yeah. definitely don't want any incidents between the two of the Jota cars. Yeah, Sam Hignett will be doing some definite butt kicking if there's any contact between the two of them. As you say, Jota could still take second and third place on the LMP2 podium quite happily. And it's not beyond the bounds of possibility that things happen to other cars as well. Fourth, fifth and six all stopped together. Racing Team Netherlands, Real Team and Inter Europol are in the pits in a bunch. And Dragon Speed in as well. Ben Hanley at Dragon Speed, Alex Brandl for Inter Europol, who make their debut in the World Endurance Championship today. And at Racing Team Netherlands, there he is. Jop van Oetert hits his marks. Potential fantastic recovery, by the way, after a, a truly dreadful start to the race for Real Team Racing. Looking pretty well set for a podium finish in the LMP2 Pro-Am Challenge. Yep. Currently, Racing Team Netherlands leading that. But uh, Real Team with Lloyd Duval at the wheel, up to fifth overall, second Pro-Am car into Europol, sixth place. Having left the pits, Dragon Speed seventh. It's 20 seconds or so between Alex Brundle for Inter Europol and Ben Hanley for Dragon Speed. Richard Mill Racing Team now up to eighth place in LMP2. Sophia Flush back at the wheel of that car for the finish and has fueled back for high classes in ninth, ahead of Gabriel Aubrey for PR1 and Roberto Mary for the storied 25 G-Drive car, which has had a bit of an entertaining race. Let's catch up with 92 Porsche's new boy, Neil Gianni. Neil Gianni, the 92 has put in such a great performance throughout the whole of this race. Uh, and your first GT race, how's it been? Well, so far, uh, first GT race experience has been uh, great. Let's hope uh, for the last 40 minutes it stays like that. Um, yeah, Kevin did a great start, you know, 
got us a gap. Then uh, I got in the car. I could actually open up the gap a bit. But because he had to come in with a puncture early, I had to start saving fuel just to get back into the window. Uh, luckily, the full course yellow then uh, helped us with that. Uh, at the beginning of the week, you were saying that you were struggling, you know, looking in the mirrors, traffic around you because you're used to being in LMP1. So how was it during the race? Yeah, I, I keep telling myself, look back, look into the mirror, <laughs> look into the mirror. Plus, uh, my engineer Adam is doing really a, a great job telling me, okay, P1 or P2, uh, four seconds back. Just I keep then looking backwards and uh, worked well. We could avoid contact, some hairy moments, but that's uh, normal in those races. Okay, I won't say any more because the race isn't over yet, and I know that <laughs> you don't want me to say any more on that no. front. <laughs> yeah, great. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, never celebrate too early. We've seen that so many times, haven't we? But it is a very different discipline, Alan. You you went the other way, starting your sports car racing in, in GTs and then going up to the big class, and you've, well, you've tasted both sides of it, haven't you? So you know how hard it is to be passed. Honestly, not really, because yeah. the GT was the leading category at the time. So it, that's one skill set that, it, very frankly, I think is a real skill set to be able to do two things at once. <laughs> So then we have a puncture, we have a puncture. Oh, so and box, box in this lap. Okay, this okay, okay, okay. Sir, sir, sir. That's a puncture for the leading car. However, that just brings them into the pit window so they can now change tires, fuel and go to the end. So it's not incurring an additional stop, it just incurs a slow in-lap. And his in-lap was a two, two minute 20? rather than uh, two minutes seven. So he might have lost 15 seconds. The gap to uh, Sebastian Remy, who crosses the line, is now negative. He is not ahead. Andre Negrao is in second place. Two minutes back, Kamui Kobayashi. So this will be a minute and 10 or 12 second pit stop, full service, full tank of fuel, or as much as they need, and the tyres. Was that left sides only, or right sides only? or? Yeah, they only well, did two tyre change. I think that's right. Yeah, right sides only. So he hasn't got freshest rubber. Yeah, they're always a little bit on the back foot because ultimately they were behind Toyota when the pit stops would come out anyway. Um, but this certainly doesn't help them and probably put them into a position where it's trying to solidify that second place as opposed to necessarily the attack that I think everybody was uh, looking at maybe about one hour ago towards the end of the race. And look at the wear on the tyres. The fronts have done 37 and 19 laps, the rears 20 and 19 laps. So that unladen right front is doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but it doesn't actually get that much abuse. So it's been on the long while. This is very tight at the end of this race for, is it gonna be a couple of laps of fuel? I think that's a set point we need. No, Boemi's okay to the end. You sure? Yep, yeah. He's uh, they did 26 laps with Nakajima. They had 26 laps to go when uh, he was right on the limit to be able to do it. They needed to fuel save a little bit. Now they've got the comfort zone to do a lot of fuel saving if they need to. So one minute and 49 seconds at the last split. Andre Negrao in second ahead of Kamui Kobayashi. Number seven Toyota. The 010 hybrid is on the charge, but you can see how much real estate there is between them. He's just starting to head down from the high point at La Source, and the senior tech run Alpine is just about to head up from the low part of the circuit at the Cour Paul Frere. That used to be at Stavolo. It is 41 and a half seconds is the gap. Yeah, that's Toyota totally on fuel saving leader. mode. So that's to the lead of the number eight car. The map is showing you where the seven Toyota is. It is half a lap away. And on a four and a half kilometer Grand Prix circuit, that's not so much as it is on a seven kilometer Grand Prix circuit. So number seven heading off down the hill. That's Kamui Kobayashi. And what he doesn't need is another outbreaking himself and going off moment. They are a lap ahead of our LMP2 leader. And this is our LMP2 leader. It's a minute and 26 seconds to Kobayashi. So if Kobayashi goes off, then suddenly we could have 
a third different team on the podium. United Auto Sports leading with Philip Albuquerque. He'll finish the race. Phil Hansen started it, so now he gets to chat to Louise Beckett. Phil Hansen, you put in a great performance from the start of the race, and the 22 has just continued throughout. It's been great. Yeah, it's been a fantastic weekend. Obviously, we've been able to top all the timesheets, um, put it on pole and lead away from the start. Um, it's not over yet. There's 35 minutes left. Uh, I don't want to say too much, you know. Endurance racing has its uh, has its rituals that you know you don't say you don't catch your chips right to the end. Um, but yeah, Philippe's doing a good job. We've got a very comfortable lead at the moment of plus 40 seconds. So um, yeah, hopefully everything's fine. Good stuff. Okay, I'm not saying any more either. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Everybody's keeping their fingers crossed at this stage. We've got 35 minutes to go and counting. And certainly for United Autosports, anything that struck now would be very, very cruel. Like they barely put a foot wrong. They did have that penalty uh, with uh, an issue with the first full course yellow, speeds under the full course yellow. But the new boy in the team, Fabio Scherer, has certainly, uh, I think, done exactly what was uh, expected of him. Yeah, he has. They were a little bit fortunate, and the fortune favours the brave that uh, pretty much all the other elements around them also got a penalty for full course yellow infringement as well so it was kind of status quo as it turns out in the end otherwise it could have been a little bit tighter for them to have been in with a battle uh, probably about a 10 second lead as opposed to a 46 second lead as they are between this battle between Tom Blomquist and Anthony Dibbs. Well when we last looked at this you said they're exactly in the same position on fuel and I thought I wonder if both cars are on the same position on tyres as well and the answer is yes they are they've done exactly the same number of laps on the tyres each and the car that benefited in that there was four of the top five LMP2 cars had penalties for infringements and in the full course yellows the two that we had in our five and the one that didn't is Tom Blomqvist the car that is now in uh, second place in LMP2 the uh, Jota Sport car with the yellow nose band and Davidson in third place he was second uh, he ended up paying a penalty and so too did Jock Van Eiter for Racing Team Netherlands that car in fourth place so Blomqvist went from fourth to second ahead of Davidson Ooh, and uh, through past the Northwest AMR Aston Martin the 98 car he goes that car is seventh in the GTE AM class being driven by Augusto Farfus just watching for where the battles are still well alight one of them is Ben Hanley who is reeling in Alex Brundle in LMP2 at the moment so Dragon Speed car third at the moment in the LMP2 program challenge at seventh overall in the LMP2 order, catching the sixth place car, the Inter Europol competition car, are debuting WEC full season entrance from Poland. And the not at all Polish Alex Brandl at the wheel. Anthony Davidson needs to get past this Porsche before it gets to the bottom of the hill. He had a very good run with the previous car. And I don't think he's gonna do it. I think he's gonna have to sit behind. Oh, I thought he was having a lunge. He's actually getting out so he could see yeah. where he was and making sure there was a bit of front aero, front air, clean air going across the nose of the car. And that's held him back a little bit and it's given the Blomquist a little bit more breathing space again. Well, that was one of the Dempsey Proton cars. 88 lies in third place. 77 that crashed and didn't set a qualifying time lies in sixth position. So a good recovery for that car. In fact, 77 led quite a lot uh, of the middle section of the race having started from the very back in the opening stint it was fired right towards the front by um, matt campbell and here is ann davidson and that is the other a Jota Sport car, 28 of Tom Blomqvist. It's not natural to say 28 and 38. 38 we're used to, 28 we'll have to get used to. So that was third and second in LMP2. And here is our LMP2 leading car, number 22 from United Auto Sports. Gap going out in the lead at the moment, 46.6 seconds now. Still with more than a minute in hand, Andre Negrau over Kamui Kobayashi. The podium battle that is still well alight here is for the final podium spot in GTM. 
We talked about this a little while ago. Alessio Picariello is being caught by, and caught consistently by Antonio Froco in the Settler Racing Ferrari. They would dearly love a podium on their debut in this class. Yeah, six and a half seconds that battle. Chetelar behind Dempsey Proton. That might well be a real dash to the flag. It's not varying much on this lap. There's another battle as well. Nick Nielsen, just nine seconds in the AF Corsa car that leads in AM behind Jimmy Bruni's Porsche that is tail end Charlie in the pro class. Now, how much would Nick Nielsen love to be able to catch and pass Jimmy Bruni in the closing stages? And actually, Jimmy Bruni can't afford to let him because although it's not pro class, the AM class GT car will still get points for fifth place as opposed to Jimmy Bruni getting points for fifth place. So that would make a big difference because the overall point score in the GTE Pro class can be interrupted if AMs get ahead of you in the top 10. Just under five minutes from the 25 minute to go mark, which is traditionally the point at which something dramatic happens. <laughs> it's always something that lasts 25 minutes. Are you the angel of doom? No, it's just it's just the, the benefit of long experience of um, half writing race reports and having oh, to them. Oh, a little early. But here is problems for which of the Dempsey Proton 77. cars? It's 77. And he's going to stop. That's he's going to stop Evans. at the Brussels hairpin. Whether he gets out of the way is going to determine whether this becomes a full course yellow or not. Is there an area for him there's to no, be able to... You can't get out of the circuit there, can you? I don't I think. Don't there should be a gap. Oh. That, oh, there's oh. a gap behind. There's a gap at the... Oh, end. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's at Lecom, but I think he's got a bit of an issue with electronics there because the lights were going on and off. Yeah. Maybe so about... Kind of looks like it's... Uh, power issue of some sort or another and that's at the top of the hill at turn eight well, you can't get it off yeah. there yeah there I, I thought at the end of the barrier there there was a gap but he's oh, control all deleting uh, like bilio isn't he at the moment you can see the gravel marks there where the toyota of kamui kobayashi ended after the big long black tire marks Yeah, no black tyre marks. I think the Porsche came down the hill dead stick, didn't it? There was well, no, nobody at home as he was coming down the hill. Yeah, but he's got some energy because the lights are on and off. Is that Sasha Masson? Yeah, that's Sasha yeah, Masson. Yeah, I thought so. Not many Porsche representatives have hair that bouffant. Sasha looks after, of course, the Porsche Juniors. Yeah. So Jackson Evans was one of his young charges in the uh, Porsche Super Cup last year. Love it. Carrera Cup Deutschland is here this weekend as well, so we'll have plenty of business there, I'm sure. And Carrera Cup Benelux. In fact, last year we had Deutschland, Benelux and Carrera Cup France all together as well. So there's still yellow flags there while they determine whether or not that car can move under its own power. So this is the leader, Nicholas Nielsen. Yes. And uh, looking at it with Jimmy Bruni in the GT, Jimmy looks like he owes us a stop and oh, does Nicholas, he? Looks Nicholas like Nielsen he doesn't will be going ahead look leapfrog Nielsen one position up to be six overall in GTE and the gap is coming down and that means points for Jimmy Bruni and Richard Leitz won't be for fifth they'll only be for uh, no uh, because no, Corvette won't score so it's fourth and fifth place points but uh, no because the AF Corsa car won't score which one the third one because it's only two cars isn't it now in the drivers championship oh, i see i thought you were talking manufacturer no no in the drivers championship which is the only one the drivers care about obviously oh, oh. oh. and <laughs> there, there was there was barely room for an ant between the tire and the barrier there was there he's only done that so we can do it on the big white board later and show you why he did it <laughs> Anthony oh. Davidson there just running it right up to the edge. Yeah. Stay on the grey stuff, son. That's what it's there for. Yeah, it's dropped him back, though. Yeah. He lost uh, quite a bit of time there. Actually, not as much as you would think. It was two and a half seconds was the, the drop back on that particular one. But I'm sure it took him a little time for his heart rate to get back to normal. By the way, with apologies to the fabulous people in the truck uh, that put together these pictures, the reason we're being shown that picture of Nick Nielsen is because he's just passed. 
and put a lap on the third in class. This has been an, an enormous performance from the 83 crew today. Yeah, let's see if Rivero couldn't get him out of the car at Absolutely. one point. He was Crack in it stuff. forever. France where Perodo as well delivered need. And Perodo seems to win the first race of quite often of the season oh, yeah. of WBC. It's and uh, then keeps on fighting from there. Well, you know, you heard it when uh, Lou was talking to Francois, talking about his good friends, Paul Delalana, and uh, talking about Ben Keating. And this is their peer group. These are the guys, they come here every weekend we're racing to come to beat. And uh, we've got a uh, slightly different driver crew around Francois for the LMS as well. So we'll be seeing a lot of that Chrome Ferrari this year. One battle you mentioned earlier on that was sort of starting to brew up again was Ben Hanley in seventh position in LMP2, catching on the Interpol competition car of Alex Brundle, but Brundle seems to have stemmed the tide a little bit of that one and sort of keeping Hanley at an eight-second sort of margin. And so it's ebbing flowing a little bit, but it's certainly not Hanley catching in the same speed that he was earlier on. Four course yellow is coming in 40 oh. seconds. That will be for the recovery of that car. For in your the take. pits, the seven. Seven. Kobayashi into the pits before the full course yellow. 30 seconds to full course yellow. Kobayashi done 25 laps, so he needed to come 20 in. 20 seconds to full course yellow. Anyway, he was right on the limit of his fuel window with 11 laps to go. Boemi and his sister car doesn't 10, need anything. Nine, eight, seven. Almost six, perfectly timed. Five. Four, three, two, one. Full course yellow. We are under full course yellow. I'm intervening at the runoff of T8. I've got marshals exposed in the runoff of T8. Yeah, very quick full course yellow because the car should be out of the way in the next sort of 30 seconds. Yeah. And so it'll be a, an extremely fast one. Uh, the other uh, position on track, by the way, that, that is coming down reasonably quickly before that full course yellow. It's a bit further down in on P2. It's the Fire Flourish being caught by Anders Fjordback in the high-class racing car. That car, a little bit of a topsy-turvy race, but uh, coming back now, and that gap before we went to full course yellow was under 20 seconds, uh, but coming down quickly. So PR1 and the remaining G-Drive car in the pit lane. Number seven car has been through and gone out. There is Kamu Kobayashi. Let's get down to the number eight Toyota Garage. Should be nice and quiet, actually, as Louise Beckett catches up with Brendan Hartley, who will undoubtedly have everything crossed for the final 20-odd minutes. Brendan Hartley, well, what a race this has been so far. The first hypercar race for uh, Toyota, and it, and it certainly brought some surprises. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the first surprise for us, we've been in some battles with some LMP2 cars yeah. as well, uh, some LMP2 cars, which it's changed the whole dynamic um, in, in terms of traffic and how we get through compared to the, the TSO50 we had before is completely different. So th there's been a lot, lot of learning on. There's been a lot of learning on the go. I mean, we, we did a lot of testing on the lead up to this, but always by ourselves. So yeah, it hasn't been without troubles. We've we've had a few little issues here and there, but we've we've kept it on the road and yeah, lo lots of little lessons. But so far, yeah, really happy that we're still in the lead. And I don't know if there's 30 minutes, 30 minutes or so to go, but um, hopefully we can stay there. We shouldn't need to pick. Kaz did 26 laps on the last stint, so he managed to save a lot of fuel, and I think Seb's um, got the fuel mileage to get it to get it back. Sounds good. Thanks very much. Cheers. But there's the number seven stopping at the top of the hill, and that's Kazuki uh, Kamui Kobayashi, who's in third place. What? On his outlap, stopping at the top of the hill at Lake Com. And so it may be okay for the eight that's leading, but it's definitely not for the seven at the moment. Well, this is this is the car that has been the problem child all week, isn't it, Graham? With reliability Absolutely. and battery changes and issues. It is a brand new car, and he is looking down in the cockpit. He's trying to recycle the car. You still have the alarm, can we? Yes, I have still. You still have the alarm. Okay, stop in the sixth place, and you do for a second. Yeah, that's what he's done. He's rolled off at the top of the hill. He's doing a power cycle. Now he's got it going again. But again, suddenly, does this start to bring United Autosports and Philippe Albuquerque into play for an overall podium? It only needs to stop once at racing. If that had been at racing speed, Albuquerque would have gone past him while he was busy doing control-all-delete. Yeah. 
but on this occasion it wasn't. It wasn't, so therefore, no. It's well. still the same position. And uh, even if Sebastian Buemi in the other car was running to the end, and we heard Brendan Hartley saying he thinks he's got the fuel mileage, so this has, has just given them a get-out-of-jail-free card. It certainly has now. Because now you, in comparison to a flat-out lap, you save about 50% on, on the full-course yellow laps. And so, therefore, it is, uh, it's now basically holding position with a gap of, as it stands, two minutes between the first two cars. However, when it goes green, depending on where it goes green, then that will maybe reduce a bit again. Watching Felicino up there, bouncing on his heels. <laughs> oh, he's I not the only one, I, I, we're all bouncing on our I kind of wonder what the emotion's like there. I mean, it's, it's kind of so close. But before this race, if you were Philippe Sino, would have you taken second place and splitting the Toyotas? Yeah, of course you would have done. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely no question about it. But at the same time, when you're you're fighting for the lead with an hour to go, yeah. then oh, second yeah. place seems a little bit disappointing. And no one comes to a race to finish second. Uh, ultimately, we have to finish second sometimes, and you have to accept what you've got, especially if you aren't quite uh, up to it on the day. But uh, I think from them, they'll be maybe hoping for a little bit more, but comfortable with what they've done. Well, well so talking of that, right behind the United car is the WRT car, and they're in the same position. They're not going to finish second, but they had hoped for a lot more. You know, barring that clutch release bearing failure, which is not a team issue for sure, then... You know, they might have been in that position right behind United in the final 20 minutes battling for the win of the race, but they're not. They're not even on page one of the timing screen. Yeah, full course yellow will end in 20 seconds from now. And then they'll be back to racing speeds as the two Jota cars Ooh. come in. In the correct order. Oh, so they were on a wing and a prayer then. No, they, were, they, they had to do a stop at some point. They yeah. were on equal runs, but they both had to do a stop at some point. That's a longer stop, though, for the 38. Yeah, there was something going on on the right corner, wasn't there, on the, on the passenger they're, side? They're not under any threat from behind. It is... No, it was the third... It was 28 that had a contact with the Alpine, Alpine, and that was on the driver's side on the left, so whatever's ailing the 38, he's still there, by the way. Who's we go gone? green for... Well, no, he's not gone, is he? Yeah, he's, but he's got he's a long gap back to Job van Oetert, who's in the racing team Netherlands car. So in that respect, second and third is definitely uh, secure for them if they don't have any other problems. He's on his way and out of the pits. I thought yeah. I'd heard uh, Gibson firing up. Yeah. I don't mean Drew. <laughs> <laughs> he's been fired up for weeks. 100 kilometers a day on the bike. Blimey, O'Reilly. Jimmy Bruni has also exited the pit lane, so they had a final stop in the 91 Porsche. Now, has that... How close has that brought Nick Nielsen? 9.2 seconds, possibly less. That could be very interesting. And Jackson that Evans is Jackson away. Evans, yeah. That's sad. So close to the end of the race, that's, yeah. that's sad. But that's done for the day. He's got to get a lift back on the back of the bike. Happily, he's brought his helmet already, so that's OK. Yeah. On board with the race leader, Toyota Gazoo Racing, Sebastian Buemi. Under 18 minutes of the first race of the hypercar era remain. And the first purpose-built hypercar on the planet. And literally the first, not just the first manufacturer's mark, but this is actually the first car that rolled a wheel as a new hypercar. Has we're, done all the testing. We, yeah, has done all the rolling of the wheels. We have not seen the Glickenhaus yet. That's the second purpose-built hypercar that has started testing, but was not ready to race here. We may see it in Portimao. We may not see it until Le Mans. But Toyota Gazoo Racing, little over a quarter of an hour away from the end of this first race of the hypercar era. And sort they of are proving the theory in their car at the moment. United Autosports, well, we knew what they had last year, and apparently in the inter intervening six months, they haven't forgotten any of what they had last year. Porsche GT, stunning laps in qualifying from Kevin Astra, just left the rest, trailing in his wake and open mouth in shock. And the 92 car, despite uh, an unexpected puncture, has been the class of the field in the GTE Pro category. But two Ferraris will populate the podium. In the 51 car, Alessandro Pierre Guidi in second. Miguel Molina in the 52 car, not the 71 car anymore. 
in third position. Corvette fourth, and the 91 Porsche in fifth, now opening up the gap over Nick Nielsen in this car, the AM class leading 83A, of course, a Ferrari. TF Sports pole sitting 33 car, the four horseman machine, driven by Felipe Fraga, is in second place. Dempsey Proton's remaining car, Alessio Picariello, he is in third in the 88 car. So there are your four class leaders. But guys, as we said at the beginning of the race, nominally four classes, they are very much closer in terms of performance at the beginning of the season. Pros and AMs in GT and P2 and Hypercar in the prototype categories. Absolutely. I think uh, with 15 minutes to go, there's, there's a word of congratulations to another group of people who are often maligned and have been a lot in the last few months. And that's the people who look after the regulations that try to get these cars competitive. We've got two fundamentally different machines in the first two places in this race, and they're less than a minute apart. Now, this little story with the number 70 car, because Esteban Garcia brought it into the pits with a puncture, right. and he told us afterwards he was three laps short on his minimum this driving stint. So he's now come back into the car. They've put him in instead of for the final three laps during that full course yellow, and he is now at the wheel of the real team car. So the battle with Ben Hanley. Well, Hanley has gone by for sixth position in LMP2 and real team in seventh place. The gap will grow. But Sophia Flush in eighth for Richard Mille, two minutes behind, may not catch in the remaining 14 minutes. And for real team racing, run and engineered by TDS. It's been a slightly turbulent first race, but it will be a good one because they'll get to the end all their possible laps completed, it would seem. Yes, yeah, Sophia Flush is under threat from behind from uh, Anders Tjordback for that position. Uh, she had a very slow lap last time around, was caught by about six seconds. Let's go and have a listen to what's going on with Sir Boemi. OK, no more energy target, no more energy target, but let's take it easy and bring it home. So it's not that they're letting him off the leash to go hell for leather. They're just saying you no longer have to save anything. Just stroke it through to the end. Alistair Moffat on the left, Simon Strang on the right, who we used to see in Aston Martin colours over the last few years. They're the uh, PR and media team at Toyota Gazoo Racing, at least the uh, outward facing one. Uh, one uh, car that is currently on the move and uh, getting a shuffle on, and that's Ant Davidson. He's got, he came out the pits from that uh, longer pit stop than his teammate, with 20 seconds uh, behind Tom Blomqvist. He's just taken four seconds out of that gap on the last lap, and he's going quicker again now. Yeah. So I think Ant Davidson fancies having a bit of crack at the end here. I wonder if Ant has got something in the, in the locker, yeah, fresh tires. But, but if they had fresh tires, you'd think they would both have had fresh tires and they'd have had them on earlier than the last but bear in mind, 15 minutes. These are two completely different customer efforts for the same team. There's yep. not going to be any, uh, any question here of team orders between those two crews. No, absolutely. But well, you because... can do your strategy at different points, yeah. you know, in that yeah. respect, you can throw them in at the beginning and the end. Depends on the driver, depends on the circumstances, how the car balances, but what you need at the time. One thing that was pretty clear was that Kevin Estra and Neil Yanni didn't really need much help. They were able to, <laughs> to deliver their only sort of blip in the whole weekend from qualifying through to the race was that uh, puncture they had on the right rear for whatever reason. I think theirs was a debris one. Uh, and so, therefore, that was the only one. But it was actually very close to the end of the stint anyway. It's another three seconds taken out that uh, advantage from Tom Blomqvist and Ant Davidson last time around. And the fastest lap of its race. Towards decision number 50, awards a drive through penalty on car 38 for dangerous driving and a contact with car 36. At the same time, two license points will be removed from the driver in question. Wait, 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 what? Drive that was, through penalty was that car 38 yep. for dangerous driving towards car 36. That's 38. It does not have the yellow nose. It was 28, which has the yellow nose, that made contact. Clearly, it was Tom Blomqvist, not the 38 car. I think it'd be good to have a review of that one, but, uh, yeah, the numbers seem to be a little bit different. We've just seen the video again. 
Let's see the video again. The 38 car has a pale gray nose. The 28 car has a bright yellow nose. They've penalized the wrong car. Let's just check it again. If it's for that incident down at the bottom of the hill at Eau Rouge. Well, he said it was for contact at Eau Rouge. No, it's that, it's that incident. Yep. It's it is the incident. No, no, no question about that. Two hundred percent sure before we accuse anything of, um, but the, which car it actually was we we're talking about. Meantime, and Davidson is still taking time out of that car. Um, <laughs> we'll wait and see what occurs here. He's taking lumps out of Tom Blomqvist because he wants to race for second. He may not make me to race for second. So that was clearly the incident that was being called. It was that big yeah. ooh moment coming down towards a rouge where the Jota car moved over onto the 36 car. Sideways contact and how they stayed out the wall, I have yeah. absolutely no idea. I, purely because it was side to side. Yeah. It, it, once it's side Pretty to side square. and exactly square, then the energy just bounces between the two cars. And uh, you certainly saw the energy bounced into Negrau's eyes because they opened <laughs> up quite quickly. And it was really interesting. That onboard for me was fantastic. How, looking back at him, he saw your eyes darting to see where the other car was, then focused straight into the apex, thought he had got the job done. And then with the reaction, even though he was still going up through a rouge, had probably two and a half G of lateral force on his body and doing about 170 miles per hour, that uh, he was still able to look in the mirror and see what on earth. Well, Sebastian Buemi, no doubt at all, he's not under a shadow, leading the race into the final 10 minutes. But of all endurance racing teams on the planet, Toyota above all know that until you are past the chequered flag, you don't even think about what might happen. They lead in hypercar, leading in LMP2, into the closing stages, Philip Albuquerque for United Autosports with Jota second and third at the moment, and a penalty being assessed for contact. Well, let's take a look. Oh, Ooh, that's the United car overshooting, going by the second place car in the GTM class of Felipe Fraga. Uh, he's on the bumps. Now, you have to take a certain line there to avoid the bumps, and on the bumps, then uh, he's just basically locked up the fronts. Race Control have revised that penalty. It is now being applied to the 28 car of Tom Blomqvist, the Jota car that did make contact with the Alpine, not the 38 car. So, so there has that, that cloud over 38, and Davidson's car has been removed, but 28 from second place. A drive-through should still see them on the podium. Racing Team Netherlands are over two minutes behind the second, currently second place Jota car. That's an astonishing moment in World Endurance Championship history, as Martin Hafen is correct. On the I, well, <laughs> even a stop clock <laughs> is right twice a day. <laughs> Although, although somebody who was either a, a theoretical physicist or very much cleverer than me said not. There's the, there's the yellow nose. Here we go. This is on board. There's the yeah. contact. Well, it had KFC on the front. Was the other clue? Well, uh, do they not both have KFC on no. the front? Oh, the other one's got Taco Bell. Is it? Well, I, no, you know, KFC and Taco Bell. Oh, there you go. That one. Meanwhile, full course yellow. Here we go again. Speeds for 88. H8 is third, and uh, any any yeah. penalty is going to be dramatic for that for a po for a podium. Uh, 63, the Corvette. That is not going to be on a podium. And 21. That is a podium finisher at the moment, uh, that, but there is a close second, battle for second, second in and third the, in uh, Pro-Am. Pro -Am, yeah. So there are potential... Under investigation. Yep. May not be penalties. May, may not be penalties. penalties. Under seven minutes to go for the race. May end up post-race being a penalty, if uh, that is the case. However, as you say, final seven minutes of the day. It's been, it has been a remarkable spa day. Spa can do all sorts of things. It can bathe you in sunlight all day long. We've been lucky. We're inside. We're in the warm. Alan is now looking at me with that face because he's going out into the cold. Well, mate, that's your job. <laughs> is he going to bring it back? Yeah, that's his job. This is what he's paid for. He's going to go out in the, in the chill of the evening air. It's now nearly half past seven Central European summertime. May the 1st, and there have been a couple of May Day calls on the radio, but so far it has been a pretty, a 
exciting race in all four categories. And there's been, never mind stratification, there's been a bit of a confluence of categories, I would suggest. They're actually intermingling a little bit more than perhaps anybody expected. United Auto Sports car ahead of the WRT machine, which had that clutch problem and dropped it way down to the bottom of the top 30. 28 down pit lane, Dragon Speed in and out. That yeah. will put Esteban Garcia up into second place in the Pro-Am Challenge. What a remarkable recovery for that car. So 21 in and out, was that a drive-through? There's the drive-through for 28. I wonder if they've been told there's a drive-through because they were one of the three cars where there was a question about. Yeah, it could well be that they're being told, or they may possibly have not quite read their teams. Maybe, it's possible. Properly and thought that it had been assessed as a drive-through, not being investigated potentially as a drive-through. We'll wait and see what else happens. Yeah, Blomqvist, by the way, has come back out and will stay in third position. Yeah, he had yeah. a big lead on the Racing Team Netherlands car, which, by the way, um, absolutely is dominating the Pro-Am Challenge. Yeah. Fourth overall in LMP2. It's a minute and two seconds now, the gap, uh, between Brahmi and Andre de Grau. And again, another big stint from Fritz van Aert. They put him in at the perfect time. Weather was great, traffic wasn't too much of a problem. Again, he really held up his side of the deal. The other two guys, Jop van Eyten, who finishes and uh, finishes the race for the team. They will finish in fourth place overall. They're two minutes behind Tom Blomqvist in the Jota Sport car. I don't think Jop's going to close that down. And the drive-thru penalties yeah. have now been announced for those three cars, 21, 63 and 88. 21's already served it. That is going to cost 88, a podium finish in GTM. Only 5.3 seconds to the good. Remember, if they don't take that penalty, there will be a time penalty assessed. Yep. It'll be 30 seconds, I think, will be assessed for a drive through penalty here. Oh, and they're only five seconds ahead of Chetilar. And Chetilar will be on the podium. And A, of course, as number 54 car will go ahead of them as well. So that will cost them two places. They shouldn't drop back behind the 98 Aston Martin of Augusto Farfus. 63, that is in. taking its, uh, its yep. medicine. That's the Corvette taking their drive through. Again, not a full season entry. It's here and Le Mans we will see these cars. Assuming that nothing else changes in the global position. The Dragon Speed cars coming in again. Yeah. They, so they, did they the have a penalty puncture? had not been assessed, but they drove through the pits. The penalty had not been announced and they drove through the pits. So basically they drove through the pits for fun and, no, and laughs. The, the previous one they stopped. Oh now they've had 37 to stop. seconds. I think it was a splash of fuel. I think they needed a splash of fuel. No, they haven't stopped. No, no, the second this is the second pass oh, through. Okay. The previous pass through was 37 seconds. It's oh. 23 seconds for a drive through penalty. So were they like Jota where they had needed a splash? Quite, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But even less of a splash. Indeed. Eight car though. Brand new car. Yep. Six hour race. They've had to push. It has not been clean running for them. You have to say that's been a great. Well, at one stage, it looked as though the best they'd do is third. It did indeed. In Hypercar. In fact, for, for about a third of the race, it looked indeed. like the best they could do is third. Then seven hit more trouble and more trouble. Not that the number eight car has been trouble free either, no. um, but at least it didn't hit other competitors. Not many of them anyway and then uh, that issue in the end for the Alpine has just dropped them back off the ultimate pace Alpine were always going to struggle because they can't take a full load of fuel they can't take as much fuel into Correct. their car as Toyota can but they have to remain stationary for the same time so they were always at a deficit we're always going to have to put in yeah fingers crossed for Brendan Hartley another pit stop over and above there's Phil Hansen and the United team Nobody much breathing there either. I wonder what Zach Brown is doing right now, watching the telly with interest, I should think. Final few minutes, yeah. I mean, amongst the teams who are going to be delighted with this, some of the debutants here, Racing yeah. Team Netherlands have got a fine result in the Pram Challenge into Europol. First WC race, I think, should be right delighted with absolutely. top five. Absolutely, real team top six, absolutely two. And I think the 92 car, uh, a, a debutant here as well, Kevin Estra, and this new young kid that they found from Switzerland, Neil Jarni. Uh, he could be, he could be a name for the he future. Could, yeah, could. maybe. Who knows what he could do in the future? Who knows? But uh, definitely, uh, the 92 car has been at the class of field. And there are some days when you're invincible. And yesterday, that was a day for Kevin Estra in qualifying. Today, it's been a day for the two of them in the race. They yep. have not put a foot wrong. 
Here comes the Alpine through on the dominant leader in GTM, although it should be mentioned that the second place car on the road, the 33 TF Sport car, very new look squad in every way yep. from the multi-race winning and Le Mans winning squad last year, TF Sports. Had we not had that contact with Ben Keating, they would have been right there. Yep. So that uh, bodes well. The 777 car, uh, Tomono Bufuji, what a great run he had at the start of yep. this race. And at the end as well. And, and, you know, from the final, they were the last row of the grid with the 77 car. And by the end of the first hour, they were second and third, 777 and 77. They had a really, really strong run. And that car also run by Tom Ferrier's Tour of Sport. Final lap, final few seconds for Brendan Hartley and Kazuki Nakajima to wait in the garage and for Sebastian Buemi, as the uh, engineer said, to bring it home. A brand new era of top flight sports car racing began here just six hours ago in Spa-Francorchamps. Hypercar makes its debut in the world stage and Toyota, the first team to field a purpose-built hypercar chassis are going to reap those rewards by claiming not just the first hypercar pole with the number seven, but the first hypercar victory as they win the 2021 six hours of Spa and a new chapter begins. Toyota have raced in endurance in the World Championship and at Le Mans through so many different eras of sports car and they win in yet another one. In the GT Pro class, the 92 Porsche GT is going to be our victor. Crosses the line with Kevin Esch at the wheel, the man who put it on pole and started the race. And Neil Jarney, for a young kid, just has chosen the right horse to ride in this race, hasn't he? He has indeed. Two other teams to come through to take class wins here. Racing Team Netherland come home to take the LMP2 Pro-Am Challenge. We're waiting for United Autosports and for the AF Course Rated 3 car to come through. They are now both in the middle sectors. Little way to come before they come home, but both dominant wins there, particularly for United, who I think will come home with a full lap on the field. And here is the car that finishes in second place. It's a first ever race in the top tier for Philippe Senior and the Senior Tech team. The Alpine Elf Matmut started and finished by Andre Negrau. They take second place here. Here's our AM class winner, Nick Nielsen, doing what they expected of him, bringing the 83 AF Corsa car home victorious as they start their GTE AM title defense. Francois Perodo, Nick Nielsen, and Alessio Rivera, one of the big new names of this weekend. And here, Philippe Albuquerque brings the 22 United Autosports car home for victory, shared with new goal driver Phil Hansen and new boy in the team, Fabio Scherer. <laughs> nice little, <laughs> nice little headshot there of Philip Albuquerque. Fast and funny and friendly. And that's the United Autosport team, isn't it? I have to tell you, having seen the lineup we had for LMP2 this year, yeah. I didn't expect anything close to that kind of result, the dominance of that result for United Autosports. Yeah. They've converted on their astonishing 2020 uh, performance with another win here in 2021. Excellent stuff. Home as well to complete the podium overall is the number seven car. Yep. So Jota first and third on the hypercar uh, debut. United from Jota and Jota. So that's, uh, that's rivalry renewed immediately. Porsche from two Ferraris. That's going to make it interesting in the uh, Manufacturers World Championship and AF Corsa from TF Sport. Cetular Racing are confirmed on the podium. The time was adjusted immediately after the uh, checkered flag. The 88 car didn't take the penalty and does drop to fifth. Yep. Well, it would have done whether it had taken it or not, so makes a little difference. There's some wild hair game going on this year, isn't it? The number eight car completes its slowdown lap and into the pit lane comes our race winner. Hypercars finished first, second, and third. They complete the overall podium. Number eight, Toyota Gazoo Racing, ahead of the number 36, Alpine Elf Matmut, and the number seven, Toyota Gazoo Racing Machine, finishing in third place. In LMP2, United Autosports, 22, and then the 38 and 28 cars from Jota complete the podium. Our Pro-Am winners, the number 29 car, fourth place overall for Racing Team Netherlands.
in the GT Pro class. The 92 Porsche was comfortably in front of the two Ferraris that complete the podium, 51 ahead of 52. And it's Ferrari on top in the GT Am class. The champions defend their points lead in the first race, AF Corsa 83. The 33, the new lineup with TF Sport returning to top flight sports car racing with the Aston Martin in second place. And Chetilar, their debut in the World Endurance Championship as a GT squad. They finish on the podium in GTE Am in third place. So for Chetilar, after a couple of troubling years in LMP2, it's been a good result for a big move for them into the tightly fought and hugely competitive GTE AM pack. Louise Beckett is down in the finish lane in victory circle. She is with Kazuki Nakajima from the winning number eight Toyota team. Kazuki Nakajima, congratulations. That goes down in the history books. The first win for Toyota with her hypercar. Yeah, uh, very happy with the victory. Uh, yeah, as you said, the uh, first uh, win for the Hypercar era. So very happy to achieve this uh, with uh, with our team, Toyota Gazoo Racing. And uh, yeah, a bit sad for what happened to Car 7, but uh, we are still on the podium for both cars. So very good start of the season. It was very tough race, really easy to make a mistake, and the traffic was very hard to manage. But uh, yeah, as we had a good start of the season, yeah. Uh, we still keep pushing and uh, head for Le Mans and the uh, championship. You've done it. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. A 30th World Endurance win for Toyota, and Buemi takes his 18th victory, the second winningest driver in World Endurance Championship history. Brendan Hartley and Kazuki Jack and Nakajima take their 15th wins. Consecutive Spa wins for Porsche after waiting eight years after their for their first, second Spa win that came last year. Kevin Escher's fifth win, consecutive victories after Bahrain last year here at Spa, bookending the season last year and here. Can't get the feet away from the feeling that uh, the remainder of the teams in GT Pro will have been thinking, well, look, Estra's on great form, but the yeah. Neil Yarny's not done that. Oh, dear. Yeah. Uh, well, but that was dominant. Yarny becomes the first Swiss winner in GTE Pro. It's his fifth race win in the World Endurance Championship. His last was Le Mans in 2016. That's a bit of a drought, isn't it? But then he has changed horses and raced in Formula E and all sorts of others. United Auto Sports, the 22 car, pull level with KCMG on five LMP2 wins. A debut for Fabio Scherer, he wins. Phil Hansen's fifth win, seventh for Felipe Albuquerque, who's now the fourth most victorious driver in LMP2 history. And for AF Corsa, let's complete the stats thanks to at WEC data. And of course, it's fourth consecutive podium for the reigning champions, Perodo and Nielsen. A debut win for Alessio Rivera, the first new Italian AM winner since Ricardo Perra won with Dempsey Proton at Spa in 2019. Consecutive season wins at round one for the 83 Ferrari that won the opener last year and consecutive Spa wins for the 83 car who won here last August. So all sorts of facts, figures and stats. There will be lots more to follow in the slipstream of what has been a thoroughly entertaining, competitive and fun to watch and talk about. Season opener for season nine of the FIA World Endurance Championship 2021. One other quick stat, and uh, I'd be more than happy if our mate at uh, WC Data confirmed this one. I think Neil Yanni is now the second man to win a race overall in the WC and a race in WC in, in GTE Pro after Bruno Senna. Oh, good shout. I think that's right, because right, Bruno's won in all four classes. Yes. Well, so Neil jarney has got a, a bit of catching up to do, because he's never raced in LMP2 or GTE. Yet. This time, yet. He's young. He, he needs to find an AM drive, doesn't he? <laughs> Maybe when he's in his 50s and he gets downgraded to sort of silver or something. I, I can't say enough good things about this United Autosport squad, you know. I mean, after last year, it was always going to be tough to come back and continue on that road with everybody knew what they got. Fabio Scherer, I thought, was stellar. Phil Hansen, uh, a star of the race there. Yep. Uh, newly uh, lifted up to gold status, and he was the class of the field at the start of that race in LMP2. 
Well, Alan, for, for Fabio Scherer, you're being dropped into the championship winning car, the best team, best car on the grid, great driver lineup. So there's, there's a huge comfort blanket. But boy, it exposes you if you can't cut it, doesn't it? So you've got to look at him and go, yeah, stand up job. He's absolutely up to the standard they need in the car. Well, certainly for a professionalism and keeping the car in one piece, everything else, that's one point. But the second point is you have got a very, very good reference in two people. One Hansen on the right side as a young and up and coming and Felipe Albuquerque who's at the top of his game at the moment. So the average stats are the thing there. And uh, as you say, he did very well. He was quick when he was in DTM, a little bit inconsistent but now he's got into this it looks like it maybe fits his style that little bit better as you said though Graham to be able to have a run through one season then a six-month break and then come back fighting and to come out with such a dominant strong performance as they have then uh, you know the structure behind United Autosports it isn't there by chance yeah yeah it, and it's built and it's built and it's built and we've seen them coming and coming and coming particularly Graham and I who spend a lot of time watching Michelin and the Mon Cup races and then European Le Mans series races they've always been getting better and better and better and better and here they are you know conquering the world stage with impunity Le Mans winners they'll go in August to defend that LMP2 title whether Lady Luck smiles on them again or not is entirely a separate question but they've got the they've got the ability in spades and what they've got as well not only are the points on the board are another great calling card to slap on the desk of any manufacturer coming in this new era going yeah. looking for a quality team we can help yeah and of course you know it's not just the guys here Richard Dean is the man on the ground but Zach Brown who's the other co-owner of the team is very much a man who moves in in those big circles where you may well find manufacturers looking for teams to run their car and don't forget you know there's lots of history for that you look at Uke Shonak and Orica one Le Mans with Mazda you know nearly one Le Mans with Toyota and in between times you know one Le Mans multiple times with with Chrysler you know team like that who can engineer a car are really really handy I mean Yost have got a bit of history in that department as well haven't they so as Alan well knows so you know all these guys all these teams that are putting themselves in the frame there's a lot of reasons for that there are our class winners after the season opener here at Spa and what a race it was First of May, it's Spa Francorchamps, the sun shining, a beautiful racetrack, a challenging field packed full of talent with lots of new cars, new teams, and a whole new category to contemplate. Hypercar made its debut, Toyota Gazoo Racing locked out the front row with their two 010 hypercars. And in third place, Phil Hansen for United Autosports, the car that led LMP2 qualifying. And Hansen was not hanging around, waiting for the Toyotas to sort out their private battle. He went right by them at the start to take the lead briefly for LMP2. In the GTE Pro class, a stunning lap with the 92 Porsche on pole. And despite early challenges from Ferrari, it was rarely headed. Ten laps, the number seven Toyota led, then the number eight was waiting through because it was seeming to be a quicker car at this stage Alpine were bedding themselves in gently with their number 36 car the third hypercar plenty of action throughout the GT category in pro and am and lots of close racing as we always come to expect in the LMP2 class including this heart in the mouth moment for the WRT team as their young superstar Ferdy Habsburg went side to side down through Eau Rouge. Contact between the number seven Toyota and the 91 Porsche. It had already had one puncture, that caused another. And after four hours of racing, the first yellow flags and full course caution. Alpine at this stage looked very much potentially a race winner, particularly as Toyota's number seven car locked up and steered off into the gravel. This car had already had a number of off-track excursions and contact with the Porsche. Kazuki Nakaji, uh, Kamu Kobayashi put it in the gravel and cost them a chance of victory. 
Sinicek leading at this stage, struggling to get back up to speed on cold tyres. G drives 26th car, their better placed car had an oil leak that put them out of the race. Sinicek re recovered to take the battle to Toyota into the closing stages. The 92 Porsche was almost never headed in the GTE Pro class, a starry weekend for them. 22 United Autosports in front, almost without exception, in LMP2. And the overall race win, the first of the hypercar era, went to Toyota number eight. TGR 010 claiming the first hypercar win, the number seven car claiming the first hypercar pole. And there was not a drop of rain, a flash of lightning. In it fact, probably the racing would have been a bit washed out because of it. So we had a great racing in all four classes. The uh, governing bodies have stratified gap between hypercar and LMP2, but still they were very competitive with the hypercars. In the GT classes, well, the 92 Porsche had the upper hand today. Will they have the upper hand in Portimao? Don't bet on it. And 83, the AF Corsa team that won last year's GTE AM title have started off their title defense in the perfect manner with victory. 77 Dempsey Proton car, run out of go. G-Drive 26 ran out of oil. ARC Bratislava didn't start because of a fuel leak and GR, they didn't start either because of a crash on the outlap from the pit lane. Other than that, reliability was very strong indeed. WRT dropped back with a clutch issue. And after contact, the Iron Lynx cars finished in 27th and 28th with the Iron Dames just ahead of their male rivals. Well, let's get down to our winners. United Autosports in LMP2, the victors. Let's hear from pole man and superstar, Philip Albuquerque. Great win. It was just such a dominant ride for all of you. Yeah, uh, it, it definitely was the perfect week. I mean, we started on Monday and uh, it was a perfect execution from everyone in United. We were super happy with the car. We dominated the prologue, the, the, the pre pratex qualifying, the race. And it's not just one person. I think it's the bond between the team, engineer, drivers, everyone together that made a difference. And I must say that Phil and uh, Fabio, as a rookie, they did amazing. I mean, when it's like this, obviously, uh, I'm super lucky to be on the car because it's just a dream to, to be working like this. Well done. Well deserved. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, what a well-fought battle it was. They did have a penalty for infraction in the first full course yellow, but their gap ahead of the rest of the field was so strong that they survived that without losing the lead, Graham. Yeah, absolutely. And what we know in all four classes now is to win a world championship, you've got to beat the best. We now know who the best are in <laughs> each of those classes and, and some. Uh, that's yeah. the level. The rest of them have now got to get to that level. Well, we'll try and catch up with our GT Pro winners as well. Kevin Esch and Neil Jani in the 92 Porsche. Here's the podium, the overall podium. There's Mike Conway from the number seven Toyota that he shares with Kamu Kobayashi and Jose Maria Lopez. They started from pole position. Kamui claimed the first ever hypercar pole and Barring a little bit of new car issues, they could have been victorious. Second place for Albina Elf Matmut, Andre Negrau, Nico Lapierre, and Mathieu Vassivier. But our race winners, the number eight Toyota, Sebastian Buemi, Kazuki Nakajima, and Brendan Hartley. And uh, TGR's team representative on the podium.
Congratulations, everyone. You can take your trophy, please. Representing Toyota Gazoo Racing Europe there, Yoshi, President Katsuyoshi Hikichi joins the two teams on the podium. Please, and the main stand for the official pictures. On Michelin tyre, so Bib is up there. Bibendum joins them on the podium as well. For the podium for this overall classification of this FIAWEC. Six hours of Spa Francorchamps. Thank you guys. And so the hypercar makes its bow. Top flight of sports car racing, which includes the cars here, Le Mans Hypercar, and will also, in the fullness of time, include the IMSA version, the LMDH cars, which we expect to see from the likes of Audi and Porsche. Ferrari coming as well in 2023. 2022, we should see Peugeot return to top flight sports car racing. a look at our points in the World Endurance Drivers' Championship. Brendan Hartley, Kaz Nakajima and Seb Buemi. The victory here gives them 25 points. One of three races this year that will give 25 points for victory. Two will give points and a half. That will be the next race, the eight hours of Portimao and the season finale, the eight hours of Bahrain. And one will give double points and that will be the Vancatre du Mans in August. Our podium here. It's our GT Pro Class podium, victorious, the 92 Porsche, Kevin Esch and new boy Neil Charney. Second position going to the 51 Ferrari, Alessandro Pierre Guidi. And his teammate James Collado, Daniel Serra and Miguel Molina. That is the new lineup in the newly renumbered, what was 71 car, now 52 car for this season. So A, of course, is Ferrari's claiming second and third. Porsche first and fourth. Antonio Garcia and Oli Gavin in the Corvette finishing fourth on the road, but they are not point scoring at full season entries. So that means that uh, Jimmy Bruni and Richard Leitz are fourth place. Fifth in the GTE drivers title is the top car in the AM class. Alessio Rivera, Francois Perodo in the 83 Ferrari that they share with Nick Nielsen. So those drivers also, as Neil Jani pointed out, if you get a zero, you won't just be behind pros, you'll be behind the AM class drivers as well. I'm gonna, gonna correct a stat. Two other drivers have done an LMP1 and GTE Pro. Uh, we'll go to an interview, but uh, Mark Lieb and Roman Dumas. When I said to you at the beginning of this race that you would have that lead still at the end, you didn't quite believe it, but that, that was just incredible. Yeah, I think we, we had a perfect race, to be honest, but I, I didn't believe it because I, I knew Ferrari was strong, um, and they were strong, just there was some small part of the race or sm some small details in the race which maybe we did better, because we got 
a few seconds gap and then the, the gap was holding. So uh, in the end, in terms of pace, we were just a little better. But um, no, I'm, I'm really proud of the of the 92 team of Neil. He did a mega job for yeah. his first race in, uh, in GT in WEC. First victory and I think we had a, a perfect weekend. Pole, maybe fastest lap and, and race win. So it's, uh, it's great to finish the championship as we ended it last year. Congratulations to both of you. you. Well done. Thank you. So great end to the season and start to the following season for the 92 car. Change of driver lineup with Michael Christensen, uh, no longer with Kevin Esch, but with Neil Jarney in the squad. They don't seem to have missed a beat, do they? But Ferrari second and third. And as he said, it's, it's now down to tiny details, tiny increments. It's all about sweating the small stuff to make a difference in a field that is this competitive. Always was in GTU Pro, whether it's two manufacturers as there is this year or five, it's still not easy to get your nose in front. And if you can do, you've got to do everything you can to keep it there. And they did. I will add, Martin, there was not a tiny increment in qualifying. That was stellar stuff <laughs> from Kevin Est. That No, that wasn't tiny anything. And uh, it's not even a downhill sport. So having cojones that large didn't help with gravity. Our GTE, uh, this is our uh, uh, LMP2 podium. Uh, racing team Netherlands. So this is our, uh, they're there in fourth place. They're our Pro-Am winners. So they join the podium as well. Third place, the crew of the number 28 Jota Sport car. And that uh, race was finished by Tom Blomquist, shares with Stoffel van Dorn and Sean Galeil. 38, the Jota Sport car in second place. And Davidson, Antonio Felix de Costa, Roberto Gonzalez. But the Star Spangled Banner for our winners, United Autosports. So United Autosports, Philippe Albuquerque, Phil Hansen team up again, joined by Fabio Scherer for the first time, and they haven't broken step either. There's Racing Team Netherlands, fourth place overall for the 29 car. Fritz van Eert, Gerda van der Garden, Jop van Oetert. And they are the Pro-Am classification winners. They uh, take the first win in that challenge in the yeah. WEC. Fritz also, by the way, the first ever bronze driver to have taken an overall win in LMP2. So completes that set. Yeah. yeah. They had a great year last year. And it looks as though they're going to have a great year this year too. And for Jota, last year running a Goodyear tyre that's very different from this year's Goodyear tyre. Didn't have an awful lot of extra experience. A very happy Philip Albuquerque. With Fabio Scherer, the new boy on the right there of your picture, and Phil Hansen. And they lead the standings. They also got the extra point for pole, so 26 points for them. And Davison, Antonio Felix de Costa, and Roberto Gonzalez in second. Sean Galeel, Stoffel van Dorn, and Tom Blomquist in third, ahead of Fritz van Eyde, Jop van Oetert, uh, in the racing team Netherlands car with uh, Geerde van der Gaard. So United lead from Jota and Racing Team Netherland into Europol and Real Team Racing. Also top six results for them. Richard Mill Racing Team did what they needed to do at the beginning of the season. Get the car through in one piece, have a clean race, have a confidence inspiring race. I think we will see more performance from the number one car as the season progresses. Drivers title race, Fritz van Eyde, Gerda van der Gaard leading in the Pro-Am category. Racing Team Netherland also on top of the Pro-Am category as a result of that race win in Pro-Am. Well, let's hear now from our GTE Am winners from the glamorous and hardworking Louise Beckett. She caught up with Francois Perodo. Guys, uh, in GTM, the, the lead was changing, but you, in the 83, you managed to get it in the end. Yeah, it was, a, it was a tough start. Car 33 is really fast. They made a good break. And then um, I struggled to, um, to do two stints in a row. So Alessio jumped in. So that changed the strategy a little bit, but uh, 
That was a good race. That's the beauty of endurance. So many things can happen in six hours. So he put in an amazing uh, triple stint, and then Niklas just brought her home. That's so the start. great start for the season. That's exactly the start you want, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Can't wait for Portugal now. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Francois might need to do a little bit more training before Portugal. He said six months off. It's his first time back in the car. And physically, no, I cannot do a double. Luckily, Alessio Rivera could do a triple. And what a triple he did. He's definitely down as a star name from this race weekend. Nick Nielsen, we expect to be as quick as he was. Ben Keating, Dylan Pereira, Felipe Fraga, the new lineup in the TF Sport. Bright blue Aston Martin, they took second and pole, so they get 19 points. And third for the uh, 47 car from Chetilar. They had a very competitive start as well to their careers as GTM races. Roberto Lacorte, Giorgio Senna, Giotto Gion, joined by Antonio Fuoco. So the champions start their title defense in the best possible manner with victory. The extra point for pole, though, means they only have a five-point lead over the 33 car. The Italian national anthem, often referred to as the national anthem of motor racing. And that plays out for AF Corsa. They claim victory here. TF Sport, though, not only with pole position, but a really strong race from both cars, from the 33 car and the 777D station entry. That could be very well worth watching as the season progresses. Chetilar, though, and Graham, you know, they had a, a troubling couple of years in LMP2. They struggled to be competitive. What a relief it is to find that, in fact, they are still very competitive once they get a car that they can get their head around here with the Ferrari. And they will be proud of that. It's, it's a very, very Italian effort. Uh, in a multinational series of podiums, it's a, a uninational uh, Italian <laughs> uh, step on that podium. May, of course, with that 25 points uh, for the win. TF Sport with 19 points for second place and that pole position yep. keeps that gap nice and close to six points. Four points back to Jetlar Racing, then the 54A of Corsa car coming on strong at the end there. That, you know, dominant from the 83 car, but there was absolute entertainment behind. Yep. And the TF Sport car, as we said earlier in the broadcast, had it not been for that incident where um, where Van Keating was nerfed off, would have been right in the mix at the end of that race. Yep. Iron Lynx with work to do to bring their speed up, but again, it's day one in the new big school for them. They've graduated from the European Le Mans series and they will be learning fast. We've seen what they can do in European Le Mans series action when they've got their handle on the car and I don't expect it to be much different here. Well, what a great race in all four classes. It was competitive, it was close. There was more than just a couple of cars to keep your eye on. It's been a very, very busy race, and for the most part, very clean indeed. Just three caution periods, no safety cars, no major shunts or incidents. There are a couple of heart-in-the-mouth moments with a little bit of contact, but in the end, actually, the prologue was far more damaging qualifying was far more damaging than six hours around Spa-Francorchamps. So hats off to all the teams, to all the drivers and to all the officials who have made it happen. And again, to the FIA for being able to somehow get motor racing back underway. It was one of the first sports that started again after lockdown at the beginning of this COVID-19 pandemic and continues to be able to bring a little bit of light relief around the globe and just from time to time that can be very important and motor racing might seem a little frivolous sometimes but it does bring excitement passion and 
and a bit of enjoyment at a time when we need it most. And hopefully, when we get to the roller coaster of Portimao in Portugal next time out, we will have even more of the same. Certainly, it's a circuit that can provide some fantastic racing. Till then, from the whole World Endurance TV crew here, from Duncan Vincent, from Louise Beckett, from Graham Goodwin, from Alan McNish, from our crew in the truck and around the circuit, from me, Martin Haven, thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you the middle weekend of June, not at Le Mans, but at Portimao for round two of the FIA World Endurance Championship. Until then, stay safe, have fun, and keep the endurance spirit alive. <laughs>